it's indeed a wonderful morning to see all the young people. I feel in actual fact quite old. I feel ancient. We're starting off on time, but we're going to heat up soon. And that means there will be no time for sne sleeping, snoozing or snoring. You will be activated in two days with lots of interesting things happening. So welcome from my side. My name is Ilse Troutman. I'm the Deputy Director General uh, here in the Department of Agriculture Western Cape for Agricultural Research and Regulatory Services. And we are delighted to have you here as part of our climate change drive. Um, now, just a few house rules. First of all, as you go through the day and you feel a little bit funky or you want to toy toy, grab at the back one of these, take selfies, take photos and go wild. If you want to post somewhere, right at the back, you can decide what you want to do with this. But please tweet, tweet, get it out there that you're here. Very important. And we've got lovely, lovely um, stuff at the back you can have a little group photo so please people enjoy the day on social media as well just a little instruction if any of you still have cups on your tables please quickly grab it and run to the back because the caterers are trying to save on cutlery and crockery uh, so please run back quickly go and put it back and uh, get back as soon as possible. For those who are still sitting, I know you love your cell phones and you love free Wi-Fi. Well, you're in a very cool spot today. There's a, a, a link for you on your cell phones Agri event 5G. 5G, imagine that. Having 5G in government, that's really wow. If you need the password, it's Elsenburg, E L S E N B U R G. You're here at the Elsenburg College as well today. Uh, all small letters, Elsenburg, and it's Agri event 5G. I'm not going to tell you where the toilets are. I'm not going to tell you anything about the program because you have it right in front of you. I would like to welcome our Master of Ceremonies, our program director, Dr. Gillian Orense. Now, Gillian is some very interesting person. He looks mild and modest. He's got a PhD in your favorite subject, mathematics. But you'll see today that mathematicians, is that the word? Mathematicians, you're a mathematician. You'll see that he's a good mix between the magic and the mathematics. He's gonna take you forward for the next two days. So open, over to you to open and then we will proceed. Thank you. Don't forget, in your little linear, there's a memory stick. If you open it, there's a memory stick. Just one click. You can find a lot of reading about our Smart Agri Plan climate change, but you can also upload some stuff. Thank you so much, Gillian. All right, thank you very much, Ilsa. I hope you guys feel welcome. Of course, some of you who didn't register, sit no down, don't go, oh, I didn't register, let me go register immediately because I didn't know that there's a memory stick in the lin yard. Ne? So please don't take two, just one, just for people who are here. So welcome and good morning. Are you guys good? Are you excited to be here? Uh, I looked at you when, when Ilsa said, if you have a cup on your table, run to the back. And as you were going out, I thought, my word, is if that is how you run, I don't want to see you walk. <laughs> right, so today it's all about energy. It's about waking up. It's understanding that we have a role to play when it comes to saving the planet. 
It's all about you. And it's putting the you into youth, right? It's about thinking differently. It's being exposed to information. There's lots of information that will come your way. We'll do it through presentations. There'll be some videos. And there'll be even some time for you to talk. So as you're sitting at the table, just speak to the people next to them, next to you, and just tell them what you've done today to save the planet. What have you done thus far to save the flippin' planet? I wear the same jeans for a month. That's the way I change the planet. I even flip my underwear. That's what I do. I don't know what you guys are doing. This morning I was standing in my shower and I realized that I still have a bucket in my shower. We've long moved past save water. Ek shower nog met a bucket. And my shower water still goes into my cistern. Is that not what you do? Or have you moved on? No, it was raining. The dams are full to yell. Let the tap run. Right, so today is all about information. It's about getting you to think differently. And as you know more, we hope that you will do more. Keeping in mind that we are in the month of July, which apparently is Mandela month. You know what he said? Education is the most powerful weapon that you can use to change your world. So welcome to this event. Good morning. And I hope that you are with it. Have you guys heard of a thing called Mentimeter? Some of you have. We will be using Mentimeter in just a little while. But before we get there, let me hand back to the one and only. She is the project leader of Smart Agri. And as you look at her, you don't have to come. She is smart. Do you know that when she did her first degree at university, she passed it cum laude? And then she did an honors, cum laude. And then she did a master's, cum laude. When I studied, I got only the cum, but not the laude. So welcome, Ilse. Let's start the program. And I ask you now to introduce to us the HOD. Thank you, Gillian. Ladies and gentlemen, it's just appropriate that uh, the head of this department, Dr. Mughali Sebopetsa, a young man himself from agriculture, grew up in agriculture, got his first degree in agriculture, then an MBA and also a PhD in management sciences. He's the leader of this department. He's very fond of young people. He's driving the climate change agenda of this department as well with us. And uh, we would like to welcome him to the stage to say a few welcoming words and also energize you from government side for the two days and also your climate journey from here onwards. Thank you, Mughali. San Bonan. Good morning and good morning. Are you ready to toy toy because I want to? Can you hear me? Right, thank you very much. Um, I thought when Ilse introduced me, she'd also add cum laude, <laughs> but she didn't know. Um, I'm hoping the program director will do that sometime today or tomorrow. Um, firstly, I want to thank you, Ilse, and your team for pulling it together. What you are participating in today is the first conference in the Western Cape that looks at climate change, particularly for young people. But I thought before I get to the speech, because the team prepared a speech for me, I thought I must tell you a story <clears throat> that happened about 17 years ago. When, when I joined the department, <clears throat> I, I was quite young and handsome, I guess, at the time. By training, I've studied animal science with uh, animal genetics as a major subject. So coming here to the Western Cape, one of the responsibilities I had at the time was to assist some smallholder farmer to buy some horse for breeding purposes. We were then told that there was a good farmer in Sierras and uh, as the head of food security directorate at the time, I then 
went to series with this same a smallholder farmer. Now we went to look at the horse that uh, the farmer needed to acquire from the commercial farmer. And I mind you, I'm from Limpopo, so Afrikaans is not spoken there. And um, I had to speak to this um, Afrikaans-speaking farmer on behalf of the smallholder farmer who also couldn't speak Afrikaans. And uh, we looked at the horse. It ticked all the boxes in terms of what they trained us at university. You know, when we want to do breeding, you look at the, how the horse um, um, stature is and to look at uh, the phenotype to arrive at some decision as to whether it's the right horse for breeding purposes. So we said to this farmer, <coughs> this is the horse that we want. And the commercial farmer said to us, but I need to tell you, gentlemen, that this horse is not looking good. We said, say, with all the knowledge we have, this is the horse we want to buy. Cut the long story short, <coughs> we then transacted, we bought the horse. Took delivery of the horse, and it was within a week that the smallholder farmer realized that the horse was partially blind. Extremely furious is now saying to me, but we went to this gentleman, this uh, reputable gentleman, and we bought this horse from him. We now went to this farmer in Ceres. We said to him, but say, how could you sell to us a blind horse? He said to us, gentlemen, I told you, it does not look good. And um, I hope from here, everything will look good. Now, good morning and welcome to all of you to the first climate change in agriculture, youth and youth researchers convention. Agriculture is a very important sector to the economy of the Western Cape. It contributes about 11% to the GDP of this province and up to 20% in terms of employment for the citizens of the Western Cape. And if you look at the South Africa's export profile, over 50% of what South Africa export in terms of agricultural products, it, come, it comes from uh, this uh, particular uh, province of the Western Cape. When you look at the export profile for the Western Cape itself, eight of the 10 products that are exported from this region are actually coming from the agricultural sector. So marking this convention as the first of its kind, you've just made history by being in attendance here. And by the way, you are at the oldest agricultural college on the African continent. And I dare say the best agricultural college on the continent of Africa. The subject of climate change is of critical importance to us and more so yourselves as the young people. It is very probable that as young people, many of us older people in the room never thought about climate change the way we should, and uh, that signaled the fact that we are dealing with a challenge here. Not thinking about the subject and not taking action, and yet it is very real. As you sit here today, eager to listen and ready to action, I'm encouraged and Left in our, at the forward thinking young stars, we will have taking our over leadership role and moving the sector forward. Climate change will hit our young people the most, be it in the area of jobs, be it in the area of food security, but more importantly, when we look at the economic climate that, that we, are faced, we are faced with. I call upon each one of you to lead the climate change agenda because of the vested interest you have, not just as the future custodian of the planet, but because, I want to argue, you are also the present. As Africans, would be, would be in the forefront in terms of population density, and therefore food demand, we would be in the forefront of technology, forefront of innovation, and be in the forefront of solutions and economic growth and prosperity. It does, however, take a drive hard work and consistency. As a sector, we can already see the impact of climate change in the form of floods, fires, droughts, biological disasters, such as the locust we have recently experienced. Many of you in the room, you would have listened to the um, uh, mathematician here who referred to the fact that um, 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 
is still as a bucket in his shower, which is something that is very recent. The lowest drought in the Western Cape uh, that are still, is still ravaging some of our regions um, in, in this province. As Mr. Swami Nathan, the Indian agronomist and the World Food Prize laureate once said, if agriculture goes wrong, nothing else will have a chance to go right. And looking at this galaxy of people here, I'm totally convinced that agriculture will never go wrong in the Western Cape. Climate change is a major problem for the agricultural sector, as productivity is often heavily reliant on the weather and the seasons. If they don't play along, we have serious problems in terms of our food security. Now the question is, how do we mitigate this problem? And one way for us is partnerships. The Western Cape Department of Agriculture is not and never has been an ordinary government entity. And this I can say with conviction, as our mission has always been to unlock the full potential of agriculture, to enhance the economy, the ecology, but above all the social wealth of the people of the Western Cape. This department has developed what we call the Smart Agri Plan, the first of its kind in South Africa to support the sector, but also ensuring that uh, we mitigate the impact of climate change, and this was achieved through partnership. In our stride to ensure we make the most of science, and in terms of our uh, sound decisions, we employed our very first climate change specialist, Professor Stephanie Mitchley, whom is here in the room today, and will have the privilege of being addressed by this finest uh, scholar in the climate change in our country. And I want to ask that you applaud this scholar in advance, even before she addresses you. We then engage with our partners in all commodities to emphasize the topic of climate change. And I must say, the first of its kind in the country, South Africa. So how does this partnership help solve the problem? The Western Cape government believes in the mantra that says the whole of government and the whole of society is needed in solving complex problems. Because for us, partnerships is about co-creation, it's about co-leadership, and this convention here today is doing exactly that. In his 10 lessons for a post-pandemic world, Mr. Zak Farid Zakaria argues that it is not the quantity of government that matters, but the quality of government. And what we see here, it's exactly that, the quality of government in the sense that this government acknowledges that the challenges of climate change cannot be solved by government alone, but by all of society coming together. We want to argue that it can be the change you want to see in the world. In wrapping up, <clears throat> this event would be marked as the first of its kind, but in order to make it truly impactful and to demonstrate the importance and relevance of climate change in the future, this department, Ilse, I would like us to hold this convention every year because we are dealing with a very important subject that will impact the future of the Western Cape, the future of South Africa. So it is my view that this is the first, but should not be the last. In fact, we should actually every year host this particular event to underscore the importance of what, what we are dealing with. I encourage you to learn as much as you can, interact as much as possible, but obviously think beyond the box and start paving the way for a future, for a climate resilient agricultural sector. Finally, I thought I, I should define the acronym Youth for You. I thought it was important to then say, as young people, you are setting the new measure as to what the measure or the barometer should be as we deal with this issue of climate change going forward. I thought the letter O would stand for opportunities. Although we are dealing with the, uh, the challenges and the impact of climate change, I think it's important that as young people, we also begin to identify the opportunities that climate change present for us. The U, I thought, defined the fact that you guys are unbeatable, and I believe strongly that as young people, if you set your mind on something, definitely you'll be able to, to achieve that. I thought the T stand for tenacity. You are indeed tenacious people. You have proved over time that uh, it can be done. And the last H, I thought you provide hope because indeed you are not just the future leaders, but you are the present and the present leaders. With that said, I wish to welcome you at this very important conference. 
at the oldest and the best agricultural college on the African continent. I trust that the next two days will enlighten you, but also more importantly, you'll emerge out of here with clear actions as to that which you are going to do, because you can only be the change you want to see. But the magician, thank you very much and welcome. All right, so you've been welcomed. Also, a special word of welcome, of course, goes to all our media representatives here. Uh, a special word of welcome to Lando Wiekblad. Thank you for what you have brought work, uh, and thanks for sharing in this event. So you've been welcomed, but you've also been challenged, right? You are here to learn. You are here to participate. And I think often when we think about government, it's always the us and them. Ne? It's always most them. Uh, and when I grew up, we used to say, point your finger to the moon, but don't forget, three fingers point back at you. So every time when we blame other people, please don't walk away from your own responsibility because that actually comes to you three times. So welcome to this event. Yellows up it. Are you with it? Ready to rock, right? So do we want to ad advance your understanding? Obviously, when you think about words like climate change, lots of jargon, global warming, climate change, are they the same? Are they different? What does it mean in our world? What does it mean for our reality? Uh, when we think about agricultural science, of course, I was just thinking that I probably need an agricultural scientist more than what I need a doctor. I go to the doctor maybe once. But when it comes to agriculture, I need you for breakfast, for lunch, and for supper, each and every day. So if we mess up our planet, we actually impact our own lives and our own livelihoods. So welcome to the Think Tank, and we're going to get this show on the road, and we're going to introduce you to Mentimeter. If you haven't heard of Mentimeter, you will meet Mentimeter now. It's all about engagement. Uh, the first part is just to introduce this to you, and we also have a bit of a competition. We have some people who put together some photos, a video, and we want you to vote for the one that speaks to you, right? So on the screen, hopefully you will soon get either a QR code that you can use to log in, uh, or you can go to your browser and just type in menti, M-E-N-T-I, dot com, C-O-M. And please note that we've got cameras that are watching you, and the more active you are, the bigger the chance of you winning something. We've got a gorgeous prize awaiting, a prize. It's almost like the Oprah Winfrey move. When you check under your chair, you will find absolutely nothing. But if you interact through the course of the day, uh, great things will happen. So you all into Mentimeter? If you have your smart device, please activate it. Uh, you can keep it on, on silent. Um, and then there should be a code at the top, the 52904610. That is the code that you type in once you get to the landing page of Mentimeter. So I'm also going to do that. Uh, let me see. 5290 four six one zero and we enter and there you will see five images and one video and all you need to do is you select the one that speaks to you i think the first image looks like a fire is it a felt fire or something and the second image looks like some uh, footprints in the sand is that right and then the third one looks uh, like somebody carrying something. Oh, there the picture's a little bit better. So just pick the picture that speaks to you. If you think about climate change, what is the one that resonates with you? But also look at the quality and the craftsmanship of the person who got that image. So select your one of choice, submit that, and of course you will help us to decide who the winner will be of a gorgeous prize at the end. But please keep in mind we also have some lucky draws so we want you to participate as well. So let me just check, are we all happy that everybody voted? Uh, do we know how many participants are in and do we know how many votes have been cast? Anybody struggling with Mentimeter? The code is 52 nine zero four six one zero so I repeat the code is five two nine zero one four six zero I hope I have that right 
So you enter the code that will allow you to vote. There are the images. You select the one that you favor, and then you submit your vote. And you will help whoever is the person who took that image to hopefully win the prize at the end. Right? So are we all good? Are we all mentimetered? Anybody like me born before technology? Can I please repeat my bank account number? <laughs> oh, the code. The code is 52. I'm, I'm on a. I think it's 5290 4610. 5290 4610. Right, so it's really important that you guys get the handle of Mentimeter because we want to use that also for our engagement throughout the course of the two days. Um, so, everybody in, everybody, anybody still struggling with Mentimeter, unable to cast your vote? Can you watch me? You want to watch me watch the video? <laughs> All right, they want to know if they can watch the video? I don't know if the video is watchable. Oh, you're going to show the video as well. So the video will now be screened. Ladies and gentlemen, your eyes for the video. This video was taken this morning as I was in the shower. <laughs> so please do not show this to anybody who might know me. And this is the time in that program where you look at me and I look at you. And I have no idea what's supposed to happen next, but I keep on looking at you and you keep on looking at me. So we're just getting the video ready so that at least you know what you are voting for. Uh, but again, did you guys chat at the table? And are you sitting next to people who did nothing for the planet? If so, just move to a different table. Right? So you are not forced to sit at the same table if you don't like the people, you know, just move, move. Like these people, they don't like water. Then just go and find people who love water. So move around, mingle. We don't want you to just sit with people that you know. So if you come from a university, please do not sit with the people that you sit with every day. Right? As leaders of the future. Right. So there's our video. Let's just see if there's some sound as well. And in global temperatures, we look at the and other characteristics into in the atmosphere. These causes may be natural, but human activities have been increased by more of climate changes. The primary causes of climate changes are human activities such as driving cars, creating electricity, and chopping down. Climate change will affect farmers mostly, since farmers use water and global warming is around. The farmers won't get water because of the heat that the sun gives. But since there's no water, they can't grow plants and food on the floor. This and animals will die with extreme heat. The quality of plants that we need to will deteriorate, more fires and longer dress for food. Okay, so Leo, what happens during climate change? Um, when it's sunny or, or um, rainy, if farmers don't plant, and then we, then we don't have food or water and we won't survive. Hi guys, today we are going to talk about climate change. Sunny in the morning and cloudy in the afternoon. Farms are facing the threat climate change head on. And yet, we are demanding more agriculture in every day. Climate smart. Okay. Alright, that looks too much like TikTok for me. Uh, but alright, so there's some videos for you to select from. All right, so, so I think we're going to move on with our program, um, and we're going to stay with this thing called Mentimeter, because we want to know what are your thoughts when we say things like climate change. So again, uh, we're going to give you probably a different code, 
And when we give you this code, please just enter that one. And then there are a couple of questions that we just want to hear your views on, please. Uh, so we go back to Mentimeter, and we will quickly run a quick mini survey just to get a sense of what it is that you think of when you hear certain words. So the code, not this one. We're just waiting for the new code to be load. Load is load. What is the past tense of load? Load it. Lead as in heavy. Can't pick it up. My word, you let us, I'm serious. Is it always like this when you get to places where you're supposed to learn? You happen, you know, remember what you were like at school? Oh, yes, please. Just a note. Just get over yourself and stop being so serious. All right? So today, there are no titles. I'm not going to call anybody by the name professor or doctor because every professional was once an amateur. We are all here to learn, and when it gets to climate change, we are all in this together. All right? So stop being so serious and get over yourself. Laugh a little bit, and don't worry if you appear stupid because we only learn when we ask the wrong questions, right? Or do we learn when we ask the right questions? If we know the answers, we're not learning new stuff, right? So please do interact with us. Please do ask questions. Uh, we're just waiting for Mentimeter to show up so that we can get a sense of what do you know about the topic? What do you think about when you hear some of these words? Because we are so about to share some information with you, right? So you yet to learn, but hopefully as you know more, you will be pushed to start doing things differently. I think it's Maya Angelou who said, do the best you can until you know better, but once you know better, do better. Right, so there's our new code, 60 double three seventy one zero nine. So our new code is 60337109. So if you guys can just first quickly log in so that we can see how many participants we have. So let me also go back to Mentimeter and type in 60337109, submit. We only have two people in at the moment. I think there are more than two people here. Is that two people who've answered? Okay, four. Six answers in. When you hear the word climate change, what comes to mind? And it's okay to say, Nothing. <laughs> All right, there are a couple of words that are popping up. Global warming, act now, stress. If you are stressed, just remember if you spell it backwards, it becomes desserts. So whenever you're stressed, just eat. You will feel better. It's not going to help, but you will feel better. Right? Not enough water. Weather patterns being altered. Less growth. So we have 40 answers in already. I think we are more than 40. Um, so I think we'll keep going until we get to about 100. Is that it? Right? We're up to 50. Just look at that. And the numbers are rising. Ladies and gents, 51. Can we get a 52? I've got a 52 coming. Is there a 53? I get 53 coming. Is there a 54? Can we get to 54? Who's going to be number... Oh, we got 60. We've got 60. Can we get 62? Who's going to be number 62? Are you number 62? You were born to be a 65. There we go. 65 is in. We are into 65. Can we get to 70? Can we get to 70? I see a hand for 70. Thank you. Thank you, beloved. That's a 70 at the back. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. It feels like a sermon. Eh? Come to the front. Don't be shy. Just come to the front. All right. So we are up to 70 participants. Can we get to 80? Can we get to 80? All right. Please just know that we are tracking your device so we know if you are not participating. Because once you go onto the Wi-Fi, we know exactly who you are. That is what the 5G does. It even knows your income. Knows what's happening in your bank account. All right, so we're at 75. Can we push it to 80 participants? Can we get 80 answers in, please, for the first question? When you hear the word climate change, what comes to mind? We're at 78. We are at 78. Can we just get two more? Two more for question number one before we go to the next one. Right, so we're at 80. 
So let's go to the next question. Do you think climate change is real? And if you don't, why not? Could it be just a word that's been dumped on us? Maybe it comes from the aliens from outer space. Maybe there's some organization who's trying to make money and they're scaring us to do stuff. So you do, do you think climate change is real? And if not, what would be the reason? Right, definitely real. Yes, yes, absolutely. Scientific evidence is clear. Huh? Interesting, scientific evidence is clear, right? And how we battled with COVID. Mm. Is it there? Is it not there? Should we vaccinate? Should we not vaccinate? Should we believe the science or should we not believe the science? So are we believing the science on climate change, but we rejected the science when it got to other things? So what informs our decision making and how do we make decisions? What are the conversations that we have and who are the people standing at our brais? Are you the cleverest people or the cleverest person in your conversation? If so, please find other conversations. Are we up to 80 again? 76, 77. We need two more. We need two more almost there. Look at that. Oh, you guys are doing brilliantly. Can we get one to get to the 80? Oh, we at the 80 mark. We've got another question for you. So we wanted to hear your thoughts on climate change. We wanted to know whether you think it's real. Uh, the next question, from where do you get most of your information? Is it word of mouth? Is it social media? Is it the newspaper? Could it be the auntie across the road? Or are you just paying attention to what happens around you? So what is your source of information? And is it trustworthy? No, we must believe the white people told us. Well, no, we must not believe. The Sangoma said this is all wrong. Right, so where do we get our information from and can we trust it? Ooh, lots of social media, the internet, there's TikTok, civil organizations, research. People are reading research articles. My word, they go to the library. They are scholars ready to learn. Let's see if we can get up to 80. We had 63. We had 63 on this question. Where do you get your information from? It's in scripture. I mean, you do know that, you know, God made coffee. There's a book called Hebrews. <laughs> <laughs> All right, where do you get your information from? We're at 78. We need two more. We need two more. Can we get to 80? One more to get to 80, then at least we're there. Right, let's go to our last question, second last question. Um, what is your level of understanding? How would you rate your understanding on the topic of climate change? Are you an expert? Are you a novice? Are you a pro? Are you a beginner? How would you label your current understanding? Keeping in mind that we don't have a test yet, but as you answer this, we'll hand out uh, little question papers and you'll have 15 minutes to answer 34 questions and we'll also use that to just correlate your own measurement of self-knowledge. So how knowledgeable are you on the topic of climate change? How would you rate your level of understanding? Like, ish! <laughs> I think I can spell it, but that's about it. Climate change. I don't even have change for the 10 rand you asked me for climate change. Where are we now? We're at 70. Can we get 10 more? There's somebody giving themselves 40%. Of course, if you scored yourself 4 out of 10, then I hope that by the end of tomorrow, you will be 20 out of 10. Right? I mean, a student is somebody who knows that he or so she does not know. So if you know that you don't know, you know which questions you want answered, right? So as you also sit here, I want you to write down the questions that you would love answered by the end of tomorrow. 
And if we don't answer those questions, please ask them later on. So we're at 82, and we can now go to our fifth and final question, just getting a sense of where you are when it gets to the topic of climate change. How important is climate change? So you can decide on a scale of 1 to 10, how important is it that people, one, understand climate change and that we use that as a means or a mechanism to guide our thinking, our practice? Um, how important is it? So if you say very important, how important is very important? It's like very important to put sugar in your coffee, but if you don't have sugar, it's okay. Is that how important very important is? 10 out of 10, research important. Oh, it's very important. No room to argue about it. Lord, no room. So we must all just accept. We should have done this thing on COVID. I would have loved to see what people thought about this COVID thing. Or maybe we could just do it on monkeypox. Is monkeypox real? Or is it just a new thing to keep us out of the malls? It was lovely not going to the mall. I mean, we saved money. Yeah. With COVID, I used to get three weeks on a tank of petrol. Three weeks. My car was standing at home for three weeks. The tank stayed full. Three weeks. Now I have to go back to work. Now it's only three days. <laughs> All right. Are we at 76? So let's see if we can get to 80 again. How important is climate change? So guys, thank you for pro pro providing us with some insight into terms of your current thinking. And obviously, we will use that uh, to guide the rest of the program for the next two days. Um, because it's really about sharing information with you and helping you to make informed decisions. Um, are we going to do something immediately with the data or we'll just keep it? Later on? All right, so thanks for those answers, and, and we will look at the data, and we will share some of the insights that we, that we gather from that. So what we're going to do now is to move with our program. We're going to show you a video on climate change, uh, and then again, we will just check with you using Mentimeter, what is it that you picked up? What is it that you learned? What is it that you saw when you watched this video? So we're sharing you with you now a video on climate change, and again, it is just there to expand your thinking, your reasoning, your exposure, and then we'll get some insights from you in terms of what you picked up before we introduce then our first speaker for our two-day summit. Hello everyone. Today I will be speaking to you about a smart irrigation mobile app for poor cotton peanut and soybean. This is a project funded by the USDA National Institute of Food and Agriculture.
All right, so that was short, sweet, just a little bit of insight, sharing some information with you. Uh, so let's just see, what did you pick up? Um, so we're going back to Mentimeter, and we just have two questions for you to reflect on. Reflect on the video that we just shared and the information that was shared with you. Uh, and we just want to hear your thoughts uh, on, on two questions. The one being, what is it that you found most interesting? And the second being, whether the video in some way uh, changed some of your perceptions. So we're just going to activate Mentimeter again, um, and then we will give you an opportunity to answer those two questions before we bring uh, our first of two speakers to the stage, and that will take us to coffee. Right. Ready? So you've gathered your thoughts. Uh, we're just getting Mentimeter up for you quickly. Remember, go back to your browser. And as soon as that's open, we will give you the code that you will enter to access the platform. Right, so the code for this one is 97551745. The code 97551745. Right, and we want you just to reflect on two questions. The first one being, what was the most interesting thing you learned from the short little video? Uh, and if possible, you're welcome to explain that in a short phrase as well. Right, so what is it that you found most interesting when you watched the video? Was it the stats? Was it the information? Just, just please share your insights with us. Right, it's a regional project, information, diverse options available. Innovation integrated with conventional practices. We have to be smart. There's some things happening in Burkina Faso, uh, some statistics shared, uh, some strategies on how to fight the effects of climate change, information about stats, different practices, uh, different traditions, and probably also the sense that it's not just us, right? It's not just here at the tip of Africa. It's all over. So what are some of the things you picked up uh, when you watched that small little infographic, if you can call it that? Um, you found the information interesting. If you could unpack that, what kind of information? Um, was it new stuff or is it stuff that you already know? So did we affirm um, that maybe we'll explore that in the second question? Uh, thank you. We I see we're already at 48 responses, 50. Um, Agroforestry. Is that like agroforestry? Agroforestry. Rain harvesting, integrated livestock, how to deal with climate change and tradition and innovation. Good to know that people are doing a lot of things to combat climate change. Um, so that is what you found interesting. The rain harvesting using mulching. Um, climate change, adaption change, the statistics, innovation, the mixing and tradition. Right, so we're at 64. Let's see if we can get 80 of you to give us some kind of uh, sense of what you found interesting. Uh, also, please, if, if, the, if the video was not interesting, say. We don't want you to tell us, oh, it was gorgeous. Just say it was utter rubbish. Right, because it's also important for your learning to be relevant to you. If the video didn't speak to you, it didn't speak to you. Don't, don't make it up. Be truthful in terms of uh, whether you found it interesting and whether there was some interesting stuff that was shared. Um, that South Africa is not utilizing newer technologies. Right, so we, you're saying we are behind the curve on that one. That is what people found interesting. Planting more crops, this means uh, the more we plant, the more we can prevent soil removal. But in order to plant more, you need to cut down more trees. or not? Or is land readily available to just plant? Or do we need to create spaces to plant? I don't know, but that will be maybe some part of the debate and conversation going forward. So at 76, let's see if we can get four more, just four more to give us a, a sense of um, what you learned and what you found interesting when watching that video. So I'm going to push for the 80. I just love 80. My next birthday, I will be 80. I don't know when that is, but my next birthday, 
I might be 80. So if I get four more responses, that would be great. And then we will move to the next question uh, to just get some insights from you um, as well and just get a sense of what it is that you got from the video. Uh, so we just need three more, please. If three more people can just tell us, again, if you don't have to say it was interesting, just, just, just be truthful in terms of um, whether there's anything that resonated with you, anything that you picked up uh, when you watched the video. Should I pause for the three? Should I wait for the three? We wait. Mm. One more, one more. You're scanning the room and you're wondering whether that one person is sitting at your table and you want to say just flip and answer the question that we can just move on, right? So also get a sense if you see that there's somebody sitting at your table who's not doing anything with their phone, just nudge them and say, come on, get, get with the program, right? Um, because you all came here for a reason, right? And if that is to gather information, then you want to make sure that you, you, you gather as much information as humanly possible. I just need one more. Just, just be that person, that one, that last sheep, the one that the shepherd is going to look for, that one. Yes, you're the one. You know I'm looking at you. You know you are. You're the one. Come on. Give us the one. It's updating. So maybe the one is in. Yes, it's in. Well done. Well done. Well, let's go to the next question. Come on, let's, let's see if we can get to the 80 quick here, quicker. Uh, because we, we want to get to the real people and, and hear what they want to share with us. So did the video change any perceptions that you may or may not have on climate change? Did it move you either for or against? Uh, and just explain that to us, please. So when you watch the video, did you now say, you, now I am for this climate change thing? Or like, oh no, it's not as bad as I thought. Right, so any changes in your perceptions or your views? And please just give us a sense of what some of those changes are. So if you say no, just please tell us what is no. Because no means you could still say this is a pot of snot. So it's still a pot of snot. So, so it didn't change your perception, right? So, so if it didn't change, why did it not change it? Is it something that you were looking for that was not in the video? And if you say yes, tell us what, 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 was, what was that major shift for you? Not really, it was too fast. The video. We can show it again. It started off saying that 70% of all something. There was something about crops and Burkina Faso, and yeah, it was all there, it was all there, it was all there, it was all there. Right, no, we did not. Not what, not that much detailed, explained. Uh, we are aware that there are various methods used around the world, okay? So it was just kind of affirming what you already know. There was not, not a lot, so if you were on the one side of the fence, it kind of kept you there. So not detailed enough, not really, none. Just more insights, still have to be looked into. Right, we're at 64. Thank you very much for the comments that you're adding to your answers. Not really, however, realize that, that Africa should use more diverse agricultural techniques. Um, it broadened my knowledge on the unique mechanisms people are implementing to combat the effects of climate change. Right, so we're at 60. We're at 68. My word, you guys are doing way better now. Come on, let's push it to 80. Let's hurry up slowly. Let's get to 80 because you want to get the real people on stage. We've got this girl here. Yay. She loves animals, she says. You can't. I, you, I want you to meet her. And then there's a gent that I want you to meet as well. But you can only meet them if we get to the magical 80. We are now at 71. I need to find those nine souls. Are they at your table? Just look around. The person that's looking down now is probably the one who did not complete the survey. So just check your table. If anybody's looking down, you know, f playing with a pen, fidgety, that's probably the person who's not doing their part. Right, so you're at 77. We just need three more responses, uh, and then we can move on to sharing with you some more insights. Uh, coming on the one side from a journalist uh, and then a researcher 
based at the University of Cape Town. So we'll get some more insights, uh, and then at 11 o'clock on the dot, we will break for coffee. Right, I need one more. Hopefully it's not the same person that we waited for earlier. Hopefully it's a different one. And we go five, we go four, we go three, we go two, we go almost one, not yet one, close to one, very close to one. We are now at one, but not yet zero. So we're almost at zero, but we're not yet there because we're waiting for that person to just give us a response. Remember, I mean, you're on Wi-Fi, it's sponsored. The government is paying for you to give us your ideas and we want to listen and we want to see how we co-create and how we change the world one conversation at a time. So I just need one more response to get me to my magical 80 and then I will introduce to you our first speaker for the day. So if we can get to my 80, please, just that one person. You know who you are. There we go. Thank you very much. So we will close a Mentimeter. Um, and as we said, we are all about sharing information with you. And, and the information is, is really there to change your view, and, but also just to open the conversation. Uh, so we have some input coming from specialists and people in the field, but we also have some panel discussions happening later on, uh, and we want your participation in that. And then at the very end, we'll, we'll want to hear some of your questions that may, may not have been answered. So let me introduce to you our first speaker then for day one of our conference or our summit. Uh, she's passionate about animals. She was born, she grew up, and she's now here. I've known her for about five seconds because we just met at the back. Uh, she's an award-winning radio journalist and presenter, and she specializes in environmental matters. Um, you know, she's linked to places or have been linked to places like KFM, Cape Talk, and even Smile Radio. She's lectured at the university. She's a columnist. She's a script writer. She's a text writer. But she's also the ambassador for Yeselkis Rus Donkey Sanctuary. Ladies and gents, your hands and mine for the one and only Lizma van Sale. stand-up comedy, I swear. Brilliant. Hi, guys. Nice to be here. And Dr. Troutman, thank you for having me. Okay, so we're talking about science communication today. I'm a journalist, and we often battle with press releases or with scientific reports if we have to write a story. So I want to speak to you about that from our side, what we experience because it's sometimes quite difficult to understand what is being said. And um, I've got some tips for you, but I also want to talk to you about a few things and get your views on a few things. But I have a question for you, first and foremost. I would like to know how many of you are gamers, play video games, raise hands, no mentimeters, just old-fashioned hand raising. One, two, three, very few, six. Okay. So there's about 20 gamers in this audience. You are among 3,1 billion gamers in the world, which is a third of the global population. I'm preparing to do a television series, and we're starting to film in 10 days' time about digital addiction, internet addiction. And um, it's a hugely controversial topic. It's diverse, it's so broad, and I've spent hundreds of hours researching and speaking to people before we start filming. So one of the people that I was referred to is a neuropsychologist from Chicago, and she's a very clever woman, and she has a special interest in internet addiction. So I gave her a call, and we had a fantastic talk, and then when I got to the more specific questions like, I asked her what happens in the brain when you play too much games, when you do too much videoing. She started and she gave me a, an explanation that was so technical and convoluted. And I went back to her and I said, maybe can you explain again, because it's this cell doing that and that cell doing that. 
and if I don't understand it as the presenter of the show, I'm not going to be able to convey to the audience, so I need to understand it. She couldn't explain it to me, but I do, sorry, I'm popping. I do appreciate the fact that she was willing, but she didn't have the ability as a scientist to speak to me as a normal person, as a non-taking, non-medical person. And the result was I had to go back to the internet and go and do a lot of research and find credible sources, but somebody who can explain it to me a little more simply, which I did eventually, but it took a lot of time and effort. So, you have to assume, if you're a scientist, and um, Dr. Johnston, Stephanie Ilse, I mean, we have scientists here, and um, you happen to be some of the exceptions, because I've dealt with all of you, and you have the ability to convey information. But there's a lot of scientists who do battle to convey that information to an audience that's understandable, that's in a language that all of us speak. Um, EarthMagazine.org has a fantastic article on what a good science story is. It says, science stories also benefit, also benefit from important elements like compelling characters, vivid imagery, and moments of catharsis. And the key to a science story is the opportunity to include a take-home message, sharing the so what of a scientific study. So today we're talking about climate change, and I want to ask you guys, again, not Mentimeter, it's a fantastic new device, I didn't even know of it, but I want you to talk to me. I want you to tell me, when you think about cli ch climate change, what you feel, just instinctively, reflexively, what comes to mind when you think about climate change? Yes. Morning, good morning. Your name? I'm Eddie. Hello, Eddie. Uh, nice to be here. Nice to have you here. Well, I can really relate to what you are saying, because too often as academics, we normally keep information within the confines of academia. But personally, I do think climate change is not only a Mm. So I do believe after this conference, what you should, you should really do as a collective is to go back to our ancient higher spaces and talk to the people, spread the word in a language that they could understand. Brilliant. I absolutely agree with you. That's the most important thing in a language we all understand. Thank you, Eddie. That helps a lot. Anybody else? Just a word. What comes to mind when you think about climate change? Is it sadness? Is it a sense of loss? Is it fear? What comes to mind? Sorry? Okay, uncertainty. Yep. And why, this brings me to my point, why do you feel the way you do? If you think about climate change, because I'm sure you all, and I've seen your answers, you all do experience and feel something. But why? Is it because of what you hear in the media, what you see, or is it because of what you experience? And I want a, a, an answer from you again. Um, is what you know, I saw some of the questions are similar to what I'm asking you, but is it because of the fact that you live it, that there are practical implications in your daily lives? Or is it because of what you read? Mostly. Thank you. Yeah, your name? Hello. Mm. And your region? Okay. So for you, it's very much practical. It's what you experienced over the past five years. Okay. Guys, when I hear or see anything about climate change, it evokes a response in me. I feel something, like I said, whether it's sadness, loss, fear, or a sense of hope. And a lot of what many people experience when it comes to climate change and how they perceive it is a result of what they hear and see in the media. 
And yes, regardless of all the information and news reports, there are still people who think climate change is a myth because their day-to-day -day lives do not get affected like yours do. And I saw there's one person in the audience that said, no, climate change does not exist. It's a crisis created by environmental environmentalists. Maybe tomorrow, after the conference, you will feel differently. Who knows? But it was interesting to see that. There's a fire, okay, so communicating climate change therefore becomes incredibly important. What we as the media, scientists and lawmakers tell people and how, the how, is just as important as the what, what we tell them. There's a fine line between conveying the truth and making people feel helpless and conveying the truth but spurring them on to act with something so many people still ex experience as being an abstract um, concept because they do not feel or are blind to the impact of climate change on their daily lives. The responsibility becomes so much greater to convey the message, to make people understand what is happening and how big the threat is. And that means giving the facts without scaring people. It goes on said that our information, and I'm talking about journalists like myself, has to be credible and accurate. Our role as journalists is not only to keep people informed and to act as a watchdog, but also to raise awareness. And if we are solutions driven and not instead of sensational, we have the power to share, to shape public opinion and to change behavior. So our stories need to be factual and credible. They have to pull people in, in order for them to read, watch, or listen. And what we say has to be understandable, as we just said, and relevant to our audiences. And that sounds easier said than done. And the starting point of, our, of this whole thing is our sources. Where do we get the information from? And very often, it's from scientists. I believe 86% of research on climate change in South Africa gets done by universities, which means most of the information on climate change comes from tertiary education institutions, academics, scientists, researchers. But we all have a responsibility as the media, academics, politicians, and the private, private sector. Everyone who has something to contribute to this massive subject, we all need to be, and I keep coming back to this word, we all need to be responsible. As what we say affect how people feel, and what they feel eventually results in what they do, how they act. We spoke about, um, Gillian spoke about day zero, about the bucket in your shower, and I also want to come back to day zero. Do you guys remember it clearly? Four years ago, five years ago. So we faced that terrible water crisis. Local government threatened to turn off the taps. And at that point, I interviewed a psychiatrist, Dr. John Parker, as part of the Quick Stay radio series. We'll talk about that tomorrow. And what Dr. Parker said made a lot of sense. He explained that the threat to turn off the water was a shock tactic in order to change behavior. And it did, although not everyone rose to the occasion. Some people were so scared, some were just lazy, some didn't take it seriously, but the majority did. And the water usage dropped by leaps and bounds. So we averted a crisis. People are still in two minds whether it was the right tactic to use, to, you know, to fr uh, frighten people in order to get results. But this thing was a massive communication drive and it came from local government, the city of Cape Town, all concerned parties, but it was portrayed and conveyed through the media. It was massive, and the result, we averted a huge crisis. So I'm trying to tell you that's the power of communication. If you have such a strong drive and you get people to come together, you can change, you can make such big changes, you can make fundamental changes in your world. During the course of the Quicksteig, I interviewed more than 100 people on the topic of climate change. Three of them are sitting right here, Professor Midgley, Dr. Johnston, Dr. Troutman. Sorry, I used the titles. You said we're only using first names. And um, one of the topics we discussed uh, quite in depth was communication, science communication, and the responsibility of scientists, the role of the media, 
One of the people we spoke to is Robin Huber. She's editor of the Dairy Mail. It's a semi-scientific publication by the Milk Producers Organization. Robin emphasized the huge role that scientists play in keeping us, the media and the public, informed. But, as I also said, the scientists sometimes battle to convey the information in a manner that's understandable to the general public. The media plays a big role here in bridging the gap between scientist and consumer. If we write our stories well and in a language that's understandable, we will be able to truly reach our audiences and in the process raise awareness and hopefully change behavior. I want to give you another example, uh, something that's um, an interview that stayed with me. It's, I d did it 30 years ago. And I will never forget it. I was a young radio journalist and I was working KFM at the time. I just started this. Sorry, guys. And this still makes me emotional after all these years, three decades. So there was a lot of pressure on me that day. The news editor, we heard about a whale that was beached in Plettenberg Bay on the beach there, it, um, the whale beach itself. And the editor said to me, get a sound clip, find somebody on the scene to speak to, to get a quick sound clip to play in the radio news bulletin. And I was eager to make, uh, you know, to impress him. And, but we battled to find somebody there. And eventually, uh, somebody at um, Pettenburg Bay Tourism said, there's one guy on the beach that you can speak to. The, uh, the other guys are on a tea break, but there's one guy left. He's a marine biologist. And she gave me his cell phone number. And I phoned him, eager, and I'm on a deadline to get it on the news as quickly as possible because in radio news you have to be quicker than the other station who gets the news first and when this guy answered his cell phone I could hear he, he had a stutter and I explained to him who I was I said doctor this and this I really need a sound clip from you for our next news bulletin about this beach well what efforts being put into getting this well back into the water who was involved so if I say my name, Lizma, it takes a millisecond. Eddie, if you say your name, it, I mean, it's for this guy to be able to just tell me what his name was, took 16 seconds. It's long, it doesn't sound long. That's how long it took him. Uh, he couldn't get it out. But this man, this biologist, was prepared to speak to me. He said he could hear. I was so desperate for a sound clip. He didn't know what I was going to do with that interview. He didn't know whether I was going to edit him, take out all his stutters. He had the courage to say, to say, okay, I will speak to you, let's go for it. But he didn't know because his name was going to be mentioned and his speech I mean, he has serious difficulty with his speech, but he was courageous enough to speak to me. It took me two hours to interview him, to get a clip of 30 seconds. But that day, I just decided, I'm going to stick this out. It, I, I, I cannot begin to tell you how long it took for him to get one sentence out. And I sat and I said to the editor, we're not going to have this, you know, make another plan, get NSRI or somebody else. And I sat and I listened to this man. And while he was speaking, the tears ran down my face. He just kept on going. And I want to, actually, I'm becoming emotional now. The result is, it took me hours to edit that interview. And eventually, oh, can't believe it, 30 years later. But I played that clip. We got it on air. And I couldn't take all his stutters out because the would sound unnatural. But it was a day's work. But to this day, I salute that man for his courage. And yes, he was a scientist, and he has a speech impediment. But what he said to me, although it took a hell of a long time, was so beautiful and so kind, and his compassion for animals, and the, just his eloquence um, 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 within that speech impediment was just so beautiful, what he told me and how he explained what was happening to the well. So. What I'm saying to you, it doesn't always has to be about a beautiful voice and speaking eloquently. It's talking from the heart. And um, if you share knowledge, 
it must come from a place of deep knowledge and heart. You can never go wrong if you speak from the heart. Okay, so climate outreach. This is on a far less emotional level. Climateoutreach.org recently published a very interesting article, and I want to read to you the title of this article. The IPCC, do you guys know what the IPCC is? International Planet for Climate Change. Climate Impacts Report is here. Now, how do we engage people with that? So the subtitle of this article is called Sealing the Signs. Okay, I'm reading from that article. Polling, polling consistently shows that scientists are trusted messengers, but as Netflix's Don't Look Up showed, talking about the science can be difficult. Decades of research tells us that facts aren't enough on their own. People's values, worldviews, and capacity to act influence how they re respond to information about climate change, far more than how much they know about science. After years of increasingly urgent reports from the IPCC, it's clear that the reports themselves are not enough to rally public engagement. They must be paired with an effective understanding of good science communication. I quoted from that article, and I'm going to talk to you about that a little more tomorrow, but it is a problem. The IPCC is a fantastic organization. On De Quick Stake, the radio series we did, we spoke to Professor, Professor Francois Engelbrecht, and he was one of the main writers of the 2017 report. And speaking of De Quick Stake, um, it's a radio series, it was the brainchild of Dr. Ilse Troutman with the help of um, Stephanie Mitchley and Peter van Rijn and they were my go-tos on this two-year-long journey. It was a fantastic journey, I got to interview people like Peter Johnston and um, we spoke to members of the farm farming community across the spectrum, foremost experts on climate change in the world but also with the people, just the farming community, the agriculture sector. And some of you may not understand, it was um, in Afrikaans, uh, but I want to play you seven minutes of interviews from this series. In total, we recorded 1,200 minutes. So this is a snippet of what we did over two years, and the series is being repeated on RSG Radio Sona Grens at the moment. But is it okay? Can you spill? Thank you. I look at you, you look at me, I look at you. Yes, you can sing to us. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> sure, Zelosa. Okay, this is all right. It's rolling, it's all happening. And as a man is now forspelling in the toekomst, can a man see that the time of 2001 is going to be, is it possible to be four geworden warmer to word? And this is a great problem for our everyday life. Die vooruitskatting van de maas van anderen is dat de Weeskaalprovincie, die provincie is waar de meeste die de maas van anderen geraakt gaan worden. In de uitdaging voor ons gaan wees dat ons waarschijnlijk meer droogtes gaan nemen en meer vloeden. Dus so meer intense weerstelsels. Because we, we're in the subtropics, we have two huge oceans on either side of us, the southern ocean also to the south of us. So I, I think that we have some time to adapt to the worst effects of climate change because our climate is, is somewhat buffered by having the, these huge ocean systems around us and the fact that we're in the subtropics. The landbouw sector has a great impact worldwide in place of climate change. Landbouw is responsible for so much as 30% of the total kweekhuis gas that worldwide produced. Landbouw is also a great producer of water, um, for besproeiingsdoeleindes, to two thirds of the total certificate of water use to the landbouw. I think it's, it's changed a lot in terms of access. People have access to so much information and they talk about the information explosion. So farmers now have information on the web, they have cell phones and cell phone apps, and there's satellite information which they can procure through various means, some of it's free on the internet. We have the options to um, use near real-time crop monitoring and again service providers that are offering a lot of uh, solutions based on that. And then we hear these days about smart farms, where everything on the farm is, is connected wirelessly to everything else. 
Dr. Annelietje, wat kan ons doen persoonlijk om voedselveiligheid te verseker? Die verbruiker speel een baie, baie belangrike rol. Met ander woorde, bijvoorbeeld die storing van voedsel, hoe dit in die uh, ijskast gestoor word, die hantering van voedsel in die kombuis, die voorbereiding daarvan, uh, is alles ontzettend belangrijk. Is jy bekommerd oor klimaatsverandering? Ja, ek is bekommerd, maar nie noodwendig ek self nie, maar soos vir my kinders, enig en klein kinders, man, hulle moet nog ook groot word en die omgeving was nou, en ons het so aangaan, ja, sien ek nie een goeie, goeie toekomst hulle nie. Daar vind gebewismaking plaas, as ek na my kring kan ek die leerplanne kyk op skolaarskool, so daar is een mate daarvan, maar ons kan altyd meer doen, en daar is absoluut geen betere leermeester as die krisis nie, soos die afgelopen droogte getoon het, ek denk, amal, ou mense, kinders, amal het baie geleer in termen van die waarde van water, en die probleem wat in die korte samgaan, Wat van die planswerkers en wat word al gedoen om hulle werk te beskerm in hierdie moeilike tuie? Dis maar, ek kan nie namens ander mense praat nie, maar ek kan vaar dat daar boere is wat net eenvoudig nie meer hulle oorspronkelijke getalle plaaswerkers kan ander nie. Ons het van die jaar in 2015 was het bitter moeilik, maar ons het nou iets uitgedink om die man nie bezig te hou, stuur hulle op een klein kursus om te leer soeis of om gif te bespuit of iets net om hulle bezig te hou so dat jou benauwdheid nie oorskuif na jou werkers toe nie dat hulle ding daar is nog een toekomst vir hulle MG Sakke het net al gesê hoe belangrijk dit is dat die boerderij gemeenskap mekaar ondersteun ondervind jy dit ook? Lisma, een jockey het ook betrek jou voedsel morg hy wil ook sy hart weer volkere hy wil ook weer energie hee Landbouw of die boer op die plaas, op die graan, is nie net altyd slecht soos hulle nie die hulle teker uitmaak nie. Dat is baie dinge waar aan die boer moet denk. En ek, as MG, ek beteker ook maar een bykie sê, hoe kan my geinspuit ons nodig om my aardweeslag vol te kry. Smart Agri is een klimaatsveranderingsplan, spesifiek vir die Westkaapse landbouwsektor. Die plan het die focus om dan ook te kyk of ons ons sektor weer klimaatslim en klimaatsveerkrachtig kan maak. Sê vir jy, wat er gebede in die weeskaap is vir jy die grootste bekommernis? Ja, dit is een belangrike vraag, want nie die hele provincie is even koosbaar nie, so ons grootste bekommernis is in die weeskas gedeelte, en specifiek gewasse wat afhankelijk is van die reenval, want ons verwacht dat daar die gedeelte gaan minder reenval kry in die toekomst en op baie warme raak. Maar dan is ons ook bekommerd oor die binnenlandse gedeelte, soos die klein kan roe, waar het baie warm raak en op baie droog is, en ons verwacht ook meer verwarming in daar die gedeelte is. En dan natuurlijk die bespoedingslandbouw is koosbaar, tydens bijvoorbeeld droogte soos wat ons nou ondervind, as daar nie genoeg water is. Ek praat nou spesifiek van die dag zero aankondiging wat as die grootskop vir kalpenaars gekom het. Ek sê even daarvan wat jy wil, daar was baie kritiek van die definitie van dag zero van af en nationale regeringse kant af, wat glad nie gehoud van die conceptie, maar die feite is, as jy gaan kyk hoe die verbruik afgekom het, stad Kaapstadse waterverbruik, van meer as een miljard liter water per dag gebruik tot omtrend 500 miljoen liter per dag. Linda, jy het in 2002 in Dringerplan te begin verweider, wat jy letterlik elke dag met die panda uitgekap het. Nou, ook dank sy lijnke, besit jy jou eie in Dringerplan verweideringsonderneming. Die lekkerste deel is om elke keer gaan jy na verskillende plekke waar jy werk in die natuur. En net om te weet, jy doen ook bijdra wat soveel verandering in ons levens bring, waterbesparing is een daarvan. En dan weet jy, wanneer jy daar klaar is en jy kyk te rach oor die jaar en jy sien die verandering wat daar is op die area, dit is die lekkerste van alles om te weet, jy doen die positieve bijdra. Professor Engelbrecht, ook lid van die Verenigde Nasies Interregeringspaneel vir Klimaatsverandering, IPCC, het onder meer vertel dat die meeste kweekhuisgasse ooit verlede jaar 2019 in die atmosfeer vrygelaat is. Professor Engelbrecht het ook genoem dat Ruse korttermijn uitgehaal is, nodig is vir langtermijn voordele. Die harde realiteit van klimaatsverandering en klimaatsveranderings ingrijpings is dat daar net voordele is en sluitende ekonomische voordele as al die lande van die wereld saamwerk om koolstof die oksiet emissies te verminder. So as ons in Zuid-Afrika ons best doen en ons aanvaar op die korttermijn koolstof in ons ekonomie om een omskakeling te doen van ons afhankelijkheid van steenkool na die hernieuwbare vorme van energie maar die selfde word nie gedoen in die groot ekonomie van die noordelike halfing, 
So as soon as the VSA not that really climate and climate can do it, it can not really do what we do in South Africa. It can not do what the European Union do in terms of the strike and climate change. So you can not get the advantages of the costs that you have in the economy on the short term as all of them. Die program reeks wil dier die Westkaapse Departement van Landbouw ondersteun. Ons groet tot volgende week. Onthou, die aarde is kostbaar. Kom op. Baie dankie jylle. Die laaste sin ek was. Onthou, die aarde is kostbaar. Kom ons bewaard het. Is there anything that stands out? Is there anything that you picked up on? That touched you? Ja, at the back. Do you mind standing up? Thank uh, you. Good day, everybody. Is it, is it on? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, the thing is, uh, I think one of the, the speakers that was speaking there. Would you mind just telling me your name first? Oh, Khaki Solifaza. Hello, pleased yeah. to meet you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. So, um, I also pick up cognitive, cognitive, uh, cognitive dissonance when it comes to climate change. You know, um, the gentleman also uh, mentioned something like, you get so much talk when it comes to climate change and less doing. Yeah, they're talking about innovations and stuff. But I also feel that, you know, um, when it comes to policies, we want to see the government um, implementing those things, you know. So people will just see these things, you know, and then if you're going to be shifting the needle to, to the consumer side a lot and not putting policies in place, it's going to take us a long time. So um, that's what I picked up from the last gentleman that was making the comment that we need the government to push it forward, put policies in place, and then people will always follow the policies. And of course, the education starting at the grassroots. Thank you. Thank you very much. Absolutely. Political will. There has to be political will behind this. Otherwise, nothing can get done. Anybody else? Anything that you would like to comment on in that sound clip? Okay. Guys, in closing, um, thank you, Mary. What gets communicated to us shapes our behavior. Communication is the key to human interaction, the building blocks of relationships and the tool that empowers us to act, whether it's on a personal or professional level. In a book by Sipo Kings and Sarah Wiles that include practical tips to combat and cope with climate change, the chapter on mental health starts as follows. Climate change depresses. Full stop. And yes, that's true, and there's a variety for re of reasons for that, and we can sit until tomorrow for that. But as Dr. Parker said in that interview I did with him, it's important that we do not run away from the problem, but tackle it head on. Anxiety decreases, decreases, when we feel we are doing something. Become part of the solution, not the problem, and that goes for all aspects, aspects of our lives, not only professional, but personal as well. Communication, guys, is absolutely key. Thank you very much for having me, for listening to me, and if there are any questions, you're most welcome to ask. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye, donkey. Right, thank you very much, uh, Lisa. Just a reminder for those of you on social media, on Facebook, uh, if you post anything, please use the hashtag uh, WC, so Western Cape Agri Youth in Climate. So if you post anything on social media, please use the hashtag uh, WC Agri Youth in Climate. Uh, so Lisa, thank you for, for those insights, uh, just reminding us about the importance of communication. Uh, you guys know that information is readily available, right? If you've got one of these things, you can get all the info that you, that you need. The important thing for you is to develop your filters. How do you know what is crap? And how do you know what are the things that you listen to? And obviously we need to then find out who are the specialists and allow them to speak to us but also understanding the complication that comes with communication, that not everybody is gifted, and often we have scientists who come to us as if they know, and then forget to tell us that they didn't wake up knowing, but it actually took years to get to that point where they know. And how do they take us on their journey? Uh, it reminds me of my dad who used to tell me that a medical doctor is somebody who 
does a lot, but they don't know a lot. A specialist is somebody who knows a lot, but they don't do much, apart from charging you three times what a doctor charges you. Then you have a pathologist who knows a lot and does a lot, but it's always too late <laughs> because they work in the morgue, right? Uh, so it's really about saying that we have these people around, but how do we spend time learning from them? Uh, and how do we, we help them to help us? Because I think when it, talk, when it comes to seeing, we must understand it's, it's not just what you see. It is why you see. How many of you are afraid of snakes? How many of you have ever been attacked by a snake? So when you see a snake, you run. Why? Because you were told that snakes are scary and dangerous. And yet, you have never been attacked by a snake. So when you see a snake, it's not what you see, it's why you see. And the why you see is because you want to survive. And that's why you run. So when we talk about seeing, it's not just what you see, it's understanding why you see. I'm deep now? Yes! And this is only on a Wednesday. You must see me on a Thursday. Yo, oh, then I'm like really deep. But let me introduce you to another deep guy. This man was born, he's a climate scientist, and he works at the University of Cape Town. Uh, his research focuses on the vulnerability and adaptation options related to agriculture and water-related activities. He's currently involved in a project called CONFER. I've got no idea what that is. No, I'm just giving you time to walk. I don't want you to fall, so take your time. This is a clever man. He was born, he grew up, and as he's coming to stand next to me, I will touch his hand, and then all that knowledge will come to me, and I will leave this podium knowing way more than what he does. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Peter Johnson, and he's here to talk to us about climate change in the Western Cape. <clears throat> well, thank, you. thank you very much. Can I just ask if we switch these lights off and then can I ask, can you see the screen? Oh, I forgot the pointer. Because if you can't see the screen, then I'm going to stand down there. But I'm going to have to turn around and look at the screen sometimes too and also point to it. So I'm going to be in the way. Um, first, let me tell you, I think they invited the wrong guy. So I don't believe in climate change. But wait, it's not a belief system. It's not something you believe because you read it in a book or someone told you. We don't have special meetings of climate scientists to believe in climate change. It's not a belief system. No one says, I believe in climate change. You either accept the evidence or you reject it. It's your right. But you've got to look at the evidence. You can't just say, oh, I heard about this thing called climate change. I think it's real. Like a little girl, sweet man. Climate is definitely changing this morning. It's sunny and this afternoon it's raining. It doesn't work like that. So how does it work? Are we really... Are we really burning up? Here we go. He's winding me up. Thanks, Wood. So let's look at the evidence. Firstly, yesterday, big day in London. Big day. My brother lives there. They were cooking. There's a long story about here. Yeah, the before cost did 40 degrees for the first time. Everyone was panicking. They were wrapping stuff in tin foil. They were getting everyone off the tube. They were putting everyone in their house, telling them close the windows, close the doors. They got to 40.2. Now, if you live in Picketburg, 
you laugh at 40.2. But they don't there. They don't know what's going on. They stand outside and they look at the sun and say, what's that? It's very unusual. It's extreme. And in London, we'll talk, I'll talk about it in a minute. There's a lot of people and they don't know what to do. They don't have a thing called air conditioning. Air conditioning is their hand like this. That's air conditioning. So that's a problem. But let's get some facts first, because we must never confuse what we think we know with what is true. It's a very thin line between a fact and a fake. First of all, that's South Africa. Different regions in South Africa have different rainfall. Did you know that? I think you did. Most of South Africa has summer rainfall. When you travel overseas for the first time and you tell them it's winter now, and they go, no, it can't be, it's July. And you say, yeah, it's winter. And they say, but look here, it's summer. If you go there for Christmas, they say, what do you mean you spend Christmas at the pool? It's cold and snowy. And they don't understand things are different. And even some South Africans, they come to the Western Cape for the first time and say, what? Why is it raining? It's winter. Because we get different rainfall regions. Winter rainfall region, bugger all rainfall region, summer rainfall region, and all year round rainfall region. Okay, it's different. So we must understand that. And this is the situation for Cape Town. This is the climate of Cape Town. I'm going to scoop this big worm. This is the climate of Cape Town. This is what we expect. Okay, so there's a certain amount of rainfall that we get mostly in winter. And there's a certain temperature we get. So if we look at July now, July we should be around 16 degrees. Has anyone even been outside? It's around 16 degrees, maybe 15. Because that's the climate, that's what we expect. The weather is what we get, but climate is what we expect. The rainfall in July, this is Cape Town, should be about 125, 128 millimeters in July. Not so much, not so much. There's the difference. Every year is different. This year, July rainfall is much, much lower than that. And there's about 10 days left, so we'll see what's going to happen. But these are the facts we're dealing with. So we talk about something called climate change, then we expect to see things changing from this. But there's a big problem just in the Western Cape, just here. Look at all the differences. In Newlands, 1,400 millimeters of rainfall a year. At the airport, 700 millimeters of rainfall a year. That's like 15 kilometers. So, at the same Afrikaans, there's a Morsa difference. Then you go even further, you go over there and it's like 500, and you go there, it's 400. Then in Yonkersuk, it's over 2,000. But look at the altitude, 50 meters there and 1,500 meters there. So, we've got this massive difference. So, how, where, if, who, how, e, uh, who, it's confusing. It's difficult stuff to say, oh, the climate's going to change. The climate changes from Newlands to the airport. The climate changes from Elsenburg to Somerset West. So we must be very careful that we know what we're talking about. And also, we have a drought. That's a normal year. Oh, it's like a green. Like a green, that's all the wheat and the canola. Then we have a dry year. Okay? There's a drought there. And there wasn't a drought there, but there was a drought there. And there was no wheat. They got one ton per hectare, they were laughing. They didn't even get that. Now, if you go to Johan's experimental farm, because we do smart agriculture, even when there's a drought, we get a yield. So maybe we mustn't worry about it too much. But this is normal to get droughts. And we know why, I'm going to skip through these slides, because you can't really see the color, but there's, that's a, a summer condition where it's green in, in, the, in, the, in the interior, and this is a winter condition where it's dry in the interior and there you can see it's green because this is a winter condition with winter rainfall and we know why because there's systems that you don't give this anymore in geography. How many of you did geography at school? All right, now how many of you didn't do geography at school? Okay, how many of you never put your hands up when someone asks you to? <laughs> yeah, there's always one. Okay, so you might have seen this if you did geography, synoptic chart, summer conditions, low pressure, lots of rainfall, low pressure means unstable, Okay, lots of rainfall there. High pressure means wind coming from the east and the southeast, nice and dry. That's the summer conditions, the winter conditions. Low pressure is coming past the Western Cape. High pressure in the center, dry conditions, northwesters, westerlies, rain conditions. Most of the time. How many days in winter does it rain 
in the southwestern Cape. Okay, winters now. Let's take winter as being the six-month period from April through to September. Okay, April, May, June, July, August, September, those six months. How many days do we get rain during those six months? 173? What did you say? 126? About 35. 35 days. It rains. And we say winters are cold and wet. Ah, sometimes. When summer, it's only about 11. Okay, so that's the number of days we get. We probably get about 45 to 50 days in which it rains in the Western Cape. And we know why. Now we've got three cities up there. You might not recognize this one because those buildings aren't there. They've been gone since 2001. But that city, anyone, 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 anyone? Quickly, do you want to do a Mentimeter now or must I just ask you? Anyone? Yes, thank you, New York. This one? Oh, brilliant. Geniuses. And this one? Okay, which one gets the highest rainfall? New York. Which one gets the highest rainfall in the year? New York. Nobody. Cape Town. Nobody. London. Nobody. Everyone says London. No. Some people are undecided. That's it, Jay. New York. Well, let's get the fact, shall we? It's not about what you think. New York gets 1,260 millimeters in a year. Cape Town, come on, 820 millimeters a year. That's in the center of Cape Town. This is the center of these cities. I'm going to fall off here. And London? Ah, jumped the gun. 583 millimeters. Now it's round about now that someone sits at the back and says, ah, ah, can you see? And they're all out there, Google. So I did it for you. Now, hang on a second. Hang on a second. London, the least rainfall of those three cities. But we all know that if you go to London, you must take an umbrella. Because it's always raining. No, it's not. It's always drizzling. A little bit of rain here and there. May snow, may be sunny. It's variable. But we've got to get our facts right. London gets less rainfall than us. So why are we so worried about drought in Cape Town? Because it gets hot. And we keep our water in dams and that water evaporates. And there's lots of people who want water in Cape Town. As many people as there are in London just about. So that's a different situation. So what's this deal with global warming and climate change? Is there a difference? What, what is the deal? If someone says, okay, what's global warming? And then someone says, what's climate? Do you know? Well, hopefully you will after today. So we need to look at climate change questions, and these are the sort of questions that your mummy's going to ask you when you get home, or your brother's going to ask you, or your puppy's going to ask you, is it real? How do we know it's real? Has it already started? What's going to happen? Can we stop it? What about food and water? Now, I know that you all have heard about climate change, and you all think you know enough, and that's brilliant. We're just going to go through some facts here so you've got real foundation so you can go and talk to people about it. That's my plan. First of all, what's the deal with the carbon dioxide? Well, you all did biology at school. You all know, <gasps> breathe in oxygen, <gasps> breathe out carbon dioxide. Well, that's wrong. We breathe in mostly nitrogen. And we breathe out nitrogen. There's a little bit of oxygen in the air which we use and we convert it in our bodies to carbon dioxide and we breathe that little bit out. That is true. And plants require it. But there's a whole cycle of, of, of carbon in the planet. All right? And it's all in balance, up and down, up and down, up and down, up and down. Whoa, hang on. Up only. Land use changes, fossil fuel combustion. So we're disturbing that balance of carbon through various activities that we do. And that's increasing the amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And that affects the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is very, very important. It's critical for life on the planet. If we have no greenhouse effect, we will die because the greenhouse effect has got gases in the atmosphere that absorb heat, just like a greenhouse does, and keeps it warmer inside than it would be normally. So when the sun goes down and the lights come on, it doesn't get to minus 40 degrees like it does on the moon. The moon's just there, guys. It's just there. It takes you three days to go there. Not even. It's closer than freaking Limpopo. Okay? 
One, one blonde woman said, oh, well, I must be rude now. I said to her, what's, you know, what's further, the moon or Durban? She said, Durban? I said, how can you say Durban is further than the moon? She said, well, I can see the moon. I can't see Durban. <laughs> but these greenhouse gases keep it warm at night, so it's very, very important that we have this greenhouse effect. But if you introduce more carbon, the greenhouse effect is made worse. And the planet warms up, and the atmosphere is now warmer than it was before. Ach, that's not a problem. We just get rid of our jackets. And the plants, and the animals. No, they just, they, 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 oh, we're all going to die. Where does that come from? Electricity generation, transport, and agriculture. Agriculture is a major component to reducing to increasing carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. But, but how? It was plants. We plant plants, and the plants take in the carbon dioxide. Everyone knows that. Yeah, but what did you take out before you put in the plants? Oh, yeah, faint bores, uh, forests, uh, just bushes. Those bushes were there 365 days a year, every day, 24-7, and they're busy converting. Carbon dioxide, oxygen, carbon dioxide, oxygen, worry, worry, worry. Now you take them out and you plant wheat. How often is the, how long is the wheat there? Oh, we plant in May. And then, oh, we harvest in November. And then, no, then we eat wheat pigs. So between November and May, what? No, uh, uh, sheep. So there's no carbon dioxide being absorbed in that time. So by changing from natural vegetation to agriculture, you're actually leading to more carbon dioxide being in the atmosphere. And then you get cows. Whoa, machis, there's a lot of cows. A lot of cows. So what's cows got to do with carbon dioxide? Not much. They also breathe out a little carbon dioxide. What they do is methane. And methane is 20 times more powerful as a greenhouse gas than carbon dioxide. Fact. So where did it come with methane? Well, you can't eat grass. Try. Try eating grass. You did it as a child. Everyone... What happens? comes out as grass in one of two holes. Let's not get into the details, but it comes out as grass because you don't have the specific stomach that does the enteric digestion of grass like cows do. And when cows eat grass, have you watched a cow eat? They never stop. It's like a teenager with chewing gum. And then they stop and they swallow. And they think, they bring it up and they start chewing again. When they bring it up, it comes up with a whole lot of methane. It goes out into the air. It doesn't come out the back. It comes out the front. And that's all part of the way that they eat grass. And that's, that's a natural thing. But it's not natural to have five billion cows on the planet. And that's the problem. Anyway, I must move along. Greenhouse gases. Haven't the temperatures of the earth always been changing? Hasn't it always changed? Remember there were things called ice ages. And the sea levels rise and, and, and drop. and oh, it's, it's been going on forever. Don't worry about it. Don't worry. It's all going to have tea. Okay, bye. Now wait. We know. If we go back in history, this goes back 500,000 years. This is the present. That's 500,000 years ago. This is the temperature. We've got this from ice cores in the Antarctic. It's a fact. Okay, no one argues with this. No skeptics will look at that and say, das nie, nie. They all know that this is correct. And we go back and we see the temperatures gone down and up and down and up and down and up and down and up. And it wasn't greenhouse gases, even though we can track the carbon dioxide and the methane and we can see that they also go down and up. In fact, they track, they're very similar. When the carbon dioxide in the atmosphere is high and the methane is high, the temperature on the earth is high. But there weren't people burning fossil fuels and messing around with agriculture then. It was a completely natural cycle. And I'll talk about it in a minute, but it gets very technical. But the point is, when you warm the earth up, if the earth gets warmer, and it's because of the sun, then the temperature of the oceans gets warmer, and your Coca-Cola goes flat. When your Coca-Cola goes flat, when your Coca-Cola, say that quickly, when your Coca-Cola goes hot, it gets flat. So when the sea gets warm, it gets flat. The carbon dioxide that's dissolved in the sea escapes into the atmosphere. Now you've got more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. 
struggling here. I'm just under pressure here because I know they want coffee. More carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, hotter. More carbon dioxide in the ocean, hotter. Can you see where this is going? And the temperature goes up and up and up and up. And then all of a sudden something changes. So what is this deal? What causes this if it wasn't us humans? And see, this is where the humans came along and the temperature stabilized. So something is, something's a bit strange here. Carbon dioxide levels up and down, up and down, up and down until now where they rocketed. It's got to do with Milankovitch cycles. This is a Russian guy. Good Russian. You get good Russians and not so good Russians. Good Russian. He didn't invade anybody. He looked at these cycles and he worked it out and he says, hang on, there are various cycles. It's called eccentricity and tilt and precession that mean that once every 20,000 years or so, the sun comes really close to the earth and warms it up. And then it goes back again. And these cycles are very, very complicated, but essentially what they do is they warm up the planet. The planet leases carbon dioxide. The carbon dioxide goes into the atmosphere. The planet gets warmer. It gets warmer and warmer and warmer and warmer. And all of a sudden, these cycles reverse, and it starts to cool. Now, when it gets warm, ice melts. So all the ice around the poles is starting to melt. And that ice is reflecting energy. It's called a feedback system. So when it stops reflecting, the planet absorbs more, and it gets hotter. Then when it... The, Procession and these things uh, 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 sort of move back to their normal situation and the planet cools down, more ice forms, more sunlight is reflected and it gets colder and colder and colder. So it's a very complicated, what we call a feedback loop. But you can see that for most of the time, in the last half a million years, the temperature was colder than it is now. But there were some interglacial periods, we call them, where the temperature was normal. Now that's the natural system. And we happen to be sitting here where it's been warmer for actually quite a long time, about 15,000 years. It's been warmer. It's been unusually warm. And we're still trying to work out how it fits into these cycles. But one of the things that's happened is that people living on the planet did not have to say, whoa, it's got cold suddenly. We can't, now can't grow anything or we can't eat anything. There's nothing to eat and, and the fish are all frozen in the ocean. We're going to move to the equator. Now, it didn't happen like yesterday or today, but over the centuries, people were moving to warmer places. Now, since the temperature has been more or less stable for the last 20,000 years, what do you think we humans have done? We've said, okay, we don't have to move. We're going nowhere. What are we going to do? Starts with an A or an F. Agriculture, farming. We can plant, we can put trees up, we can grow fruit. We can stay here, we can build a nice house, because the climate's not changing anymore. And that was the start of civilizations. Now, it's got nothing to do with climate change right now, except that we've got large concentrations of people in one area. Okay, and that's called civilization, if you like. So that's what happened. In the last thousand years, what's happened to the temperature? Ah, well, it's kind of gone down. Kind of gone down. And we've got records of the last thousand years from lakes and from tree rings and from pollen samples and all sorts of evidence. It's, it's a fact. No one argues with this. In all of a sardine, around 1900, there was a change and the temperature has gone up. There was a bit of a gap in the 60s. The temperature has gone up and up and up. And everyone got a mursa skruk. Okay, if you don't understand Afrikaans, that means we're all going to die. In 1998, it was the El Nino year and it got really, really hot. And everyone thought, whoo, yes, like, what's happening? This is global warming. Woo! And then 99 got a little bit cooler, and they all thought, ah, no, it's fine. Then 2000, 2001, 2002, 2003, they all started getting hotter and hotter and hotter. And people started to panic. And we looked at the graphs, because that's what scientists do. They look at the facts, and they do the graphs. And they said, oh, well, maybe not. Oh, shit. Oh, sorry. Can't say that. Sorry. Apologies. They just looked at it and said, oh, there's a problem. There's 1998. Oh, look, the temperature's coming down. But actually, ever since then, that's 2006, 2007. It's just been going up and up and up. It's a blue line where it's looking like now. And if you look at the tendencies, which is what we do, because it's maths, remember? Maths magician. We look at the, the tendencies and we see, oh, the increase is, okay, it's about 0.07 degrees per year. And uh-oh, it's increasing. So the temperature is going up and up and up, and this is a problem. If we look at the temperatures, here's 2014, 15, 16, 17. 
Okay, and we've taken out the El Nino years because they are even hotter than normal, natural cycle. We take them out, and we look and we see there's no turning back. We are not getting cooler. It doesn't matter what anybody says. We are not getting cooler. It's a fact. The world's seven warmest years have all occurred since 2014. Do you think in England they're sitting now thinking, oh, this climate change thing is a lot of rubbish? No. Now they're sitting thinking, whoa. But they'll forget again, and I'll explain to you why they'll forget. And, and Liz has mentioned a bit about it. So the bottom line is, and this is almost the end of the science, and I'm going to go and talk about the impacts, and I'm going to rush through this a little. But the question is, is this natural or is it human? How can we prove it? How can we prove it? So we go to the science modelers and we say, guys, you know how the earth works. You know all the relationships between the earth and the atmosphere and the planet and the ice and the water and the animals and the humans and the trucks and the buses and the trains. You, all, you know how it all works. We know how much oil has been burnt. We know how much coal has been burnt. We know how much wood has been chopped down. We, we've got all the stats. So now tell us, if we start in 1900 and we run the models to say how the, the planet should have run to the year 2000, but we say there was no burning of fossil fuels. What would the temperature changes have looked like? So the scientists went and said, okay, we'll take 10 different models from different places, we'll run them from 1900, and we'll see, we call it the evolution of the temperature, and we'll see what happens. And they said, you know, went up and down, came down in the 60s, would have gone up and down, this is volcanoes, it's El Ninos, it's all that sort of stuff. But by 2000, you know what, actually, it was probably about the same as 1900. And the scientists said, <laughs> No, it wasn't. You guys are wrong. Look where the temperature is now. And the mother said, but, but you said we mustn't put any in human-induced human carbon dioxide. And we said, yeah, I put it in now. So they said, okay. Prachtig. You know what that means in Afrikaans? It means we're all going to die. Because look at that. The models say, well, that's where it should be and that's where it is. And this is the proof that it is us. Finger to the moon, three fingers to us. It's ons. We are the problem. So here comes the, uh, the scientific report. Uh, this one referred to it, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change, 2021. Scientists said, this is the latest, this is the latest report. And this is what we're going to tell you. But hang on a second, haven't we heard this before? Yes, because the first report came out in 1990. This climate change thing could be a problem. Oh, and no one did anything. 1995, it's definitely a problem. 2001, guys, we should be doing something. 2007, uh, hello? 2013, listen, we're not making this up, it's real. 2021, hello? Is there anyone there? Governments, are you listening? And nobody's doing anything. Well, we all did something today, didn't we? Even if it's just changing our underwear. Well, not changing our underwear. But are the governments doing enough? Because it's not just going to be enough, as Francois Engelberg says, it's not going to be enough for us to just not drive our cars. It has to be bigger than that. Um, some records that were broken, I'm not going to go through that. Some projections for Africa, it's just going to get hotter. And then when it comes to rainfall, it's unclear. I'll talk about that. But temperature, and these are old projections. They haven't changed. Temperature over South Africa in summer, between 1.4 and 2.1 degrees in winter between 1.8 and 2.4 degrees warmer by mid-century from the year 2000 and we will on our way. Temperatures are going to increase. Days over 40 will increase. Days over 30 will increase. Nighttime temperatures that are going to be cool are going to decrease. Now this town called Brutteville, does anyone know where it is? There's someone, there's two people. What do they grow in Brutteville? Mules. Okay, maize, corn. It's the center of the maize growing region in South Africa. It's so much the center that they have a, a big show there every year called Nampa. And thousands of farmers go there. And they see all the latest tractors and all the nice stuff. So Nampo is in Bortoville, and Bortoville is the center of the maize region. And this graph shows the number of very hot days. The gray bars are how many they have already, over 32 degrees. So in January, they have about 11 very hot days in January. By 2100, 2050, I beg your pardon, we're expecting another 
7 to 11 hot days. So in January, they're going to have about 18 to 20 days where it's too hot for mealies. Because mealies don't like 32. They can do 13, they can do 29, they can even do 32 for one day. Okay, two days. I tell you, my final offer, three days, that's what mealies can do. Three days at 32 degrees. And we're going to get 18 days in January. 30 days have September, April, May, June, July, all the rest of January's got 31 days. 18 out of 31, it's more than half the month, is going to be too hot for mealies. In Bortival, the main mealy capital of South Africa. That's a problem if you're in agriculture. And let's come back to Elgin. How can Elgin slack a coup, cool, eh? I was there yesterday. 500 meters above sea level, 600 meters above rainfalls, 11, 1200 millimeters. Very hot days. At the moment, only two and a half. Increase will be another one to three days. Okay? Now, who's, what's happening in January, February, March in Elgin? Apples are ripening. Grapes are ripening. Too many hot days? It's a problem. A spot on apple? What does a spot on apple mean? Look at the apples in front of you. All the nice ones got eaten. The ones with the spots and the marks, they didn't get eaten. Why is there something wrong with them? I don't know, but you know, that spot, it could mean something. And these sort of temperatures cause all sorts of problems for the fruit farmers. Never mind the fact that in winter, when they need cool, what is it called? Chill units, temperatures are increased. Right, general temperature threats, there's stuff there that you can read. Evaporation, soil moisture, drying out, transpiration, alien vegetation, more damage. Increased number of droughts, we're expecting more droughts. There's a, the Eastern Cape drought that, I, that, that we all know about. Three years there's been a drought there. I'm expecting more of them. This is what the vegetation looked like at the end of 2021. It's a little bit improved now, especially around here where they got some rainfall and also there. But these are issues that we can monitor and we can watch. I'm going to miss out this. I'm going to give this a miss because I'm running out of time. When it comes to rainfall projections, it's very tricky because even the weather forecast can't get it right. What do they always say? There's a 60% chance of rain tomorrow. My Omar to say, sorry, me speak English. My granny always used to say, there's always a 50% chance. It's either going to rain or it's not going to rain. But when they say there's a 60% chance of rain, and you go outside, no, it's not raining here, you don't exactly know what it means. Does it mean 60% of the area is going to have rain, or there's going to be 60% of the average rainfall? Is, or what does it mean? If we use the scientific technology, or this term terminology, it's maths, blame these guys. We use this because it means there's a 60% chance it's going to rain, because there's a 40% chance it's not going to rain. Okay, so sometimes it's just not going to rain, and we'll still be right. We will still be right. And this is what we have to do, because we're never quite sure. But we then separate the models that have said, oh, it's going to be wet, from the models that say, oh, it's going to be dry for the various seasons. We separate them out, and we work out the average, and we try and make some sort of sense. And for winter in the Western Cape, if you look down here, there's going to be between minus 35 millimeters a month rainfall, 35 millimeters a month less, to maybe 10 millimeters a month more. What are the chances? What are you banking on? More rainfall in winter? Ah, ah. which is Afrikaans for, we're all going to die. All right, so let's look at the rainfall in Elgin. Elgin, Elgin, doesn't matter. There's the winter rainfall. Okay, it's nice, lacquer rainfall, 150, 170 millimeters. What do the models say? Well, if it's blue, they say the rainfall is going to increase, and some say it's going to increase. But there's one month where none of the models say it's going to increase, and that's looking at 20 to 30 millimeters less rainfall. Now, in Elgin, if you go to Elgin, oh, there are no crops growing in winter. What do they do in winter? They just collect water, but they collect water. Because they know their crops are going to need the water in summer when the rain doesn't fall. So that's about water and about dams. We'll talk about that in a minute. This just gives an indication of what's happening in South Africa in the last recent years. That's the average rainfall, accumulated rainfall. We've seen a lot of drought years okay, in the last 10 years. And this is the red, shows the average between 2015 and 2017. And the black is the long-term average. And you can see there's less and less rainfall. 
Can't be sure. Now, I could show you some graphs like this. There's a massive study we did for the Western Cape Agriculture called Smart Agri Project, and I could show you graphs like this, but I mean, they are seriously, seriously boring. So let's go to the summary very quickly. What are the latest projections? Temperatures increase. High as two degrees. Changes in daily temperature, minimum temperature, 2.7 degrees more. Increases in temperature, increases in number of hot days. <coughs> we spoke about that. What else? Rainfall, higher uncertainty, as much as 20% reduction in some areas. But they, some zones, especially the West Coast, and a place called Nelspoort, if you're in Nelspoort, there's only one thing you must do. It's quickly turn around so you're not in Nelspoort anymore. No, it's a very important agriculture area. 40% reduction in rainfall. Highest uncertainty. Rainfall reductions are associated with less rainfall per event rather than less events. So we're not actually sure about this because some models are saying we're going to get less rainfall every event and other models are saying actually all your rainfall is going to come in one event. Now in Cape Town we've had the latter. We have a lot of rainfall in one event and fewer rainfall episodes. Increases in dry spell duration. So you see all these facts are there coming out of the projections. PET. You farmers, you know what PET is? What? It's a doggy or a kitty. Oh, they don't get it. It's a pet, eh? Trutal deer. No, it's prevents potential evapotranspiration. It's to do with heat and water. Increasing. Changes in the frequency of drought. Increasing. One in ten drought event now is predicted to be a one in two drought event. In other words, every second year, eventually, we're going to have a drought. This is bad news. Negative impacts. Water problems. So we've got two big questions. I'm going to try and end now because it's almost tea time. Which of my activities that I'm doing are exposed to extreme events and longer climate change impacts? If the frequency and intensity of those events changes, how will I be affected? What can I do? And this is to measure your vulnerability, which is your exposure to an event and how sensitive you are to that event. So if you're planning to grow apples then you've got to make sure that wherever you've bought your little farm and are now going to invest millions in apple trees, that the temperature and the rainfall are going to be all right. Because otherwise you are sensitive to those conditions and you're going to be exposed because the temperature is going up. There are certain thresholds, the variation underneath that threshold you can manage. But now we're seeing the temperatures are getting out of that threshold into what we call the danger or vulnerable zone. And the only way you can respond is by adapting. And that's what the Smart Agri Project tries to do, and you'll hear much more about that. So there's lots of stuff about agriculture, what responses, what are the risks of temperature range reducing, what's the impact on fertilizer, what's the irrigation, crop quality, pests, breeding cycles, water use, challenges to the industry. These are what the agriculture needs to do. First, reduce your carbon footprint, but that's not going to make any difference. It is when a customer in England is going to say, hang on a second, how much carbon do you use? Uh-oh. And that's why farming smart is very, very important. Local research, drought resistance varieties, heat resistance, seed selection, all sorts of experiments we do to do. The stuff that we're doing in the Western Cape is, is world leading. World leading, guys. Not just leading in South Africa. It's right at the forefront. What are other impacts? Natural vegetation, alien invasions, fire, radiation increases, all these things. Thermal and circulation, melting ice, glaciers, whoa, sea level rise, whoa. Well, let's just worry about the Western Cape for the time being. Uh-oh. Water crisis. You all heard of day zero. You all heard of day zero. We know the story with day zero. Uh-oh, what happened here? Yo, 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 yo. Someone's guy washing me. Someone who wants coffee. Don't worry, it's not long to go. You look at me, I look at you. We're all going to die. Okay, so what's the deal with water? I just said, okay, we've got problems. Agriculture needs a lot of water. It wants water. It's water thirsty. But agriculture is food. It's breakfast, lunch, and dinner. That's what agriculture means. 
Okay, day zero is postponed, it's gone. To when? Oh, not sure. Really not sure. This year the rainfall's been lower than last year. Not looking so great for next year either, but we'll deal with that when we get there. How can we bring back more water? Very important. Alien vegetation, this map actually goes backwards. This is what it looks like now. If we start clearing the alien vegetation, we can get massive increases in water into our dam. So we don't have to worry anymore. But are we doing this? Not so much. Because we put at the hydrological cycle. Sorry, not the hydrological cycle, the hydroelogical cycle. What happens? Oh, we have drought. Wait, Machter, whatever's going to happen, we're all going to die. We all drought. Oh, shucks. No, no, no. And then it rains. Oh, that's fantastic. It's all good. Take the bucket out of the shower. Turn on the tap when I'm brushing my teeth. Water the grass. Fill the pool. Have a nice long shower. That's not logical when we don't have enough water. Our dams are not full. This time last year, Tivaris Cliff was overflowing. Now, 76%. How much rain are we going to get this week? Bogor all, which is Afrikaans for? Exactly. Right, then we've got other risks. Wind, seasonal shift. Winds at the ports. Increased wind at the ports. That means you can't get your grapes and your fruit onto the ships. That's a problem. Hail. Fire. I'm just going to go through this. Big, more fires, guys. There are going to be more fires. You saw what happened in Europe. The temperature goes up by two or three or four or five degrees. The whole place burns down. Okay, there was one guy who set it alight, but maybe because the heat affected his head. But more fires. It's easier to burn stuff down when it's hot. All right, then we've got other problems. I don't have time to go into this, and we can talk about this later, but there's melting ice changes in the ice that could lead to increases of 7 to 14 meters if that ice melts. Thermo headline circulation could leave the northern Europe looking like that. But there is good news. And I'm going to end here. We can make a difference. There are some protocols happening. When we go to COP 475 before anyone does anything, maybe there will be some decisions made that actually are meaningful because people are trying. Every year they try a new tack to get people to change their mind. Water consumption can be reduced. We know that. Coping capacities can be increased. There's a thing called rapid readiness. Instead of response, it's readiness. Prepare yourself now before the drought or the flood or whatever comes. Sustainable and regenerative agriculture becoming more and more popular. Even though I was at a conference the other day and they dissed regenerative and sustainable agriculture because they don't understand it exactly. And there must be a meeting of minds but it's becoming more and more popular. And there are people in this room, and they will tell you that if you don't do smart agriculture, climate smart agriculture, what's the word? Conservation agriculture. You'll never grow wheat in this province. Never. So we need to do that. And I'm very happy to say there are people like you sitting here that now are going to take the message of climate change and run with it. Oh, but hang on a second. What happens if it's a big hoax and I'm lying and everyone here is pulling the wool over your eyes? What happens? And we make a better world for nothing. Oh, that's just stupid, isn't it? Thank you very, very much. Thank you very, very much, uh, Peter. Thank you for those uh, insights. I hope you guys learned. And again, it's all about changing perceptions, changing your views. And it's really understanding that without data, you're just another person with an opinion. Uh, so we want you to take the data in. We want you to think about it, reflect upon it. I mean, a lot of things that I took away, I heard about the Malkin, the Milankovitch cycle. I figured out what I'm going to do with my COVID mask. I'm going to find the first cow. And I'm going to put the mask on the cow. So whenever he wants to exhale the methane, at least the mask will help. Um, but it's all about data. It's about describing data. It's using the data to make predictions and then hopefully even prescriptions. It's about understanding that our vulnerability is linked to exposure and sensitivity. Uh, but I think and maybe we'll get to this. It's also the tension between what I think is the developing world and the developed world because we have the developed world dictating to the developing world that you should not become better because your attempts to be better is causing problems even though they are already better. But we'll get into that debate 
at some stage. Thank you for that. We're going to break for coffee. But I'm going to hand over to Francis Stein, who will be the moderator for the session. Uh, please, if you've not yet taken a selfie, remember to take those selfies. And please use the hashtag to make sure that more people know about this event. And obviously, you will share with them as the day progresses. Francis, the floor is yours. Yes, no, thank you very much. Um, I'm going to start with a, with, with a story that sort of, after Lismas said you must have a story, and then you, from a story you could probably remember this. So imagine if we were all sleeping in this hall, and it was night time, and obviously we're sleeping at night, and a big rain event happened up, upstream of this hall, because we're in a wetland. And the water went the height of that white bar. So that means that we would all be floating. And then we'd be scrambling to get onto one of those. Everybody would be scrambling to get onto those air cons and try and stay alive. And in the end, we'd be taken out, I suppose, with the stream. And we'd be taken all the way down until we probably, some of us will catch the station. Maybe we'll catch the roof on the station and be on the station. And this story is very real. It happened in 1981. Put up your hand if you were born before 1981. Thank you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Oh, thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. So you weren't around, but it is in our lifetime that this happened. It happened in the town Lanesburg. Do you know where Lanesburg is? In the Karoo? And it was, there were three catchment areas. Only two of them got rain. And it, it came this high in the houses. It washed everybody out of their houses. A lot of fertilities there. A lot of people landed 15 kilometers away on an island is the first place they could catch. So it's not something that doesn't happen. It's something that's happened. And after that, the farmer said to me, in most of my advice speaking to farmers, you, if you listen to them carefully, you can hear exactly what they're talking about, and you can translate it into what we would call science or something like that. And they said to me, Francis, from 1981 in the Albertinia area, the soil is not as resilient as it's ever been before. They said it in Afrikaans, but it means that they couldn't produce half as much as what they could produce before that rainfall event. And that rainfall event caused massive erosion. And all that soil went down into the rivers and it was taken to the sea and deposited in the sea. So that they had maybe a topsoil of this much, they had half of that left. And that in one rainfall event. So you can imagine how much of this has happened in the last thousand years, as Dr. Johnson uh, said to us. It, it could be many times. What has made it that it's worse? And that's why I've got a panel with us. So you're going to ask the panel, and you must think of the questions that you're going to specifically ask each one of the panel members. So I'm going to ask the panel members to please come up and sit with me over here. Doctor. Uh, as, as Emil the farmer is on his way, has he arrived from Caledonia? No, not yet. Okay, but he's probably on his way, so he could join us. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for coming. Up. Right, so we're going to have a very interactive session. So I'm going to rely a lot on you and your youth to say, I want to ask a question. Have we got a, we've got a, a mic. So we'll take the mic to the person that asked the question and you can ask the question. So I'm going to give each one of them a few minutes just to put forward what they can do and how they're going to address the problems that agriculture has got, which has got plenty of problems with climate change, and how we're going to address those. And they're the experts in the field. So should we start with Dr. Johan Strauss? Will you introduce yourself and give us some nitty-gritty on conservation? 
Thanks, Francis. Hi, everybody. Um, so I work uh, for the for the department, and I do research in conservation agriculture, so cro sustainable cropping systems, all based on rain-fed agriculture. So we don't have irrigation, so we are dependent on what's coming from top. Um, like Peter said, in the, um, the the climate is definitely changing. In the last ten years, we've had a lot of lot more low rainfall uh, years, much more than previously. Usually we had two bad years in 10, and now suddenly in the last four or five years, we've had nearly four. And this year doesn't look promising as well. But what we can say is that through our research, uh, conservation agriculture is a climate smart um, application. We are managing to do more with less water, and we're conserving our soil and building back the biodiversity of the soil, which will all help to mitigate the, the effects of climate change. And then we're also striving towards putting in lower inputs, which also lowers our carbon footprint, um, and that helps for climate change. So any questions later on in, t in terms of that, feel free to ask. Yes. Doc, I, I can't let you get away with that. I, I can't get you. That was just too much in one, one thing. That the one question, the, the one piece that you said there, it says building the soil's fertility, the biological fertility. Can you just explain that a little bit more? Okay. Um, <laughs> let, me, let me do it this way. What we're aiming to do with conservation agriculture is create an environment in the soil where there's space for water to be stored, space where um, the, all the gases, um, the, the carbon dioxide that goes out from respiration and the oxygen that comes in that feeds the roots, we're building, it's like building a block of flats underneath the soil, all right? So if you had to think about a block of flats, there's small rooms like a toilet, it's a small room, a bathroom is a little bit bigger, a sleeping room, a, a, a bedroom a little bit bigger, and then the living room may be the biggest. It's the same thing we're doing underneath the soil, but what we've done in, um, uh, when, when plowing came into being in the, in the industrial age, we plowed everything. We destroyed all these natural systems to produce food. And we've now realized that this is not the way to go. So we're striving to build that, because if we don't build that, Think of if, what's the best way of putting it? Think of it as if you were a microbe. Microorganism that lives in the soil, um, and now me as the farmer comes with a plow across it. What's happening? It is as if you, as a human, are experiencing a fire, a hurricane, a flood, everything at the same time. That's what we're causing in the soil. We're killing all these organisms that is, has the ability to deliver food to a plant that we now actually give out of the bag. So, and that, giving that food out of the bag means it's produced somewhere else. Nitrogen, for example, one of the biggest problems um, in agriculture today is nitrogen. And where does nitrogen come from? It came as a byproduct of the world wars all the um, ammunitions and bombs and etc. they made. This was a byproduct, and suddenly someone saw that a crop was growing out of it, uh, and it looked better than the one next door where the, 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 some of these um, wasn't uh, put into, uh, or was a heap of it. And then they put it into fertilizer to get it in, away from, from, from building up. And, and if you look at how it's made, it is high, high in, in, in carbon emissions. It takes a lot of energy to take nitrogen out of the air and produce it into a form or reduce it into a form where you can put it out of the bag. Um, where we have the ability with choosing the right plants, you can actually put that free nitrogen that's available. And remember, air, the most part of air is, nit is, is free nitrogen. Um, and put that into the soil by an organism, but we've killed all those organisms, so now we have to put it out of the bag. So now the aim is to reverse that whole process, and that helps um, fighting back against climate change. Yeah, thanks, thanks a lot. Thanks a lot, Dr. If you, will, will you take out your books? You've got a book like this in your bag?
And then you take it to page one. Well, that's going to show you now a photograph in that. Can you look at that photograph, page one? You see what it looks like? If you then look at that photograph over there on the soil care, look at that one over there, soil care. Do you see those earthworms in that picture over there? So those earthworms, if you look in this photograph very carefully, you'll see a lot of small little balls. Now those earthworms, that's their casting. And can you imagine if you go and look when it's raining and you go outside at night and you take your torch and you shine it underneath the, where there's litter underneath the plants, you'll see like a blue flash now and again. And that will be an earthworm. And what they eat and what they excrete in their castings is ten times more. And that's what Johan was talking about. He's talking about building the soil biologically with natural items. So there the earthworms are an indicator of absolute fantastic conservation agriculture. They are our friends. And for many years we've ignored them. As Johan said, we come with till and we till the ground and we actually kill them. So that's why it's so important. This book is the soil blanket. If you finish this book, you will know the 101 of soil uh, conservation agriculture. So it's a very important book. You can read it. It's both English, Afrikaans, and Causa. So you can, they'll ask you questions in the one book, uh, in the one chapter, and you have to go and find your answer in Causa or in Afrikaans. Right. So we've talked about conservation agriculture. And I hope you've got some questions on that. Is there any burning questions at the moment? Okay, let's go on to the next one and let's look at our livestock. Dr. Laura Roberts, please give us a, a breakdown on the livestock and how that's going to climate change is going to affect them. Hi, everybody. Thanks for having me. Um, so I'm Laura Roberts. I'm from here at Elsenburg, Department of Agriculture from Veterinary Services. So we are a team of vets and animal health technicians who are responsible for safeguarding animal health in, well, our component is animal health in, in, in the Western Cape. Um, I'm a veterinary epidemiologist, which means I don't treat dogs and cats every day. Um, I don't actually even spend much time on the farms. But what I'm interested in is disease at a population level, um, animal health at a population level, and how that is affected, how it um, changes, and, and what the factors are. So when we get to epidemiology or plant health or human health, whatever it is, I want you to think about a triangle, about three components. At the top, for today's purposes, we'll put the environment, all the environmental factors, the climate, the temperature, the rainfall, the humidity, um, how much water there is, beyond humidity, um, fires, all these things that are changing right now, all these things that are unpredictable, all these things that we are not used to. At the bottom, um, when we're talking about animal health, is the animal and the disease, or the disease agent, or the thing that, that affects their health. And all those things are, are interconnected and linked. Um, as you know, as a person, you are not happy, you're not healthy, unless your environment is suited or you've managed to adapt your environment. If you're too hot, um, you can't think, you can't function. If you're too cold, same thing. You're going to get sick, you're going to get stressed. And when we talk about stress in terms of animals and people, it's down to that basic thing of not being within your comfort zone. So if we're talking about a dairy cow, she's functional within a certain temperature range, certain humidity range, with a certain amount of food. She's optimal producing the right milk um, within a certain set of parameters. And what we're dealing with at the moment is all those parameters changing. Um, to, to stay with the animal, we, we have got space there to adapt and move and, and to deal with climate change. On the one side of it, we need to make sure that we're using animals that are adapted, that we're using, we're breeding the right animals that are suited to that climate, that can function within whatever we're experiencing. On the other side of it, it has been mentioned that our livestock are a massive source of methane. The figures I've seen are 14, 15% of, of the greenhouse gases. 
And there is some evidence at this stage actually that healthy animals emit fewer greenhouse gases, emit less greenhouse gas. There's a specific study that looked at methane coming from sheep with, and comparing their worm burdens. And actually the ones with, that were under less stress had a lower worm burden were emitting less gases. So it seems there's, there's building evidence that if we can keep our animals healthy, um, number one, they might be emitting less gas. Number two, if we can keep our animals efficient, if we can get more out of one animal and the food that we put into them and make sure that, that we can keep our efficiency high, we can hopefully have fewer animals. So that's something we can look at doing. It's obviously our aim when it comes to animal health and production is to make our animals, our individual animals, as effect, efficient as possible. And then just lastly, to finish off, that, that other corner of the triangle is the disease agent. So that ranges anywhere from a toxin, think of floods, think of chemical factories overflowing, um, pathogens such as bacteria and viruses, so they depend very much on, on, we know now from COVID, everybody's thinking a lot more about disease transmission and diseases, but um, if there's a nice, cool, shady spot, and a pathogen is going to survive a lot longer. If it's hot and dry, they're not going to survive as long. So in areas where we're getting a bit more rainfall and the temperatures are going up, you're going to have path some pathogens surviving a little bit longer. And that applies particularly to parasites and a lot there, when we get above the bacteria and virus level, we're thinking about ticks, fleas, worms. A lot of their life cycle is in the environment. And as that environment changes, there's a chance we'll have fewer problems in some areas with, with those disease-causing agents in animals and ourselves. But there also is a lot of evidence now of, of warming, of higher humidity, and diseases moving into areas where they weren't before. So we have to start looking at those factors, really understanding how these pathogens and diseases work in the first place and what the changes are going to, what changes are going to happen. So I think I was already over time, but hopefully you've got a picture of why that's relevant. Thanks. Thanks. Is there any questions for the doctor? I've got, I've got one question. Let's say I've got a farm in Nelspoort. That's uh, the area that's going to be seriously affected by climate change. And my, my sheep are breeding at the moment, and they've got little lambs like this. What do I have to look out for after seven years of drought in that area? What, what, is, the, what is the greatest concern from a disease point of view? On the spot. <laughs> is, is, it, is it too quick for you that time? He's, are you going to think about that when we come back just now? Or we've got to give me give me another two minutes. I think I'll we do that. that. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> right, and then we've got a farmer. So that question was actually for you, Emil, to see. I don't know if you farm with sheep, but you're in the Caledonia area, next to the Berg River, and I presume you don't get more than about 250 millimeters a year. Can you tell us what you're going to do to fight or to manage to farm in climate change, please? Thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm Emil Baron. Uh, I farm there in Hopefield area on the Berg River. Uh, this kind of, the, kind of, can I say, the climate, climate change by us, it doesn't affect you like a lot. Like we don't have a seven year drought or rainfall or something like that. But the amount of water we get is not a lot and the, and the soil is mostly sandy soil and we're doing livestock in that area. So what we do to like save your, save your animals or your, your um, lambs and stuff like that, we will normally bring it into the farm, keep it close, make small, um, uh, how can I say, small uh, hockeys, <laughs> just to keep um, all the lambs together so they can um, stay hot and stuff like that. They don't have to walk that far. Yeah, so that's mostly what we do. But uh, the, the, the best thing probably to do is just like plant, plant enough food for you to like uh, get enough, get enough, um, how can I say, make enough pastures together for your dry seasons. That's actually the main thing what we do. That's uh, like we mostly depend on what we grow on the farm ourselves. We don't buy in food from the uh, corporations or stuff like that. We plant our own um, grains, however, and barley and lupins and stuff like that. Then we make our own loop, um, own mixtures, f food mixtures. And then we will just like, buy in a, 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 a nitrogen block or sugar block 
for the use to eat so they can have enough energy to, uh, how can I say, to, to, ma to make their lamb mature up, up to weaning age or something like that. Yeah, that's mostly what we do. <laughs> yeah, it's, it, it's a very tough area to farm in. Now, how, how's it gone the last few years that there was a drought? Did you, did you, did you manage to survive? Uh, and, and what are your plans going forward? Uh, you said you're going to make food, but what type of crops are you planting and so forth? If you can give us a breakdown. Um, yeah, for, for the past years, we had, a, we had quite a rough season, especially on our sheep. But our cattle is quite, we have, we have oh, oh, let me just say the, the breed we're working with is a uh, Duni Merino on the sheep, and the cattle we have is Bons Maras. The Bons Mara is quite, is quite a rough breed, he's big, but he's strong enough, he can care for, him, care for himself in the field. But in the dry, dry months, like December, January, February month, we will normally put out um, uh, harvest bales or barley, lupin, stuff like that. We'll just put it out, and then, um, yeah, for the pen forward, we're gonna, we, we normally just uh, rely on pastures that we're planting on, but now for the plan forward is to like plant, start planting at 20 hectares of lucerne, so you have enough food during the dry days, especially when the, when the, food, uh, the food quality is not that good. I'm not familiar with this doctor terms and stuff like that. So yeah, when the food quality is not that good, we will then use the lucerne for them to survive on. And like, yeah, and that lucerne will also help you to get a, Get a bit of cash in for your other challenge that you have on the farm. Yeah, we don't go away from you. <laughs> you, had a, you had so many dry years that the river stopped flowing. Yeah, yeah, that's true. And did, did the sea come yeah. up to your farm? Mm. So the sea water came, how many kilometers are you from the sea? Uh, yeah, I'm about, what, say, 37, 45 kilometers up the sea from Fjaldav area. And even in the water from, from back that area up to, up, up to where we are, uh, the water, you can even taste it in the water that even and most of the people over there rely from the Berg River to drink that water and the animals and all of that stuff to drink from that water. So yeah, it's quite far for solo to push up that way. And um, some of us need to still pump water from the river to the animals that's far from the river. And that water is too salt for the animals to drink. And then you're going to have to like sell some of your sheep to make your sheep little and then use from the, uh, the, the fresh water that you have on the farm. So you've got a few fountains and areas. Yeah, yeah. There, is a, there is a few areas, but it's not a lot. It's quite. Mm. It's not so not when the when the sea came up, did you catch any springers or uh, some nice fish? Uh, yeah, the, some of the guys said that he, he like caught in. He lived like uh, like some a kilometer from our farm. He lived there for like 13 years, and in 13 years' time is the first time he he caught the elf. Can on, you believe in, it? In the river. And it doesn't. It's not a freshwater fish. Yeah, that it's not a freshwater fish. fish. Yeah. Oh, but thank you very much. Now you've given us a good practical guide of what's going on. Thank okay. you. Perhaps you, you, must, you must keep it interactive. So if you've got questions, anybody? Yes, you've got a question. Have you got a mic? Just wait until it's green and then it's there. Thank you. That's right. Um, Jou lucerne wat jy gaan plant, of wat jy gaan beplan om te plant, is dit ook deel van uh, iets wat boots doen vir uh, bewaringslandbouw? Um, of is daar specifieke rede, is dit net vervoer, of enige ander rede om dit net lucerne gaan gebruik? Or why, so the question, why? Or they need to be planting the... part of conservation agriculture or if it's just going to be food for the animals going forward? Oh. Um, um, yes, I think it's going gonna, it's gonna to help for conservation, um, conservation also because you, you're going to cover a lot of piece of the land that's, especially by us during summer, summer months or so, it's quite hot by us. It's very hot. Like the, the soil gets very, very hot. So with that 20 hectares, it's going to actually help the soil to just keep cool and yeah, to, and then, but it's mostly for your, it's mostly actually for your, for your, for your livestock. I, I won't go out for like, to sell it, because the people in the far, uh, the Orange River, the farmers around there, they throw a lot of lucerne this way. So you're anyway not going to make a lot of money out of that. Then instead of, you can, you could have just made your um, livestock more and use your, use your lucerne to feed the livestock and then get a cash flow, get a steady cash flow from out, 
from the outside to, to your, towards your business, then you can like expand from there on, maybe plant an, more lucerne or something like that, just so to... Yeah, that, it actually like that, yeah. You, you got no win, win from it. Especially because if you like cut the first, first off and you, and you see how many bales you can make from that, if you have enough bales, you can sell it. Yeah. If not, keep it for your animals, yeah. buy animals in, and make your animals more, then you can, then you can uh, get your income from your animals. Yeah, 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 if I act not out, yeah. either way, if I act. So you've got like a, a fodder flow. Yeah. So you make sure in that excess you can sell, and the rest you keep, you keep there. So you do go to the trials of the Hopefield trials with uh, Dr. Johan? Yeah, not really. Whoa. <laughs> <laughs> and doctor, I think we have to specially send him an invitation this year because it's right next to you and they're doing fantastic. I've never seen so much good results from a sandy soil. I've never, we always had a problem with sandy soils and they've proved completely the contrary. It's, it's looking fantastic. Thank you, Emil. Right, are there any more questions? The yes, there's one at the back there. See if that one will work. That's it. Hi, um, I'm Jody, so I'm from the Western Cape Climate Change Directorate. Um, so I just had a question from a farming perspective. Um, what has been your experience of engaging with the term climate change and even now coming to a climate change and agricultural conference? You know, what, how do you as farmers, your communities, your, your colleagues, your families, how do you guys engage with that term? And especially hearing in, you know, you need to adapt, you need to do these certain things. And you said earlier that, you know, you don't really experience climate change or that badly, or, but often we come with these terms and you need to do this, et cetera, et cetera. So how, what has been your engagement sort of or interpretation of climate change at a, at a farmer level? Okay, now would you like to answer you? Uh, yeah, what, what can I, uh, what we do, how do we engage it? We as farmers, like, it will be better, like, if we, if we come together, just talk to each other, maybe he has a plan that he's doing on the farm. Especially when you check at your lambs, when your lambs start to, to, uh, uh, to be born, eh? Lambs is small, especially if you have that time in the, in the year, you have a lambing season, when it's too cold or it's too hot. When it's too cold, like I said, you bring it, we bring in our sheep, we bring our sheep in, bring it to the farm, bring it close to you, we can keep a sharp, sharp eye on it. If it's too cold for, that, for, the, for the lambs in that time, we just throw, throw straw, put a netting around your, 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 um, your, your lambing um, hockeys or something like that. And then in the summer season, we, we normally like, in the summer season, then it's again hot. Now you want to like, there's, there's this, uh, you get this uh, a disease in, 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 in cattle. I don't know what it's called in English, but it, we call it in, in um, Afrikaans, a knopfial sikta. It's like this fly thingy that bites the, the animals and then it, it's there's sm uh, small dots on it, like a, almost like a, 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 a mosquito bait or something, and then it falls in. But what we do is, we have a big space, a big space. Then we just bring our, our cattle closer to the farm, put it in the burg river, because there's a lot of trees and stuff like that. We just need shade and that helps them for that. So the best thing we do would be to, is just to, to brainstorm with other people. Call around, ask your neighboring farmers what to do. You have a problem like this, don't be just, just don't be shy to ask. That's the only thing I can say. That's what I do. That's how I work. Yeah. No, thank you. No. That gives you an idea, and uh, you, you, you gave it away there. A lot of the farmers learn from one another. So a lot of Dr. Johan's uh, farmer's days, you've got green tours and brown tours, and it's farmers speaking. And the scientists are there, and they're backing the, 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 uh, you know, the science up, or the facts that the farmers are giving, they're backing it up. So that's... It's a very good learning curve. It's a lovely, uh, you're all welcome to come to one of these Farmer's Days. We'll make it available. It's on our website. And you can actually learn so much just by listening to the farmers like we've listening to him today. But uh, Leslie from the Disaster Risk uh, Reduction Unit has also something to say on that question of yours. Yeah, Jody, morning everybody. Uh, the name is Leslie Martinez and I work for disaster risk reduction within the Department of Agriculture. 
Jody, the, the strange thing is that, you know what, my initial introduction to climate change many, many years ago, and, and I suppose the people in front here, and I think maybe that table there, do you guys know a guy called Al Gore? All right, I, maybe some of you are still a bit too young for that guy. Now, initially the whole discussion around climate change was always about, is it real? You know, that was the discussion. And so we spent hours and hours debating this thing of, no, it's not real, and it's a hoax, and it's just there for whatever. And because we work in disaster risk reduction, a lot of our work was now post-disaster. You know, it was, it was always being reactive. And then uh, through Dr. Ilse Tartman and, and Professor Midgley and, and our boss, um, Asha Peterson, there was this thing of, let's see if we can bring climate change you know, into our risk assessments when we engage with farmers. Because we go out and we talk to farmers about, you know, how's the farming, how's the drought going, and how's the flood, et cetera, et cetera. And initially I thought, gee, I had some reservations in terms of when we're going to get to these farmers and now we're going to start talking about climate change. These guys are going to go into a long discussion about it's not real and your government are making up things. And I was pleasantly surprised. Um, Stephanie came on our, our first... Uh, engagement, when was that 2021, I think? Last year. And we said to Stephen, okay, you're only getting a 30 minute slot. You know, 30 minutes then went to 45 minutes, went to an hour. And now suddenly we're realizing that farmers are now actually wanting to engage more on climate change. And so now we having to, you know, fight back a little bit with Stephen and say, look, you can't take over our whole engagement now. And we are finding that the science that Stephanie is talking about when she does the presentations, the farmers are actually saying, but that's what we've been experiencing for many years. You know, when they talk about, you know, what, the climate is changing, the kinds of crops that you are now planting. Um, one of our farmers was saying that in one area they couldn't grow a particular fruit for forever. Now suddenly the climate allows them to grow that particular fruit. So, Jody, just to answer you, the engagement has been pleasantly surprising for us. And now the farmers are even saying, look, Stephanie, please come back. They're not inviting us back. That's giving them the money. They're saying, Stephanie, please come back to Farmers Days. We want you to have a bigger engagement uh, as far as that is concerned. And I think we had the same thing there by you, Rudolf, um, with that. Leslie, thank you. No, uh, he's saying that he's not invited back, but it's, that's very untrue. Because in the last few years, the Department of Agriculture has spent over 100 million rand in looking at rivers, especially, to try and protect agricultural land, to try and protect the rivers and bring them back to what they are, what they were beforehand. Because a lot of them have been completely infested with alien plants. And if you look on that picture over there, you'll see they're building structures. We've built some of the biggest structures. There's no structures anywhere in South Africa that has done more for agriculture and protecting the river systems against flooding and replanting them into natural states than disaster risk reduction together with the land care program. And therefore, there's your introduction now, Leslie. You can come and give us a, a, a tour if you can, you'll have to stand up. But they can, then they can see how how handsome you are, and then you just give them a talk on, on what you're doing for climate change. Okay. Thank you. Morning, everybody, again. Um, I'm just going to say protocols observed. Um, okay, I need to get this figure right, because I know a lot of our politicians tend to get these long numbers wrong. Okay, 418 million, 169,683 rand and 52 cents. Okay, did I, did I get the right? Thank you. All right, look, that's since 2020, that's the amount of money that we are investing in project, and that's besides the river protection works that, that Francis was alluding to there. Right now, a lot of that money goes into drought. Now, in terms of disaster risk reduction, if you look at Western Cape government, government about 13 departments, or sector departments, provincial departments, out of that 13, there are only two departments that have actually got dedicated disaster risk reduction units. Uh, that is agriculture, and then we've got local government with the um, Provincial Disaster Management Center. So we are extremely, extremely serious about disaster risk reduction. Before we used to be disaster risk management, um, now we've changed the focus a little bit because then it was mostly reactive. 
if, if we talk about your active, we look at the drought. Now, our speaker, is it, is it Mr. Johnson, Johnston? I'm not sure. No. I, Dr. Johnston um, spoke about, you know, farmers, are, you know, there's a drought, but, you know, tomorrow it's going to rain. You know, there's a drought for a year or two. And our engagement with farmers now, now, let me just take a step back. Francis, you may just tell me when my time is up, eh? Right. Let me just take a step back. Often when you work in government, you sit in your, okay, when you sit in your office, you work a lot with stats. So farmers phone you, and the first thing you know is, what is your reference number? Okay, we've helped you with this amount and that amount. And sometimes you lose sight of the actual impact that climate change is actually having on families. And so when we go out and we engage with these farmers, all right, and now you know when you go to a farm, it's not like the city, I grew up in the city. When you go and visit a farmer, they want you to come in, their wives, they cook a big lunch for you, whether you're 10 people, 12 people, 15 people, you have to sit there, and you actually have to Kair, what's the Afrikaans word, English word for Kair? Kair, okay. <laughs> you actually have to Kair. You have to sit there. And you know when you see a grown man sit and cry. Okay, I mustn't cry now. Okay, because I'm a chief in the Changhat. Okay. When you see grown men cry, because they tell you, you know, Leslie, we can handle a drought. All farmers can handle droughts. They can handle all of these things a year or two. In some of these areas, the drought has been going on for eight to nine years. And you see these people sit there and they cry about the fact that their families are suffering, their workers, they have to lay off. Now, when you will talk to stock farmers or livestock farmers, they've got two or three people that they have to lay off. When you look at in, in the fruit industry and those guys, the seasonal workers, we're talking about one farmer having to tell 85 workers, don't come back. Those 85 workers each support four or five people. So you, you see the kind of impact that climate change has on actual agriculture. And then it becomes a totally different story when we do the work that we do because we understand the impact that we have on actual farmers out there. And it's always nice buzzwords, you know, a food security and all of those kinds of things. But when you sit in a man's lounge and you see him weep because say animals frack, I don't know what's the nice English word for frack, you know, they die, you know, they have to see it, um, and that becomes heartbreaking. So really again, just to let you on with Jody, the farmers know that climate change is a reality. You know, remember when we talk about disasters, I gave you that amount, 418 million rand and change. In the last four months, just on drought to support farmers, they are still caught up in the drought. Right? We've spent, what, 55 million, 978,000 rand in the last four months, 55 million rand. So again, we know that that's not sustainable. So we're looking at other ways of engaging with our farmers to change the way they farm, you know, to plant differently, right? to use water differently. There's the technology and all of those things. And that's why the disaster risk reduction tries to bring all of those things together. So please feel free to engage with me at a later stage if there's any more questions. Thank you. Oh, thanks, Lee. Thank you very much. We'll give him a, a round. Yeah. Are there any uh, questions for Leslie at this stage? Yes, we've got two here. Yeah? Thank you, Doctor. One, two, one, two. Ah, there we go. Okay. Um, hello, I'm Sunay. Um, so I want to preface this by saying um, I do have a bit of a bias. I work in the in Beaufort West, um, so I'm from the Karoo. So I don't know if this falls a bit out of outside of the scope of what we are talking about today, but it is still part of the Western Cape. Um, and I I just want to know how the, this disaster uh, risk reduction that you're talking about how is it implemented practically? And I'm talking specifically about the Karoo, central Karoo area now, um, because how, in a, very, in a practical and specific way, and I'm not trying asking this to be combative, but how are we able to help farmers, you know, in a drought situation, um, you know, who have to, you know, sell livestock and that kind of thing to, to maintain their felt? And, um, you know, how do we help farmers to rebuild their felt? Because that's what a Karoo farmer does. They work mostly on natural felt. Um, so yeah, that, that's basically, um, it's nice to hear we spend so many millions, but, you know, money 
can you know evaporate? Um, what are we practically pra practically able to do to help um, these people? Okay, sure. yeah. okay. thanks, Sine. Um, let me just off the bat say we want you to be combative. All right. Um, we want you to ask the questions. Now, if we look at the central crew, if I look at the farmers there, we're supporting the entire central crew in just in terms of drought support. Now, again, uh, that is reactive. Um, all right. So there's about 611 farmers that we're supporting there for the last three months, eight million rand a month. All right. Now, we can say to the farmer on the one hand, look, you've got your your felt needs to recover. There's nothing growing there in the central crew. I just come from Prince Albert this morning. All right. So we can say to them, don't let your sheep graze on the felt. Let the felt rest. Let the felt recover. But what do they do in the meantime? How do they support? How do they feed the sheep in the meantime? And so that's where that money comes in. So it's not about us wanting just to throw money. So that's the one side. We've got to look at the short term. Okay, While we're then feeding those or giving the farmers money, supporting them to feed the sheep, we are engaging with them to say, okay, right, that's why we bring Stephanie along. We look at, all right, you know what, what the gewasser, what's, what's gewasser? Well, what type of crops, you know, can we actually plant that is more drought resistant, right? So we're engaging with them in that level. What type of sheep or livestock should we use that is also more drought resistant? So there is this other side of engagement as well. We also want the felt to recover, so we talk about, you know, fencing of certain areas so that the animals don't come in and the sheep just go about grazing anywhere. So there is engagement on that level as well. Um, but again, I, I need to say to you to Sunay and to everybody else, it's not a process that's going to happen over six months. All right? When sometimes the thinking has to change as well uh, with a lot of the farmers that we have to deal with. So we are engaging with them uh, on a very, very regular basis in terms of the Karoo. Yes, uh, thanks a lot, Leslie. Uh, as well as that, we're looking at a proactive way. We're doing it in the Beaufort West area and the Cope area. And uh, we finished in the Cope 4 area. We've got a, a big area, what we call area-wide planning, where we take about 80,000 hectares. And those farmers set up a management plan for that area, not as one farm, but within that entire area. And that management plan normally goes at looking at how they can survive in that area. So the oldest one is uh, Cope 4 at Lanesburg, and they've already got study groups that are looking at drying of fruit and other uh, crops that they could irrigate, and it's completely a farmer-led initiative. So it's a community-based initiative. And uh, the one at Merveville and at Beaufort West at the moment, we're supporting with fencing. So we're doing border fencing around the area which enables them to farm and that their livestock is a bit safer. Well, we've, we've seen they had damages of 40% due to predation. And after the fence, they've just about got less than 5%. So there are proactive plans. We're very proud of those plans to do that. There was another question over here. Um, um, good day, everyone. I am Abungile. I'm an agronomy lecturer with the college. I'm also a young professional person. Um, thank you, Sune. That was part of my questions that I had. Uh, but the second question that I have, it goes with everyone in the panel. So what we are getting or what we are, um, are learning from you guys is the more reactive you stopped with the reactive way of doing things, you are being proactive. But now it comes to a, a point where, when are we going to stop to react to things that we don't know? Say for instance, um, in the systems and the activities that you plan, um, is there sustainability? Because um, in agriculture now we speak of the sustainability of the activities that we do to ensure that in the production that we have, it's going to be sustainable not only for now, but also for future generations, right? So we have also learned from the likes of the research of researchers like uh, Dr. 
uh, the doctors that are here on the panel that it's always good to do sustainability in the practices that we do, seeing all the changes that are happening. So with climate change as well, is there any sustainable measures that you guys are looking at or sustainable measures that are already there that we just need to either, I as an agronomy lecture, to um, help my students understand or as an extension officer, help the farmer understand or as someone in industry, help everyone to understand. So thank you. Yes, no, thank you. I think that's a very broad question and most of the panels will be able to answer them. I'm going to give them a chance just now to answer that. The one that we were speaking about specifically in the first question was drought and there's a fantastic, uh, uh, you say, booklet on drought that's been built up for people that have had more than 50 years experience with drought to tell the farmers exactly at what stage they are. And the University of Cape Town has also got uh, quite a few studies that they've done on drought. They can actually determine when a drought in fact has happened due to the rainfall amount and then they can say when the drought is broken. So there's a whole lot of actions that the department's doing and as the, I'm going to ask some of the panelists if they want to answer that as well. But conservation agriculture from a dry land perspective is definitely part of uh, that proactive plan. And I don't know if you wanted to say any more on that, Johan? Um, in terms of conservation agriculture, it's all about sustainability. Um, we've realized at the time that, remember before 1994, um, and uh, after 94, we, we became a free market economy. Um, farmers used to plant wheat on every piece of land that we had and owned. They were guaranteed a certain price via the wheat board. And as soon as we became free market, those types of fields were not supposed to be planted. It was not sustainable to do it. You were breaking it down. And, and so we, we cut back from nearly half of the amount of area that we planted to wheat in the Western Cape. And still we're not producing less. Um, but that is part of what conservation agri agriculture does. It enables you to do better on the, on the soils that you can do and help build the soils that are poor um, to, to, sorry, to be more sustainable. Um, but I don't really like the word sustainable. Um, because if you think about sustaining something, it's meaning it stays the same. We, we, I know a lot of people are talking about regenerative agriculture and there's, there's no real definition, proper definition for it. Um, but we're aiming through conservation agriculture to build, to trying to lift it up. Um, a good measure for a farmer to, to look at is the carbon levels in his soil. Uh, anything he does to improve on, on, on what he's doing and what is happening in the soil. Um, we, we've been doing it in the Western Cape with, a, with a wheat and barley and canola and all those types of rotation systems where you have all these dryland crops. Um, we've brought in cover crops to help improve biodiversity and help build soil even better and more sustainable. And now it is also happening in other um, commodities, the fruit, the wines. They're also looking at cover crops and the really realizing the benefits of keeping the soil covered. Uh, an anecdote um, that I might share with you is like plowing the soil um, is like a naked woman on the beach. It's very lovely to look at, but it's not correct to do it. Um, and uh, in, interestingly enough, um, it goes back to, to a farmer's passion um, and to see what he wants to see change. And, uh, and it's a mindset. The whole thing with conservation, agriculture, and with everything that all of us are doing, if the person you are con um, conversing with and, and trying to show him a better way of doing it, if he does not want to change or change his mindset, you can jump up and down, do cartwheels, uh, not that I can do that anymore, but um, if he doesn't want to change his mind, you, you, it doesn't help, you, you just need to walk away. Um, maybe someone else will, will, or further down the line, he, he will change his mind, but it needs to be a change of mind. And what a lot of people don't understand about um, sustainability and improving sustainability, it is not an overnight thing. 
Conservation agriculture takes our, our longest trial has been running since 1996. We're now seeing the benefit of what we started 27 years ago. Under drought conditions, the first drought we had, um, I'm sorry, I'm taking time now, but just to give you an idea, the first drought we had was in 2003, after the trial started in 1996. That year, we didn't harvest any wheat on the trial site. And there's eight different systems that we're testing with wheat, canola, uh, pastures. The only wheat we managed to harvest in 2003 was um, wheat following the previous years in 2002's medic pasture. Rain came late and that little bit of residue that was there at that stage helped to, to germinate the wheat and we could actually harvest. The average yield was 500 kilograms for the whole trial. All right, 2004, a little bit better, but just to, to put you back in the picture as well, we started the trial with minimum tillage, so we just scratched the soil a little bit before we planted, and then from 2002 onwards, we planted no till. So only putting the seed in the soil, that's the only disturbance. So that was the first year, basically, after starting full conservation, the full, full conservation agriculture package. All right, 2004, rain a little bit better. We've been, managed to harvest basically everything. The yields were a little better, just over a ton. Then it became better rainfall, and then in 2015, we had our next drought. And then again in 2017. The difference was, in both those years, we received less rain than we did in 2003. In 2015, we managed 2.1 tons of wheat on average across the whole trial, and in 2017, 2.4 tons. So you see what the system is doing, but it takes time to get there. And if you don't make that mind shift, you're never going to be sustainable at the end. All right. So keep that in mind. When you, when you guys go out and talk to someone, it's not going to be happening like that. We need to, to, firstly, to firstly change our mind and make sure that we, 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 we understand what we are doing. And then from there, take the time and build, build, build over time. Okay. Yeah, no, thank, thanks a lot. Johan, that's a very important point. And I want to explain something now that you, that you understand what is soil life in the soil. So if you take a handful of soil and you put it in the plastic bag and you close the top of the plastic bag, now there's no air coming in. And then you put a litmus paper in the bag and you see how much carbon dioxide is, ex is ex exhaled by the fungi and the bacteria in the bag then you can determine how much life is in the bag. If you took a plastic bag and you put it over your head and you tied a knot, that's the same as what you're doing with the soil. So do you understand when you say the soil is a living entity that fungi and bacteria uses oxygen and it exhales carbon dioxide just like me and you? It's life. If you've got a handful of that soil, that one with earthworms on it, and you counted the fungi and the bacteria in your hand, it's more, there's more fungi and bacteria in a healthy soil than the people that live on earth. And that's that, that I wanted to tell you. That's the proactive part. That's what Johannes is talking about. Beforehand, that soil was completely degraded. It didn't have any biological life. And now we've built it, and we've started feeding the fungi and the bacteria. And that soil is actually raised. It's actually got thicker, and it's got more pores in it. And it can take rainfall much better, and it's got a better cover. And it's, as you could say, it's not only sustainable, it's now increasing. So it'll go past the natural felt, and we're getting what they call in Afrikaans, lanbo. So you're building the resource. Right. But we've got a few more panel members, and if we don't let them talk, you know, I'm going to get into big trouble. So I'll tell you something. Can you imagine that we can take all the alien plants that we've got in the Western Cape, and we can chip those, those plants, and we can replace coal 
that is a very dirty energy source. With that, I want to introduce Rudolf Rocha and let it tell us more about this program of ours. Thank you, Francis. Um, I'm so glad for this session, and I'm so happy that you're all back. Up till this morning session, the takeaway message was, we're all going to die. So <laughs> just stay with us. <laughs> um, for me, Francis, I'm sorry, I just want to do this because it will give us an idea who we're talking to. So we're introducing ourselves, but we don't really have an idea who you are. So I'd just like to ask, just put up your hand, who's active students at the moment? Just students. Okay, not just students, students. All right, students. Right, then interns and young professionals that's now finished their studies, but they had a job, a, a few of them. So there's more. Okay, all right. And then just the last question, who of you are actively involved with agriculture in your work or, or over a weekend? All right, that's about a third of the group. It gives you a good idea. Okay. So, um, my name is Rudolf Rocha. I'm very privileged to work with the Department of Agriculture and uh, for the Western Cape government. And um, there's uh, all of these pictures that you see around in the hall. Have a good look at them. That's pictures of my office. And that's where I work. And I'm very fortunate to tell you that um, I've been working with the department for many, many years. And um, more fortunate as a person that's very much involved in an engineering background and project background, but also extension work with farmers on climate change issues. I've been privileged to stay in the same area for the past 24 years. So I've seen things happening and how things are changing in our landscapes over time. Being actively involved in agriculture, I know I look much younger than I am. I know. It's been 24 years. So, um, from our side, what we do is we go out to farms and we work in the rural landscape. Somebody asked the question earlier, but you know, we've got all these plans and how does the implementation happen? Now, I want to tell you when you watch that seven o'clock news at night and you see we have all these fantastic plans in our country and laws and everything, but how is it being implemented? Now, I want to tell you the program that I'm working for, uh, Sustainable Resource Use and Management, and the sub-program specifically is Landcare. The buck stops with us. So basically, we take all of the information that's so available from all these research that has been done, uh, all the strategies and all the plans, and we convert that into action plans, and we implement it with the farmers in the landscape. So that's what we do. So it's a fantastic job to have. We basically go out to the farms. We talk to farms in groups. Um, we're looking after the natural resource. So we talk to the resource owners. And we go out and we ask them basic questions. And it's all part of a bigger area plan. What is your natural resource needs or risks in your area? Um, in that group, we workshop the ideas that's coming forth. And we work with the information that we get. And then we write plans for them to implement. And we source funding. Now, to do that, we can't do it alone as a government officials only. So we involve a lot of different parties. So part of my job as well is to facilitate groups or get networks uh, um, in the rural landscape. And um, we've got some amazing network platforms that's been created. And there beside me is not only the Department of Agriculture and their technical person, but also the municipalities, the district municipalities, their officials. We've got people from water affairs, uh, catchment management associations, irrigation boards. Um, the farmers, are, they have representation there. And um, during those sessions, we collaborate and we uh, create a vision for a catchment and how do we want to see this river system or this count, uh, uh, mountain catchment in the next 20 years from now. And out of that comes projects. And uh, a lot of the projects that we're involved with has already been mentioned, like the um, construction of erosion structures in our river systems to prevent flooding happening. Um, we've got that felt care picture there of the fencing that's happening in the Karoo, um, the soil care, erosion structures that we're involved in, like I said. And um, also then what Francis alluded to is uh, job creation projects. So we go out with the specific aim and we've got this need then to create projects that will um, or write up projects that will create jobs. So uh, one of them, and one of the main uh, risks that farmers are indicating to us these days, 
especially in the Cape Wineman's district area that I am, but all over the province, is uh, the uh, invasive alien plants and the risk that they pose. Not only invasive alien plants with regards to the uses of water, but also the risk of fires to the farms, etc. And flooding risks, because most of them are on our river systems, and they, uh, uh, one, once the flood comes down, they block the river, and then there's a lot of damage. In um, 2008, we had a three-day cut of low hanging in the mountains, and over three days, the rain was falling. And after that three days, now listen to this figure, 900 million rands of verified damage to agriculture infrastructure. 900 million rand in three days of damage. And most of the damage was because of invasive aliens blocking our river systems or incorrect land use practices next to our river systems, etc. So those are the things that we try to solve. So yes, um, also in our communication with farmers, uh, definitely farmers are telling us over the past 30 years that there's a change in weather patterns, uh, frost coming at different times of the year, wind starting to come up, not in August anymore, but now in September, October, when there's fruit um, on the trees uh, causing the damages to them. Um, there's longer drier spells that increases the fire risks there's more intense rain that's happening over a very shorter period. So that's information coming from the farmers on the ground to us. And, and yes, so it's real. Things are happening um, out there. And it's, there's definitely changes that's happening. Um, but also, I want to encourage you by saying there's a lot of opportunity. So what do we have? We've got a challenge. So in challenges, there's a lot of opportunity. Um, and for you as young people, young professions that uh, are starting your, your career at the moment, you must look for these opportunities because when there's challenges with opportunities, there's also a market. And I can tell you now, there's a, one of the biggest things for starting your own business is to, have a, to get your target market and make sure that there's a market for the product or knowledge that you want to sell. Now, in the agricultural business, which is a fantastic uh, industry to be in, there's this market of knowledge that required and implementation to address these issues out there. For instance, we're working with researchers in monitoring um, water quality and quantity in our river systems. Um, we are looking at boreal monitoring with the farmers to see what is their groundwater usage and how does it change with weather patterns, putting up weather stations. Um, um, over and above all these projects that we implement uh, with these farmers. So there's also opportunity in this challenging times that we are in, and that's what you have to look out for, because the market is there for you to use. Um, I don't know, Francis, if you want me to elaborate more, but um, that's yeah. just a general feedback. No, I think you, we can't let you go. You, you have to tell us a story about converting the aliens into oh, energy. Yes. That one you forgot. Yeah, so basically one of the first things that we started with the farmers in the beginning, and you're talking about, uh, you asked about sustainability, <clears throat> and the incredible important thing for us as government, we don't want to invest in something where we're going to waste the taxpayers' money. And for that, we require skin in the game by each and every landowner. They have to financially contribute to uh, the implementation of the work. It's, it's, it's not a, just a giveaway of funding. So the farmers have skin in the game, they financially contribute, and because of this methodology that we used and feet on the ground with good extension over a period of 10 to 15 years, because these things take time, um, we've changed a culture where farmers are looking at a river system as something that's not part of his agricultural land, so he's not earning an income from it, and it's just the river that's out there that's infested with invasive aliens, that's eroding, etc., uh, etc. Et uh, we got to a point now, after 12 to 15 years, um, employing, hmm, in this first quarter, the past three months, we've employed, in, only in my district alone, 200 uh, people doing invasive alien clearings with the farmer. Um, and they've been working very hard, and they've been clearing these trees from these river systems. 15 years later, um, a 76 kilometers of river stretch, and I stay in Worcester, so if you drive on the N1, next time from Cape Town to Worcester, when you're on that bridge on the N1 crossing the Breda River, look upstream, that's on your left, and you will see a river system 76 kilometers long, 105 farmers actively participating wall to wall, clearing the invasive aliens uh, in, the, in the river. But not only that, 
these trees that you see here is from our Lanke nursery. We're planting almost 150,000 trees for the past six years back into our river systems as part of what we do. Now, the clearing of the invasives was initially to start with clearing the stuff, getting the biomass out of the river systems. But the biomass is so much, and it's energy that we're having in our rivers. How can we use this energy? And one of the industries that developed out of that was the creating of energy. So after the cutting has been happening and the biomass is there on the river system itself, some of these contractors, it would be wood contractors, local teams coming in, in arrangement with the farmers, uh, and then collect the wood to sell it as firewood. So it's small, medium enterprises. They will move in first after us. After that, we've got a, a, a SMME coming in with a chipper, chipping the whatever is left. And uh, now the new movement is, and the, the plant is there. And I've actually spoken to Professor Mitchley earlier this morning to, to see all you young, amazing people here. After this conference, what we should do is go out into the river with us, and you come and have a look at what we do and how the people are working and what they're doing in the area, in the landscape. But they, the, 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 the plant is in, in Worcester and they're converting these chips from eucalyptus trees into energy and basically using those compacted wood chips to burn in boilers and burners and to create steam or uh, for the use of uh, alternative use of energy and there's a, um, uh, a chicken uh, hatchery that is using not coal energy anymore but using these chips in the industry that's converting that into heat into that uh, chicken hatchery in Worcester, and it's um, just taking off now at speed. Um, so that's amazing that this new technology is also being used for clearing invasive aliens and putting them to good use. In fact, we should start looking at um, areas to plant again. <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, we're not going to plant again. We'll probably, uh, we'll just reuse those. And we've got so many aliens. Thank you very much, Rudolf. That was uh, fantastic. Let's give him a round there, chaps. You know, sometimes you need a story to tell to understand something, because from that you can see. So what he said is, if you take Nekis, uh, if you take the Wittbruch at Ceres, you know where the Wittbruch is in Ceres? It's about uh, 15 kilometers from Ceres on the Breda River. For 75 kilometers, you go down the river and it's been cleaned. But it's got a very big difference in being cleaned from alien plants. It was cleaned with the farmers. Day one, they signed on the dotted line. They gave their commitment they're going to look after this. Once this gain has been, they're going to maintain it. And they've maintained it to today. And that river ends in a wetland of 750 hectares. That wetland has also been put into a nature reserve, nature uh, with, conservation, uh, with Cape Nature so that they're not going to utilize that for cultivation because it is a wetland. So can you imagine that wetland of 750 hectares is about the third of the size of the Berg River Dam, the new Berg River Dam. And in winter it fills up and then slowly it drains out in summer and makes that water available after it's cleaned that water which is an incredible cost that we've got to clean water so that we can drink it. It cleans that water that you can actually drink it, and it sends it down the river for the farmers. If you take the amount of water that falls in the catchment area, it's a few times more that's in the Berg River. And all that has been done just by preserving that wetland. So it's a very good, important story to remember that that is actually what has happened over there and it's been maintained. But how are we going to make it that it's economically viable? So then we're starting to think of stuff like payment of ecosystem services. So if you're in Worcester in town, you're probably going to have to pay another few cents per litre water that you're using so that that wetland is maintained like that forever. So we're getting there. It's quite hard to knock on some of those doors, but we're knocking the whole time and we're going to get there. That's the one thing Rudolf said. The second thing is for, for every single person that, that's employed in the Department of Agriculture, we've given for the last two years a work opportunity. So each one of us is one person we've given a work opportunity outside there. So we've, we've created more 
than a thousand work opportunities out in the space from the Department of Agriculture. And we're quite proud of that, and we would like to increase that as much as we can with all our partners. But to round off this session, the, the expert on smart agri is Professor Stefani, and I want to ask her to come and highlight our changes, what we're going to do. Thank you, Professor. Yes, hello everybody. All right, so my job is to now show you how, you know, you've heard what is already being done on the farms, in the systems, the river systems, the soil. There's so much excellent implementation of climate smart agriculture already happening. Um, farmers by nature have to constantly adapt to the climate, to the, to the changing conditions on their farms, and they do so all the time. Um, and some of the projects that we've heard about today go back decades, conservation agriculture, clear, clearing of aliens, it's nothing new. These, these um, efforts have been going on for, for a while and we know that they are climate smart. But now how do we bring all of this together? And we can't leave it all to the farmers. We can't just let them adapt and, and do what they can to survive. We can't just leave it to individual programs to just keep going and think they're doing the right thing. We have to bring all of this together and do proper planning. Uh, and this is where government comes in. And government has a responsibility to plan, uh, to make policies and strategies, to make sure that those are resourced, um, and then to monitor those policies and strategies, to make sure that what everybody is doing makes sense, it fits together, it's coordinated. Um, we make sure that we monitor what the benefits are of what is happening, that our taxpayers' money is well spent. Um, where are the gaps? Are there things that we aren't doing that we need to start doing? And this is where planning comes in. Um, South Africa has very good climate change policy framework. Um, we have, I'm not going to go through them all now, but from national level, um, you know, we have many, many climate change uh, plans and strategies now. Um, the one that's currently with Parliament is the Climate Change Act, uh, or it will be an act uh, very soon. So there's a lot happening at that level. There's also a lot happening um, at provincial level. Um, and so the Western Cape was actually the first, and is still the only province in the country that has a specific sectoral climate change response strategy. Um, and going back at least 10, 15 years already, uh, the Department of Agriculture started seeing that agriculture and farmers were already seeing the impacts of climate change. And it was clear from the science that was coming out globally um, that this was going to be a very big challenge. It wasn't going to go away. It needed proper planning, forward thinking. And so Dr. Ilse Trotman and a few other people uh, in the department decided that uh, the, the department needed a proper uh, strategy. So in 2013, this was um, started. Um, and then over a 20 month period from 2014 to 2016, um, there was a lot of engagement across the sector. So not just within government, but with farmers, with extension people, with ecologists, with uh, water resource managers. Um, and it was across the whole province. Um, and for specific commodities, so livestock farmers, crop farmers, fruit farmers. Um, and this plan was put together. Um, the long name for it is the Climate Change Response Framework and Implementation Plan for Agriculture for the Western Cape. And you would have heard the short version of it, we call it the Smart Agri Plan. It was finished in 2016, and I was lucky to be involved in that. Uh, after that, it, uh, implementation started. Uh, so for a number of years it was implemented, and Dr. Ilse Trotman led that, that effort. The Kukstag program was part of that effort to um, inform people in the sector about it, to make sure that people become aware um, of what, what, what the strategy is about and also what the issues are um, in the sector. And, but since then, it, it's clear that we need a much bigger rollout, a much deeper implementation of the plan, um, and so that's what we're busy with right now. We want to make sure that every single farmer and every person working in the sector and young people coming into the sector understand what this challenge is about and what we are planning. So the strategy itself, um, it, you're very welcome to go and have a look at it. For those of you who haven't seen it, um, we'll, we can show you where, where to find that quite easily. Um, and basically it's four areas, and the one is very much around what happens on the farm, so what the farmers are doing in terms of looking after their soil, um, using water resources more efficiently. Um, one area that we haven't spoken of this morning yet is energy, using energy more efficiently in agriculture. 
um, making sure that our agri workers are well protected when we start getting heat, heat stress and so on, protecting our markets. So that is the first area. We need to make sure that production is sustainable and um, over the long term is resilient to climate changes on, on the farm and the, and the surrounding environment that supports it. The second part is disaster risk reduction, and that is, um, Leslie already spoke about that this morning, and we work very closely with, with um, that uh, unit um, to make sure that um, we have better planning and better joint um, a collaborative effort to reduce the risks to farmers um, and to make sure that we don't always only respond to the disasters when they happen, but that we start building that resilience um, and we, we, we help farmers to see what they can do so that when the next flood or the next drought comes, they are better able to, to cope. Um, the third aspect is uh, many of your researchers, young researchers, um, the knowledge in uh, economy really in agriculture is incredibly important, so knowledge and research, making sure that we do research strategically, that we do it in a coordinated way, that there's enough resources for our young researchers, that we're asking the right questions, and very importantly, that the answers that the researchers are coming up with are fed straight back into the sector, onto the farms, to the people who need that information. So we have information products that are, that are relevant, that are really practical. Um, the point was made um, that uh, you know, for implementation to happen, it needs to be really, really practical for the farmer. They need to be given um, guidelines as to what they can specifically do on their particular farm. Um, and then the last one is, is more for government, um, working together with the private sector uh, in agriculture, making sure that there's much more joint planning um, and, and awareness within different government departments, but also partnerships um, with the sector to make sure that um, the governance of all of this is, is, done, is done properly. Um, then I just wanted to say a few things about the approach that Smart Agri takes. Please stop me if I go on too long. But just briefly, it's, it's really important that the plan is led by the sector, by the farmers. And so we're going out all the time to the farmers, listening, letting them tell us what their risks are, what their impacts are, what they're doing on the farms so that we can come back and, and use that knowledge in the, in the correct way. We aren't just telling them what to do. It doesn't work like that in farming. The farmers often know best what they need and they just need the support um, from government and, and others, other people who have expert knowledge to be able to make the right decisions. Um, we are doing it in a very spatially high resolution way, and what I mean by that is that across the whole province, yes, we know we've got the five the district municipalities and we've got the Cape Town Metro, um, then we've got local municipalities, but we're actually taking it into what we call uh, climatic zones or agroclimatic zones. So we've divided the province into 23 such zones, and we look very specifically at what the historical climate is in those zones, what the future climate is, is likely to look like, what the current farming systems are there, uh, what the farmers are farming with, with whether it's grain or it's irrigated uh, fruit crops or whatever it is, and then making very sure that when we speak to those farmers, we're speaking to them about their actual local situation and their future. Um, yeah, so that's a short summary. Um, yeah. I'm happy to answer questions. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> is any questions for Professor? Yes, there's a question at the back. While you're going there, I just wanted to say, if you look at your stick, inside your stick, you'll see that strategy is in there. And if you look at the newest Agri probe, that's also inside there, you'll see all these zones that we're talking about and the science that's gone into it. It's actually a beautiful piece to read. I read it the other day and I thought, well, this is really something special. And that's highlighting what the professor was saying is the knowledge that is going down to the ground. Yes, sir. Anyway, I can try and raise my voice. So this is a question, I guess, to everybody. Um, I guess this is a question to everybody on the panel, particularly um, the professor. So we have heard today about all the plans, all the strategies, um, all the innovations that we are making. Um, my question is, to what extent do all the plans, the innovations and the strategies put the smallholder farmer at, the, at their heart? Or are they targeted at a commercial level? So for example, I think about my grandmother who is a farmer to sustain her family and her friends and multiple people around. Are those strategies putting her at heart? because I think she is in the majority compared, I suppose, to commercial farmers. 
So to what extent are we doing that? To what extent are we thinking about the risks and the impacts on the smallholder farmer? And to what extent are we actually channeling the funds to address their problems vis-a-vis -vis commercial farmers? Thanks. Um, in terms of support, like you said now, what support we get, uh, I'm also a person that gets support from the government, uh, just so occasionally as you go on, um, but it depends on how you, how you take it in. Say like if you're a small scale farmer, it depends on what you do. Say like if you're a chicken farmer, that's something else, but you as a chicken farmer can help with them when your, your chickens get off. You can help another small scale farmer who's maybe in to vegetables or something like that. You can take your menu, give it to him, or you can buy it from him so you can get an income from that and then you should eat on your lands again for your, for your um, to get a better crop the next year or something like that. So that's, that's just the way I see it. It's like, so like, like us also, we, we, we have a big piece of land, it's like 1,600 hectares, eh? but I don't have the cash flow to, exp to, to explore all the land that I have. But what I can do is I can maybe like diversify, do stuff more so that the one commodity can help another commodity. In that way, you can make you can go forward. That's just what I think. Thank you. Work. That, that's, that's what I think works for me. <laughs> Sorry for, for for bringing you on the spot, but thank you very much for that. To give you an answer on that, we've got a commodity approach in the Western Cape. So all the commodities are supported on a yearly basis. I think in your books, there's the one that's written by Vinpro, where they've established 50 vineyards uh, for small farmers or new farmers into it. And in most of the other commodities, they're doing quite the red meat as well in the central Karoo. And all the areas they're doing work every single year on that. They're already putting the plans together through the commodity approach, and those plans will then be affected at the moment. So there is definitely a thing. All the projects that we're working on are also all available and include small farmers wherever we can. So that is something that, it's something we want to make more farmers. That's exactly what to do. I don't know if you were referring to your grandmother that did she have a small farm or was it a patch? Because I can tell you something what we learned a lot is in Wuppertal, in the small vegetable gardens in Wuppertal that never used any of these chemical fertilizers. And their food that they produced over there was of a better quality than what you would get with chemi uh, chemical fertilizers. And not only that, it preserved better. They used to preserve it in their roofs. And the same as Seabrook and Yilam did the same. And that taught us that we probably be doing something wrong with that. But that was many years ago. And they're still going ahead. We've done a lot of work on those communities as well. Right, are there any other questions? Yes, we've got some nice questions on this side. If, if you uh, get that while we're getting there. Uh, I just wanted to say, if, you, if you've got a, a needle and you put a, a nice thick piece of golden thread on that, and you take that needle from the ground, on the small farmer or the farmer side and you go up into the plans that we've got in the smart agri plan and you go up into any climate change regional plan in Africa and you go up into the Convention on Bio Biological Diversity as well as the United Nations Convention to Combat Desertification. That thread will go from our projects all the way up to that national level. So we can prove with any of these alien clearing projects or any research projects that we're doing that we're affecting exactly that. The newest project we're looking at is combating desertification in the, in the Karoo area, Murraysburg. There's a lot of what they call brakpana or areas where there's absolutely no vegetation. And in the last seven years of the drought, these areas have just grown more and more. And you could say this is desertification happening while you're looking at it. And we're looking at a project to see how we can address this and reverse that. But your question. 
All right, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, well, it's not really a question. It's a response to the smallholder farmers there. My name is Funzo, by the way. Uh, I work for can, the department. Yeah. Oh, my name is Funzo. I'm not used to microphones. I work for the Department of Agriculture here. Yeah? Uh, I'm an animal scientist. So just to respond to, to, to all this we're talking about and how they have an effect maybe or application in smallholder farmers. I think, well, the thing with smallholder farmers is that they are, they are limited in terms of numbers as compared to commercial farmers uh, that we, 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 we know. So, so what can smallholder farmers uh, benefit from all this? Systems? In a sense, maybe, for example, when you talk about animals, you can easily uh, help them in, in a sense that you improve the quality of their animals and not even numbers. So someone can compete with less animals but of quality with uh, the ones with bigger numbers and, and, and stuff like that. And then, and then also when you, 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 you talk about a, a, the, let's say the technology, for example, some of the technology are, are not that easy to apply in, in smallholder farmers, obviously, because of the, the expenses and things like that. We talk about maybe things like uh, the genomic uh, 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 manipulation and stuff of, of, of animal DNA so that they produce well and stuff like that. So the, the only thing that smallholder farmers can benefit from, obviously, maybe let's just say, for example, distrib distribution of from the department, for example, of animals that are well adaptable to, to specific environments and stuff like that, that will obviously benefit smallholder farmers. Thank you. Right, there, there, there's another question. Thank you for that. Is it me? Yeah. Yes. <laughs> Hi, um, I'm Lee, and I'm from the Department of Environmental Affairs and Planning, specifically environmental law enforcement. Um, <laughs> Rolf is laughing because we kind of work, we work very closely with the Department of Agriculture. Um, and our work, unfortunately, is more reactive than it is proactive. And some of the things, or two of the most prevalent issues we experience is the clearing of um, indigenous vegetation and the illegal damming, etc. cetera, water. Um, so I just wanted to ask, like the project that Rudolf mentioned with the um, clearing of alien vegetation. It's like an amazing project to hear about because um, often we come to properties where they say they cleared this vegetation because they wanted to clear the aliens, but it's the, it's the proper incentive but the incorrect manner because they would then plow the entire field or take machines into the river and so that triggers a lot of other listed activities according to NEMA. So um, what I wanted to ask is, Rudolph, the project, will it be extending further than the Cape Winelands then? And is there a way that we can maybe mention this project to um, different property owners like farmers that have the issue with the clearing? Um, and then I'll just pass on my questions. Um, Johanna, also the conservation agriculture, it's also an amazing concept. It's the first time I personally have heard about it. Um, and just the way you were talking about plowing and that that's something that you guys don't um, motivate. I just wanted to ask then, do you ever clear like new or like natural felt or would it be like old actual, old agricultural lands then that you guys will just like rebuild or regenerate? And then Leslie with your um, <laughs> river protection project. Um, we also do, like I mentioned, the dams, the illegal dams that we often like experience when we go to properties and they would illegally dam water where they say allegedly it's due to drought, which most times is the case. Would we then from our side, um, with your assistance to these type of farmers, is there a way then that we can direct them to you to prevent the fact that they, instead of creating an illegal dam, that we could say um, there is this project where you could request assistance, etc. Yo, that was, have you been holding it back the whole two hours and now it's just like a dam, it just yeah, no, I, did, I couldn't even stay with that one. But I can tell you the one about that you asked you on is these are all old lands. So they're not new lands. It's not uh, uh, virgin felt of any type or any fine boss or anything. But I'll, I see you put Rudolf on the spot. <laughs> Let's see if we can test him here. Well, I first have to remember all your questions. <laughs> first one, uh, alien clearing. Yes, definitely. It's not only in the Cape Winelands. It's happening all over the province. Um, we all received the funding and using the same methodology. So definitely available. There's an incredible new document that came out last year by our partners, uh, WWF. And um, it's something we can also share electronically. I don't know if it's on this, but it's, um, it's a, a, a go-to 
a handbook basically on norms and standards of how you do alien clearing. Exactly not the way that you described it now. So there is really no excuse, you know, for farmers to do it with bulldozers. So there is a very good uh, reference there. Um, conservation agriculture, I just want to add, yes, old lands, but when we comment, and that's one of our jobs as well, when there's a new development of virgin felt, you guys would probably not know about this, but you cannot develop any piece of felt that you want to by plowing it. You have to go through an application process, get approval from the National uh, Agriculture Department, uh, the in Department of Environmental Affairs and uh, Water Affairs, and there's even the Heritage Act um, that you have to look after. But what I want just to say is when we comment, um, we indicate to that farmer one of the requirements when he wants to cultivate for him to get approval is uh, in that approval letter is that he should practice conservation agricultural practices. So based on that, he gets approval. So it's very easy for an official to go back in a year or two, do the monitoring, and then discuss with the farmer, you know, he's using of that requirements. Uh, he, he has to do it. It's part of his approval that he got to do conservation agriculture on that, on, on that piece of land. The last one I'm going to leave to Leslie if yeah. I want to answer it. Um, Let, let's, put Les, let's put Leslie, but Leslie, no. you're standing in between, you here, and lunch is here, and you're here, huh? Oh, sorry, was there another question? Oh, is there another question? Right, sure. Hey, um, I'm Shade. I'm from the water sector. Rudolph, stop smiling. <laughs> um, thank you for those questions from Dead P. I'm also interested in those answers, but... Um, I'm hearing a lot of conversation around the small-scale farmers. How accepting is the, are the big-scale farmers, so the corporations? How are they, ex are they accepting of the small-scale farmers? Are they accepting in sharing their knowledge um, with the small-scale farmers? And how are you holding them accountable um, if they are part of the projects that you've all mentioned. I know you've mentioned in a letter that they have to follow best practice, but a year or two down the line, if they are not exercising that, what is the role? What, what is the accountability that they need to follow? And what is your role when they are not practicing what they say they're going to do, essentially? So you've given them permission, they have accepted it with open hands, they now do what they want to do in the realm of whatever they can do. What is it that agriculture goes back to them and say? Yeah, I'll, I'm gonna give it to Leslie that one because he's got a very good example of assistance to small farmers and what he actually does and what the standard is and what he does if the standard is not adhered to. So Day and Lee and then our colleague at the back, I didn't get his name right. From a disaster point of view, we do not distinguish between commercial farmer and emerging farmers, all right? Um, if there's a disaster, we support everybody. I think we need to make that very clear. Um, I cannot also, from a disaster point of view, speak for, we've got a different program. Uh, that's our agricultural producers and support, uh, what's it, uh, farmer support. We used to call them farmer support and development. So I cannot speak for you know, the work that they're doing in this space in terms of assisting emerging farmers. But again, like I said, um, when it comes to disasters, we support everybody. The issue, Shaday, that, that you were talking about in, in terms of commercial farmers and linking up with, with our small-scale small -scale farmers, within a disaster setup, when we interact with these farmers, now, again, one must also understand that in certain areas, one has to go to, you've got to look at a context, all right? When we work in certain areas, we can bring the commercial, the big commercial farmers and our emerging farmers, we can bring them all together and we can have one discussion. In some of the areas, you can't have that. Now, this is not the platform for me to go into those kinds of reasons, but that's the reality out there. So in some areas, we have separate discussions and we're trying to build that bridge via the whole disaster risk reduction process. Again, so again, uh, our colleague asked about the projects that we then get out of these. Um, we s met with Rudolf and some of his uh, farmers out in the Cape Winelands areas, and we do the same for from the Matsikama on the west coast all the way to Marisburg um, 
and the garden route, etc. Previously, we used to come with, okay, this is the fantastic projects that we've got, we're going to implement it. We know that this, that just doesn't work, all right? So we sit down with the farmers, we engage with them, we ask them what are the kind of projects that they want that's going to help them in terms of when we look at the impact of climate change, we look at the impact on hazards or when it becomes a disaster. What is it that they actually feel is needed, right? And then we try and get into projects that's going to benefit all the farmers in that community and not only the commercial farmers. Because again, we understand there's the political discussions, but I don't want to get into that now. So from our point of view, all right, so it's all the farmers, we try and get projects from them. They are really, really, what's the word that I'm looking for? They are farmers that are commercial farmers that are working with the emerging farmers to become better and become bigger. Unfortunately, that is in the minority and that's the reality. All right, um, that's the reality. Then in terms of, uh, is it Lee, you were talking about these dams and illegal dammings. When we go out and we sit and we discuss with our farmers about water and the drought and the lack of water, etc., they are the ones that tell us, there's a farmer that's out there that's building this massive dam. That farmer gets a fine of two million rand, which is nothing for him to pay, All right? So then there's other departments that needs to come in. There's the legal aspect in those things. And so that does become problematic. Um, but again, it's a process. And I think from our point of view, from a disaster management point of view, or disaster risk reduction, is to identify who the proper role plays is, and then to bring them in, to bring uh, Stephanie in, to bring Rudolf and, and, and Laura. I mean, we often get calls in terms of, you know, these birds are dying and everything. And then we just, you know, <coughs> we sort of put them through to, to Laura, et cetera, et cetera. But again, it's, it's about having those kinds of conversations. And, and within the climate uh, change space now, we are finding that people are actually willing to have that conversation. Is it almost lunchtime? It's nearly lunch, yeah. Okay. So yeah, um, but again, please feel free to engage with us during lunch or whenever. Thank Next you. Thank you. Now, uh, you'll probably see there's, there's also another thread that goes through all the panelists. And that is that they listen to farmers. So it would be a small farmer or a big farmer, they listen. And those plans, then they put their scientific knowledge together and they make a proactive project like conservation agriculture, or area wide planning, or cleaning of alien plants. It's actually restoration of the natural area that we're doing. So it's all part of that. So it's a, it's a very good learning school to come uh, to some of these farmers' days and just listen to the farmers, let them speak, and we just listen to them, and then you can translate that into what, what you've studied. Right, so are there any other burning questions? Yes, we've got one more, that's the last one, right? So I just wanted to ask Dr. Rudolph, as you mentioned, you've gathered with um, farmers and you asked them what are the needs so what is the most needed need, if I can state it like that, that you've come across that most farmers or all farmers are in need of? Thank you, doctor. <laughs> Not a doctor. <laughs> but um, yeah, no, the biggest need at the moment for farmers is uh, two things, I think, that's coming up. The first one is the invasive aliens. It's a huge problem for us in the Western Cape. Um, the second thing is, good professional advice on land use planning. That's critically, especially through the, all the, uh, um, the maze of uh, regulations by uh, government on what you can and cannot do on your farm. And good professional advice on a way forward how to get through that maze to the product where they could farm um, sustainably on their, on their property. That was the two things that's coming up. Right. No, thank you. Can we have a, a nice, strong hand of applause for all the panelists, please? Thank you, sir. Thank you. Right. And with that, I'll hand over to uh, uh, the magician, sir. Right. Thank you very much, Francis. And to all the panelists, you're welcome to go and take your seat. Uh, are you guys all still available for the rest of the afternoon? Or some of you guys have to dash off? All right. Uh, for those dashing off, is there a way for us to either share email addresses or to create a platform where people can ask questions? 
post? All right, so we'll, we'll try and do that. So if you want to engage further, they're still here, and those who are not here will find a way to connect electronically, uh, because I know you guys have got lots of questions, right? I was sitting there, and it's almost like watching the post-match interview. No? It's almost like watching Nas Buta and all the people talk about the game after the game was played. And then there's the one guy who's playing the game. <laughs> and he doesn't have time for these conversations because in the moment you have to make decisions. And it's how do we balance that world? How do we use hindsight together with foresight to shape the insight that we have today? So thank you guys for sharing and I hope uh, that you guys will have further conversations. I know that it's between me, you and lunch, but before we get to lunch, I'm just going to hand because I've got the power to adjust the program and yet still make sure that we finish at half past four. Mm, that's the way I do it. Mm. So I'm just going to hand over to a representative from the Lanbo Vietbat. Thank you, sir. The floor is yours. You guys are welcome to go and grab your seat and we've paid you like we pay. Like in Cape Town, they would say, how do you pay a colored teacher? You pay them with alcohol. No? Hi, that was back in the day. So thank you guys for being part of the panel. And uh, who do I hand over to? Ilsa. Ladies and gentlemen, um, just before you run off for lunch, we cannot do what we do in agriculture or in South Africa without the media. And our big media partner uh, in agriculture is Lanpo Vietblad. And I would like to welcome Chris Burgess, the one and only Chris Burgess from Lampo Vietblad, to quickly come and talk to you. You've got exactly two minutes, Chris. Uh, they, they sponsored the, the magazines in your bags as well. And there are some lucky draws um, that we will do uh, with some of the products. But Chris has got something nice to share with you. And maybe over lunchtime, you would like also to engage um, the table right at the back. Thanks, Chris. Thank you, Ilza, and uh, thank you for an absolutely fascinating day. Um, I was just sitting and listening to the conversation earlier um, and some great uh, questions out of the audience. Um, the whole idea of regenerative farming and more climate-wise uh, farming I mean, is something that's very close to Landbewerkplatz's heart. Um, you know, if we don't get that right, we're not going to get farming right. And we've, we've, we've partnered with, uh, for quite a few years now already, with uh, Dr. Johan Strauss on the uh, Conservation Agriculture of, uh, Conference. Um, we also have big regenerative farming conferences up in the Free State and, and the Northwest. Um, and just a question about, you know, how does the climate change benefit the small-scale farmers? I think that, uh, you know, firstly, it doesn't matter if you're small or big. You know, the, if, you, if, you, if your climate go, turns on you, you're not going to make it. And I just think that regenerative farming specifically is actually such a wonderful opportunity for, for small-scale farmers to, to develop a sustainable, low-cost farming uh, uh, model. Um, so... Um, you know, also the, 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 the projects, for instance, in the, in the, uh, in the former Transkai, where they're doing ultra-high density grazing with, with cattle, was actually quite remarkable results. So I just actually wanted to answer that question um, uh, because I think it's just such an important one that climate-wise, agriculture and regenerative farming, I think, is, uh, I think is a solution to, to small-scale farming because small-scale farmers simply can't afford them I and you speak to them and you know financing is the big problem you know so you have to find a cheaper way of farming anyway it's not why, why i'm up here i just found that a, a quite an interesting question i just quickly wanted to tell you guys we are afrikaans farming magazine um uh, um and we uh, we've got a special offer if anyone wants to wants to uh, subscribe to our paywall so behind our paywall we've got all our tv programs all our various books that we publish uh, we've got these conferences that we've uh, uh, that we've that we present. All our our uh, our products are behind this paywall. We've got a really great offer. And we've got uh, Apollo Bomvana um, sitting at the back there. He will he will sort you guys out if you're interested in taking it up. I know it's Afrikaans, but we've also got African farming uh, magazine um, that we've just, I don't know if you guys seen the TV program on uh, Mzanza Wetu. So I just thought I'd mention it. Um, if you guys are interested, speak to Apollo. Uh, we've got a fantastic offer. I see that there are some Afrikaans speaking guys here and um, yeah, make use of the offer. And 
Uh, enjoy the rest of the two days. I think it's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Enjoy your lunch. All right. Thank you very much for that. So with that, we are now at lunch. I've decided we're not going to give you lunch. We're just going to give you a takeaway at the end of the afternoon, and we're just going to continue with the program. No, I'm just kidding. We're going to take a beautiful lunch. Uh, are here if we call you out and you are not here, then unfortunately, I will take the lucky draw. Right, so um, how do we do this? You've got numbers and they've got numbers on their lineage? Under their chairs. Under their chairs. No, it's a joke. It's a joke. Okay. Under their at the back of at the their lineage. At the back of your lineage, there should be a number, right? Yeah. Cool. Okay, hello people. I hope you enjoyed this morning. Lucky draws, little goodie bags. Tomorrow the big prizes will be going, so do not stay away tomorrow. So we've got five lucky draws. At the back of your lineage on, the, on your name tag, there's a number. Please keep that ready. I will ask Stephanie to do the handover of the lucky draws and our Master of Ceremonies program director to do the drawing. Ian Nomerki, Sablief, Nomer as Sablief. Can we get a representative from Price Water? No. No, no. What's your number? Give me the number. 61. Number 61. Number 61. Going once, twice, wrong number. 61, going thrice, nothing, 61, is it you, are you sure, okay, let's ask the auditor from Price Waterhouse. No, it's 61. It's 61. She's the winner. Let's give her a round of applause. <laughs> Alien, yeah? There, there, there. And whilst you're thinking that you might not win something, keep an eye on all the trees and the plants. If you go home tomorrow, you can grab one and go and plant it somewhere. We will not leave any plants here. You grab a tree and go and plant. In the neighbor, you don't want them like at the back. Next door, go and plant a tree in his garden, Mr. Adjudicator. Number? Number 67. 67. Ah. Oh, he's a student of Dr. Steph. One, one, five. One, one, five, going, going, going. One, one, one. No, they don't know what they're missing. Fifty-nine. Fifty-nine. She's got it. She's got it. Let's bring her in, ladies and gentlemen. She's coming close. She's coming close. <laughs> please verify her number. Please verify. Fifty-nine. Is it she? It's her. Two more to go. And the last one, Ian Tuyet 
we are one to two. We don't like instructions. <laughs> oh, he's battling, he's battling. Good stuff. Four. Four. Ah, oh, sorry. Four, four. Yes, yes, she's coming. Thank you, people. Over to you, Master of Ceremonies. All right, so thanks and congratulations to all those winners. Just please note, uh, for those of you who won the lucky draws now, uh, if you could just give those bags back to us at the end of the afternoon, so that tomorrow we can give out the same uh, for the second group of people. All right, so we're back after lunch. Uh, we're continuing with our program, and before I uh, introduce our next uh, presenter, uh, we just have some more images that we need you to judge. Uh, so if you can just quickly go back onto Mentimeter, we will show you seven images uh, and you are just requested to please vote for one of the seven. So go back onto Mentimeter and the code will be... The, the, the seven images one. Yeah, this is for the... N yeah, so you can... No worries, no worries, no worries. We, we know what happens after lunch. All the blood goes to the stomach because that's where the food is and then it becomes very difficult to concentrate. But there's no pressure. It's not as if we're all looking at you and wondering why it's not yet on the screen. So don't feel all the eyes on you. Don't feel the pressure. But here we are, waiting patiently. Photos. Seven of them, I think. Six. Right, so for our six photos, we will give you quickly the code that you used to use for the voting. The question there, which image is best at depicting climate change, and the code is seven, uh, sorry, four double seven eight double nine one four. You all got the code? Yeah, can we just get the code again? It was four seven seven eight nine nine one four. Four double seven eight double nine one four. So that's the first one, fire, there's some cows grazing, or maybe just looking at the photo or the cameraman. Some pot plants, option three, option four, option five. Peace and tranquility. Right, so we've got 54. Hopefully we still have more or less the same number of people as we had this morning. So let's see if we can get to uh, around 70 in terms of participation. Uh, so it seems as if image number nine, um, that is the picture of little dam or some water, some barren area at the back. It's got most of the votes at the moment, 64. Uh, let's see if we can get to 70 participants. That would be awesome. We need another three, and there's another three. Can we get to two more? Another one, just to get us to 70. 
There we go, 70 in. The rest of you, if you still want to vote, you can just randomly pick a number and just put in your vote. All right, so we're going to continue with our program. This morning, we shared a lot of information with you around uh, some of the content. What is, what is climate change? How does it affect uh, agriculture specifically? And how do we find innovative ways to address some of those challenges? And what we want to do now is to move the conversation a little bit towards the side of so, so how do we deal with these realities of a world that is rapidly changing? So allow me to quickly introduce to you our uh, presenter uh, after lunch, Mary Ann Cullinan, but she prefers to just be called Max, or she allows people like myself who've known her for years to just call her Max. She is a clinical psychologist with special interests in mindfulness. Uh, specifically looking at things like focusing, uh, trauma resolution work, eco-psychology, uh, with a particular focus on the psychological effects of climate breakdown on our collective mental health. So there you have it. Question. What is the impact of climate change on our mental health, on our psyche? I'm not the expert, and that's why I invited Max to come and share with you uh, on the topic, climate change and mental health, taking care of ourselves and one another, because we know we can't give what we don't have. The floor is yours. Hello. Oh, okay. Um, thanks very much to the organizers of this convention for inviting me. Um, I have to say, as a climate-aware psychologist, we don't often uh, get the opportunity to talk at conventions like this. And it's just hugely encouraging for us to know that there are sectors who are taking this very seriously. We know that eco-anxiety is on the rise. And in fact, um, there was a landmark study last year, a really huge study, the biggest scientific study that's been done so far on climate anxiety and the youth. And that study was done across 10 different countries in the global north as well as the global south. And uh, the, yeah, there were 10,000 people that they interviewed. I, like that other fellow, don't really have the capacity to keep all the figures in my head. So forgive me, I'm going to just give you an idea of what that study came back with. This was about September last year that the results came in. So the study involved 10,000 young people across 10 countries. Nearly six in 10 young people aged 16 to 25 were very or extremely worried about climate change. A similar number said that governments were not protecting them, the planet, or future generations, and that they felt betrayed by the older generation and by governments. Three quarters of the study agreed that the statement, the future is frightening, was true, and more than half felt that they would have fewer opportunities than their parents. Nearly half reported feeling distressed or anxious about the climate in a way that was affecting their daily lives and functioning. And that's a very important measure for psychologists. When we're trying to assess whether something is a disorder or not, we look at how badly it's affecting daily lives and functioning. That's work and social life as well. So four in 10 young people around the world are hesitant to have children as a result of the climate crisis. The words most commonly used to describe their feelings associated with climate crisis were sad, anxious, afraid, guilty, angry, powerless. And when asked about governments, institutions, and businesses responding to climate change, 65% of them agreed with the statement that they are failing young people, and only 36% agreed that governments and policymakers are acting according to the science and the research available. Finally, a huge 60% agreed that they were dismissing the anxiety and distress of young people. So that's really quite a, a damning report when we think about the kind of support that we would be offering young people in terms of rising eco-anxiety. And I think that you know, there's another point that's been made really often, uh, which is, and I look around this room, and I know also from speaking to Prof Midgley that most of you are under the age of 35, 
that your generation is the first generation to really understand the scale and the intensity and the rapidity of uh, the climate crisis. And on top of that, you are the last generation who will really have a significant um, chance or opportunity to do something about that trajectory. So, no pressure, as they say. Um, I wanted to, I, I'm going to, I'm afraid, use my notes to keep me in time. This is a subject that I could go into a lot of wormholes around. Uh, but I really want to be able to leave as much time as possible for the, the Q&A session. Um, we really do want this to be interactive. And, you know, given what the previous panelists and speakers have been talking about, if you read between the lines, if you hear between the lines in a way, uh, there's a lot of emotion involved in everything that they're, is, they're speaking about. And I know that all of you will have had some kind of experience of climate crisis, whether it's an extreme weather event uh, or whether it's COVID, quite frankly. I mean, we, you know, this is not unrelated to the environment either. And as agriculturalists uh, or in the agricultural sector, you, you probably are closest to the impact of environmental change. And if you think about that, uh, that big survey that was done, if people, young people think that the research and the findings are not being listened to, that affects all of you who are doing research as well, because we all want to be seen and to be heard and to be valued and respected. And it means it's incredibly important for the older generation, us, to make not just a place at the table for youth, but many, many places. I want to try and define eco-anxiety for you because it may not be a concept that you've come across before. Um, I'm, I'm sure you all resonate with it at, at, to some extent or another. But at its simplest, anxiety, eco-anxiety is the chronic fear of environmental doom. And when we talk about environmental grief, we're talking about our grief that stems from the environmental loss of ecosystems, flora and fauna, natural or man-made events. There are lots of possible emotions. You know, this really is a, a very, very wide spectrum that we're looking at. Um, but we look at dread, we look at grief, we look at anger, we look at rage, we look at paralysis, numbing out, shutting down. These, these are all eco um, eco-emotions, if you want to put it, or related to our, our understanding of where we stand. Um, there's no right or wrong way to feel. It's a very personal uh, thing, and we all respond in different ways. So I really want to just leave that open. Um, there is no right way that you should be feeling. And, you know, your feelings may change from day to day as well. And I also want to emphasize, because the minute you raise um, the topic of psychology, people start thinking that you're mental in some way. Uh, so it's important to emphasize that eco-anxiety is not a mental health disorder, okay? It has an impact on our mental health, but in itself, it's not a disorder. In fact, I would say that climate psychologists start by acknowledging that from a mental health perspective, eco-anxiety is in fact the sane, rational, and healthy response to the reality of climate crisis. One of the measures that we use for measuring mental health is being in touch with reality. Uh, so being able to recognize the scale and the intensity of this crisis and to be feeling anxious about it in whatever way you are is not delusional. It's about being in touch with reality. One psychologist has suggested that we reframe eco-anxiety as eco-empathy because on the flip side of these so-called negative emotions, um, they really are speaking very directly to our distress, our, our deep feelings about an earth that is suffering and that we all deeply love. When we talk about the emotional, we're really talking about the internal level. And we first need to acknowledge the reality that our rapidly warming earth is the greatest existential threat that we're currently facing. I missed um, the previous talks before 11 o'clock, so I'm pretty sure that this was outlined for you. Uh, and unless we can 
first of all, acknowledge our feelings of distress or grief or fear or despair and find ways to work through them and alongside of them, we won't be able to contribute to the kinds of really heroic, ambitious, active and engaged efforts that we're going to need to be engaged with to get through this. Um, often, you know, in psychology, we explain that if you push something down, you know, what is known as repression or denial, uh, we do this because we think it'll help us to, to carry on carrying on. But what we know is that denial or shutdown or repression is not a local anesthetic. It doesn't just numb one part of you. It actually robs you of a lot of motivation and a lot of energy for taking up uh, the rest of your life in a really enthusiastic and engaged way. On the external level, what we often see with people who are experiencing eco-anxiety is that they run to two extremes. They're either extremely proactive, and so I'm sure many of you know people like this, who do absolutely everything they can um, and are involved on every single level. And then on the other side, there are people who just shrug and say, it's hopeless, it's absolutely overwhelming, I, I don't know where to start, so I'm not even going to. But the problem is, is that both burnout and paralysis are not helpful to us because then we're unable to take action. And with overwhelming consensus, when we look at, cli at climate psychology, taking action is the greatest antidote to climate anxiety. And there's a lot involved in that about how we're wired as human beings. And these new machines and imaging things that we have these days are very helpful because you can, you can actually plug people up and you can measure the extent to which their autonomic nervous system is activated, either into flooding or into complete shutdown. So we know that when people get together with other people, that is the best possible thing for our particular nervous system as human beings. And something about that is really the best antidote we have to this kind of uncertainty, this chronic fear, because it's not going to go away. It is, it is a, I mean, there is a chronicity to it. So where we start is we say, acknowledge and work and accept the feelings that you're experiencing around climate crisis. And the next step is to accept that as an individual, you can't do everything. Because even if you take greener choices, which we must, we must do, it's a good thing. But the scale of the threat facing us goes so much further than any of the good individual actions that we can take. And that is what leads us to the next step, is that it is only with community, with collective action, that we as individuals can drive the systemic change that is needed to address the roots of climate change, and that at the same time addresses our own eco-anxiety. So to summarize, acceptance of our sane, rational feelings of eco-anxiety is where we start. And doing this equips us to find out where we can take action, where we can build community, and where we can begin to find and create networks. So it's also important to know that this kind of way in which we get together under crisis as humans is our greatest strength as, species, as a species, but it's also our most effective way of building mental health resilience. In the past, from my perspective, you know, our healing treatments, our modalities used to be about the individual. You know, in therapy is one-on-one -on -one in a room. But with the rising levels of eco-anxiety, we're being asked to stretch that definition of where our work lies. And we are finding that the greatest healing is in trying to normalize what eco-anxiety is and to encourage people to let those feelings surface. And, you know, as as kind of companionship to each other, to really hear each other into speech, not to close people down when they're talking about this. So, you know, psychologists often use a lot of psychobabble and other people don't know what it means. What does it mean to shut down somebody? Often we shut down people when we mean well. Maybe somebody is freaking out because they've just read their headlines or social media has brought something to their attention and it's really overwhelming. And they want to talk about it. They say, I feel scared. You know, I really, really, or I feel despair. And we can say to that person, 
look, you know, don't concentrate on the negative, you know, just, um, you know, pull yourself together, you know, we'll get through this somehow. You, you, you can go in too prematurely to just close down that conversation. And really what we're wanting to put across is that it's far better to let these feelings surface and to, to really have the conversation because what we find is that we are not alone in those feelings. Many, many other people are feeling them too. And I wanted to say that I'm going to put up something, uh, or Ari is, um, on the Mentimeter soon to look at the, at the range of emotions that, that we, we are referring to. And it's, not it's not comprehensive. But another emotion that's involved in eco-anxiety is something called hope, active hope. So passive hope is about waiting for something to come in, some kind of external agency to come in and bring about the changes. Active hope is about becoming active participants in bringing about what it is that we hope for, what it is that we long for. And essentially, I think the most important message is working with eco-anxiety is a mandate for us to build a better world, a cleaner world, and a healthier world. We do actually know what to do, and we do actually know how to do it. And the question is, how do we help each other do it? I'm hoping also at the end of the session um, to talk a little bit more about how we might help each other um, and ourselves. But for the moment, Ari, if we could put up that, that one question two, um, and if you could go back on Mentimeter, it would be really interesting to see this word cloud. Oh no, this is, this is number one. Could we go to number two? Um, I, I, no, I'm, I'm going to question two. Which of these, these commonly reported climate related? Okay, sorry about that. No, that's. <laughs> wait a minute, why am I confusing you? Okay, sorry. So, which of these commonly reported. Yeah, that's it. Can you see?
And the number 13 is um, powerlessness, okay, and that one is guilt, and that one is anxiety, okay. Because they can't see it as well. They can't see it as well, okay, all right. Okay, yeah. Can they see this on their phones? No. Oh, okay. Okay. Right. Um, sorry, and we're just going to rephrase this question because you don't you, you don't need to just choose one. Um, we're assuming that uh, that there are a number of these emotions that you've either feeling or have felt in the past, and the, and because they change, you know, you might wake up one day and feel guilt because you've got an upgrade on your cell phone and you know that you know minerals are being mined to make that cell phone, or you might feel despair because you read about uh, you know terrible drought happening in a, a region of the world that you have a close connection to. So you don't just have to choose one. What happens now? The wedding, she's just changing and people can read uh, Oh, I see, okay. Okay. Yeah. All right. I think. I think. I think this should give us a pretty good idea. Um, Ari, if I can use your phone. Um, Okay, so just to, you know, there's a lot more to take out of this, but at the moment what we're seeing is that um, anxiety, uh, powerlessness, and lack of hope for future possibilities is what most of you um, are feeling, or it's, it's got the highest number of votes. But in fact, everything else um, has been chosen except for, for grief or mourning or sadness. Um, is there one person? Oh, oh they're over there, sorry. Um, it's different on here. Okay. So I, I, that's an exercise I just wanted to do. Thanks so much, Ari. Uh, just to, to let you have a sense of the fact that, you know, on top of the fact that we're, we're working people and we have a working identity and another identity out there, we have another identity which never goes to sleep, really, which is the fact that we are embedded in this world and it means an enormous amount to us and we have a relationship with the environment, with Earth, because we are so embedded in it and therefore, you know, what eco-psychology says is that, you know, your 
your understanding of the world doesn't stop where your skin ends. Uh, we have a further relationship, and it's an enormously powerful one. Um, I'd really like now, will this get captured, Ari? Yeah, thanks. Um, I'd really like now to throw the floor open to questions and answers, and I really encourage you to bring your own experiences um, to the mic, uh, whatever you have felt and uh, what you feel currently, and maybe talking to some of these uh, that you may have you may have ticked uh, as a feeling that you're you're experiencing. So, if we can just throw that open, uh, I'd be very grateful. Max, thank you so much. Just two questions from my side. In terms of if, if a patient arrives, mm. do they identify their eco mm. pointer? Or do you find it as you go along? There's anxiety, but you don't know what it is. Mm. That's my one question. How do you determine between a number of eco anxieties? Mm. So let's say you've got a water issue and there's power outages. How are you are you dissecting them? Mm. And my third question is: um, During the day zero, mm. did you see an increase in in patients knocking at your door, wanting mm. to talk about their feelings mm. about? a very, very prominent mm. issue. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thanks. Thanks for that question. Yeah, I think, um, you know, people tend to come in and more or less tell you what it is that they're struggling with. So they might not say it's the water shortage. They might say, well, I went to the spring to fill up my water bottle and there was a really ugly incident that happened there and it's upset me a lot. Um, or somebody might come in and say, you know, my daughter has decided not to have children, and I'm so upset. I'm not going to be a grandfather. Um, I, I really didn't see this coming, and I, I don't really know how to deal with it. Um, so, and of course, with the fires, <laughs> that in Cape Town, for example, that was that was front of house for almost everybody who came in, uh, who had been impacted by it. Mm. Hi, good afternoon. Um, mm. I'm over here. Uh, I just want to know from you or just gain a bit of perspective from you on, on kind of like the psychological process. We, we, you know, we, we're anxious about the situation and yet on a personal level and, and we, we expect somebody to do something about it. And then on a personal level, what we find, and I include myself wholeheartedly in this, is that we, we struggle to do the things that we should be doing. We, we don't get there. So, you know, we say, oh, you know, like, uh, we must reduce our meat consumption, for example, mm -hmm. um, but we don't do it in a personal level. Mm -hmm. You know, or we say, mm -hmm. the world must do this, but we don't contribute our little component. I, and and I, I know it's a bit off topic, but mm -hmm. I'm interested also in, in the people that you're dealing with that have these anxieties, whether there is that duality and whether is, there is that perplexedness kind of situation yeah. within them? Do you, do you find that too? Or are the people that you deal with fully converted and have changed their behavior and their, and their lifestyles as well? Sorry, it's a, yeah. it's a weird thing to introduce. So. No, no, it's not at all off piece. It's, it's a great question. Um, it's a great question because in psychology, we, we just never go for perfection. Um, you know, we have this concept which is called good enough. And it comes from a pediatrician called Donald Winnicott, who in the 60s uh, became very influential because he said that mothers were having a really bad press. They were meant to be perfect and bringing up, you know, perfect mothers and bringing up perfect children. And the pressure was too big. So he coined this expression of being a good enough parent. And really that's the, that's the metric that we use for any climate related behavior change, is you're never gonna get it right all the time. Um, and every now and then you're gonna need to fall off the wagon, you know, maybe you get invited somewhere where, you know, there's some kind of food stuff which is served which you don't think, you know, fits in with an um, eco-aware person's diet and you're going to have to eat it. And also we just can't keep uh, on that perfect uh, path forever. And the thing is to know that and that you can't do everything and still to bring a lot of self-compassion to it. 
You know, people talk about self-compassion a lot, and it, maybe it's a bit of a buzzword. You know, what does it actually mean? It means not being judgmental. Uh, just don't judge yourself so harshly. You can, you can get back in the saddle the next day. It's okay to slip up. Mm. Sorry, um, I'm right now. I just have a question that um, since this is the first time I'm, I came across this concept, um, I think there's a lot of people that perhaps go through this emotion unaware of this concept. Mm. So how do they know how to, mm. how to tackle this issue yeah. if they're not even aware of the concept? Because mm. I know there's certain people that go through depression, especially males mm. that's in denial, or they're not even aware they go through, mm. through depression. So how, yeah. mm. what's your advice for somebody mm. to, to know that they are going through an eco-anxiety mm. and how can this term be spread it more amongst the masses so that they are aware whoever is mm. going um, through such a emotion? Mm. Mm. Uh, it's a lovely question. You know, I was thinking about, I think, was it Leslie talking about the farmer um, sort of, you know, really experiencing such, such pain uh, around having to let the seasonal workers go, um, having to stop employing other people. Uh, you know, those people wouldn't say, I'm suffering from eco-anxiety. They, they wouldn't probably even put an emotion to it. So I think that this is where really talking, you know, talk, 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 it's what we always say. Just aerate all of your conversations with, with, the, with these kind of concepts. And, you know, I don't know if there are any here, but certainly in Europe and the States, they've started something called climate cafes. And climate cafes just meet at the pub or they meet at the restaurant or they meet at a cafe and everybody comes together. And it's a place just to talk about the emotions that are coming up for people around what's happening in the environment, what's happening with the climate. And the point is not to become, uh, you know, caught up in the details of what you're going to do. It's just a space where you can go and you can talk about your eco-anxiety without people kind of, you know, checking you skiff and thinking, you know, that's really inappropriate. I mean, why would you, why would you feel grief about the fact that, you know, the last such and such an antelope has gone extinct? It's where you can, you can express that feeling without being judged and without people shutting you down. Uh, they don't have to solve your problem. We can't solve the problem, you know, it's a collective problem. So, so really, I think the short answer is wherever you are, um, wherever you understand that there's somebody experiencing that kind of eco-anxiety, you, you can go a long way uh, in, co in, com what's the word, in accompanying that person just by saying you're not alone. I feel the same anxiety. I feel the same lack of possibility. You know, these are, uh, these are quite okay feelings to be feeling. It's, it's sane. It's rational. Uh, because from there, the action steps come. Because you're not pressing it down and thinking it's going to go away to be that local anesthetic. You know, you're, you're surfacing it. You're allowing it to come. Maybe, you know, after that, there's a sense of relief. There's a sense of, okay, I, I can... I don't want to be paralyzed in this way. I don't want to be flooded in this way. I don't want to be shut down in this way. What am I going to be doing about it? And it's from there that we know people have taken to um, creating networks uh, and have taken action. Good afternoon, I'm Jodine. Um, I had a question, but you answered it already with what you just said. Um, mm -hmm. I just wanted to know how does one speak to someone or address the situation with mm -hmm. someone without being dismissive? Because we work in mm -hmm. communal farming areas and mm -hmm. being researchers from the big city, mm -hmm. working with people in communal farming areas, they feel as though you can't relate to mm -hmm. what they're going through. Mm -hmm. And to a certain extent, we can't because we don't experience exactly yeah. what they experience. And they, they require a natural resource resources in its raw form where we don't. Um, we live in the city, we have everything at our fingertips. So mm -hmm. how do you interact with someone that raises concerns to you, but then without being dismissive because of your naivety, because you don't mm -hmm. experience what they experience? Mm -hmm. 
Look, I mean, I think the important thing is that you that that you accept it. Uh, I think you know a good question to ask is always just tell me more. You know, people need to be heard, and they need to know that they are seen in whatever they're going through, that they're not faceless or invisible because of their suffering, which is particular to them or their region, and that, that their pain is valued and that you dignify it when you ask people to tell you more. And, you know, if you are in some kind of role of transmitting some of what you see on the ground into other structures that will take it further, it's important to not skip over the eco-anxiety. You know, the more, um, you know, people will see it as sort of uh, soft, softer aspects of your work. You know, the emotional side is a huge part of what the whole of humanity is going through. And that's why people are writing about it more, doing more about it. You know, I, I, we, we, as a country, we have very, very little budget for mental health. I would say almost none. And that is a depressing thing. And it's things that, you know, psychologists and psychiatrists should be fighting for um, in the structures of government to get more budget for mental health. But in, in the short term, I think the important thing is, is, is not to be dismissive, you know. Let people talk. Let, just say, you know. I hear you, or I, I see how difficult this is. Thank you. Hello, Doc. Mm. Um, mine might be sort of a multitude of questions in one mm. question. Mm. Um, coming from someone who's always suffered or battled with mental health because it's hereditary, mm. um, and especially in the colored community as well, mm. living with depression or anxiety or any sort of mental mm. illness is really taboo. I mean, they're going to tell you to sweep it under the rug or they're going to tell you, ah, man, mm. just get over yourself, it's fine. Mm. Mm. But I've never encountered something like climate-related anxiety or emotions. Today's the first time I've heard about it. Mm. Um, how are you able to identify, as someone who comes from that, or somebody who wants mm. to help somebody going forward, how do you identify what is actually an external factor or stressor, as opposed to what you're actually just internalizing? Um, because I could say, Ugh, I'm having money stresses, but actually, it's mm. because we had COVID that I lost my job, that mm. I got another one, mm. but I still have outstanding debt. Mm. So how do you identify what is actually an external stressor Mm. that is because of something that happened as opposed to something that happened to you. Because mm. that's difficult when, you, mm. when you're in that state of mind. Yeah. Are, are you asking how you would do it as a psychologist or how you would do it as, a, as, a, as an, an everyday person? Yeah, yeah, as a lay person. Who's, yeah. So you're, I'm coming yeah. to speak to you, not as a doctor, mm. just like, oh, Max, mm. I need help. I, I'm struggling mm. with money, but I don't know what I'm going to do. Mm. Or mm. How, how, how would you mm. advise someone that's actually going to flip the switch where mm -hmm. they actually understand that it's not them, it's possibly because of COVID mm -hmm. or mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. of something that's actually right. happened right. that they yeah. have that I am enough yeah. kind of feeling or a good enough kind of mm -hmm. feeling. Yes, yeah. Well, I think that, you know, the first thing is, is to, to ask into it. You know, that's a, also maybe a bit of a, a psychobabble phrase, but asking into it is asking somebody to, to open up more about their stress that they have no money, let's say. You know, how did that come about? And to, to find common cause with people is, you know, it's sometimes enough to say, I, 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 I understand that that's what happened. You know, COVID, there's been a lot of jobs lost and it's very demotivating and it can leave you feeling uh, really depleted. So it's really almost about kind of echoing what the person is saying, but but, just adding a bit more to show that you, you do understand what that feeling is and that it's not mad, you know. People need to know they're not crazy. Uh, they, you know, they're not delusional. Um, this is a real thing. And they're allowed to feel those feelings. It's okay. Yeah. Sure. Thank you, Rim. Uh, I'm being partly captured now. But my concern now is how do you work with the media to take this outside for the people to know? Mm. Because I think we have, I've seen this for the first time also myself, and we've been experiencing some of these things, but not knowing where to go 
and what to do. Because we've been in universities where we had to spend two weeks without water, which is the same effect, and then that causes a lot of stress and some emotional, and the locations where we live, sometimes in the Eastern Cape, we spend a whole lot of time without water, which causes a lot of mm. mental changes and now reading everything else that is part of the anxieties and everything else that comes with the climate and thinking what maybe some of the people that we thought are experiencing some certain sicknesses or they just bring behaving certain ways they've been experiencing such things now my question again maybe some how do you work out with the media to send out this information to everyone else to know, to understand. No, I'm not being funny or there's nothing wrong with me, but this is what actually is happening to me. Because actually, reading all these things and looking at people who've been around, people have experienced a whole lot of this. And then how do we break the ignorance? Because where we come from, we're still ignorant. Although we see what it is, is actually affecting us in a lot of ways, but ignorance is still in, on top. Mm. Mm. Thank you for that question. So if I, if I hear right, it's how do you work with the media? Yeah, okay. Um, again, what I would say is that don't wait for it to come from the outside. It's about really con contacting your local radio station. It's about writing something for the local newspaper. It's about talking about it in the supermarket. You know, the, the ways are not cut and dried for doing this kind of work. And what I would say is that it's really encouraging to see how other people in very underfunded, um, marginalized areas have done in terms of, you know, if you go onto Eco TikTok, for example, there are videos there that young people have made where there's been nothing. They've done it on the smell of an oil rag, but they've got other like-minded people who understand the situation and they've said, we're going to do something about this. So again, it's only the pressure you put on the media to, to, to really air this topic that's going to make it come to life. I would say, you know, find out everything about the resources, any resources that you have, regionally, locally, nationally, and use that to the best of your ability. And where there isn't something, sit down with some people, who, one other person who's on the same journey and say, how are we going to make this happen as a reality for so many other people that we know are going through this? I don't know if that answers your question, but you know, the media are usually looking for stories too, and it's, it's really up to you to convince them that this, this story is not just a single event story. This is something very real which is affecting the community, because it won't just be you who, who have been going through it. Yeah, and I would use social media to, that is one of the, the really amazing things about social media, to, to put it on the agenda. Thank you. I'm a bit worried about time. Where are we? Probably have to move on. Move on. Okay. Um, there, is, there is a Venn diagram that is available. It, would we be able to send that out to, to people? Um, after the conference at all? Yeah, this, is, this is the one, yeah. You know, just as a starter, this is uh, Dr. Ayanda Johnson, who is wonderful. You'll find her on TED Talks and you'll find her on YouTube. But she's another person who said, where do I start? And she came up with this brilliant Venn diagram. Uh, and as an exercise, almost like a journaling exercise, to take this home and fill in those circles and, and just interpret it a bit wider. So for example, what brings you joy? It may not bring you joy, but it might bring you satisfaction. Interpret it a little bit more widely than that. And when you come to what work needs doing, think systemically as well. Think at the systems level. Um, and when it comes to what are you good at, don't be <laughs> too self-critical. You know, bring what you have, what other people have said to you. You know you're good at this. You can do this, or you know, tell us more, because you've excited them in some way. You've inspired them. And, 
And then your climate action lies right in the middle of that. Uh, it's, it's a very useful diagram, and it's a useful one to pass on to other people too, because we do get stuck. We do get stuck, and that is another part of what I've been talking about, the eco-anxiety, that you know, the worst, worse than climate change is everybody shutting down and feeling hopeless and feeling stuck. We, need, we, we really need to help ourselves and then to help other people move out of that very demotivated place. Thank you. Thank you. Done. Um, Ari, just on the Mentimeter, could just remind me of the ones which were, uh, that got the highest uh, ratings. It was anxiety, um, lack of hope for the future, and what is and powerlessness. So, so really just to, to take those to heart um, in two ways, which is you're not alone. Other people are also feeling this, talking about it, really bringing a lot of oxygen to, to this discussion of, you know, where does it leave us emotionally, let alone anywhere else, the whole climate crisis? And what do we do about feeling powerlessness? Because that is exactly what we don't want to, to feel. That is allowing the vested interests who, who will not curb emissions to, to win out. We have to find our agency. Uh, we have to find our resiliency. This is something that, as humans, we actually are very good at. It's just that we can often forget when it feels so intense that we have this agency. So I really encourage you all to, to, to meet, to talk, to do your own version of a climate cafe, and to encourage other people when you can see that they are suffering any of these effects of eco-anxiety. Thank you. Thank you very much, Max. Um, as we said, I mean, we're gathering here just to share information, right? Um, and I think the more we listen, the more complex the world has become. Uh, and we have to figure out how we navigate that space. Um, and then everywhere, I mean, we go, the in word today is resilience. And when do you cross over from being resilient and just being stupid? You know, because resilience says, you've got this, keep going. But sometimes you have to say, I do not have this. And if you think you're resilient, you resist having the conversation. We've been talking for years about emotional intelligence and how far have we moved. You have to understand that you're fighting this battle between mind and heart. The trigger comes through logic. <laughs> the response comes through emotion. It's two different parts of your being. But thank you for sharing and opening up the world. Uh, the Venn diagram, of course, reminded me of the Ikigai philosophy. So they probably got it from there. Ikigai's got four circles, and where they cross, that's your purpose. But again, shows you you can use different things in different ways, right? So yeah, we're just having conversations, and we're talking, and we're thinking, and we're discovering ourselves. The Mentimeter, the questions, I think, are still live. So we would love you guys to just go through those and just answer, because the data would be of value to Max. So please, if you could continue with the questions on Mentimeter, that would be brilliant. So we're now at the end, of the last bit of our program for day one. We gave you a bit of understanding in general. We've now introduced this notion of mental health and how do we deal with the realities of a changing world, a changing reality. But we also spoke about the importance of science and getting young people involved in the generating of knowledge and then obviously being able to communicate that. So I'm going to hand over the stage, the podium, to our moderator, Prof. Uh, Guy Mitchley. Uh, he's going to run the show from here onwards. Uh, he's got a panelist, so a, a couple of members that will serve on his panel and they're just going to talk about some case studies linked to research done by young researchers and what are some of the gaps and opportunities that have been identified. So Guy, uh, it's all you. I suppose I'll take this just off for you. Take the podium away so that you have space. Uh, that's, fine. that's fine. You will, you will invite all the, all the uh, panelists, right? You know who they are. I do. You do. Thank you. Great. Um, or maybe the panelists can, can come up so long. Uh, do you, you know who you are, right? And we'll need uh, microphones too. 
Okay, so while everybody's coming to the front, um, I thought I would start just by asking you how you're feeling about the context um, on the planet at the moment with regard to agriculture. Um, the heat wave in Europe, who's, uh, you must be aware of this heat wave that is currently occurring in Europe. Italy has downgraded its projections for crop production by 60%, I think. Um, combine that with the Ukraine war and the collapse in the supply of fertilizer from Russia and Ukraine the supply of food, certain African countries are in a food crisis. So um, what we're seeing is a real climate chaos in the Northern Hemisphere. And what are the, what are the implications of that? Um, you know, all the projections were that, that Africa was going to be the most vulnerable continent to climate change, and the world has been slow walking towards solutions. But all of a sudden, things are hitting the rich nations, uh, the US, Canada, Europe, um, even China. And suddenly the pressure is increasing because it's no longer just the developing world and the least developed countries if feeling the effects. It's the developed world. And that is going to put enormous pressure on, uh, on finding solutions. And agriculture is a big part of the solution. Uh, one of the biggest areas in which we can still achieve one and a half degree warming is by limiting emissions from, from agriculture. So there are a lot of companies around the world looking to buy carbon credits and agriculture is one of the areas, the big opportunities that we, that we have. So that, um, it's been a bit of a game changer and the urgency is extremely high. But this is where we need research in our part of the world. And uh, we have a panel of young students who are doing research on um, various, uh, quite a wide range of agricultural topics. You, you've got the list in your in your programs, and I, th you know, I think it's, it would be very interesting to speak to them about how they see their research in relation to climate change pressures, um, demands, food security, food sovereignty. Uh, South Africa is quite lucky in that we, in general, produce more calories than we require as a country on a per capita basis. And so we, we have food sovereignty in a way. We do export food and earn foreign currency and use that to trade food that we don't produce. But there are many, many countries that don't have that capability. And it's research that has allowed us to achieve uh, that, that level of food sovereignty. Um, but we're going to need to continue <laughs> to enhance that. Um, so I, I thought I would just uh, go around and, and allow each of the panelists just to talk a little bit about how they see their research in relation to some of these, uh, some of these questions. And maybe just to ask them one by one, just to talk very briefly about their, their topic um, and how they see their work contributing to to public good, to food security, to um, resilience, and uh, in, in, the, in the face of climate change. And if you haven't thought about it, that's also fine. But maybe uh, there, in, in that case, just talk about uh, the sorts of thoughts that have been triggered by this discussion. So that, should, we, should we start there? How, uh, just each one of you describe your, your work and then how it contributes to um, public good in, in, in the light of climate. Thank you. Um, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Gugu uh, Mabizela. I work for the government, uh, uh, Department of Agriculture. 
Um, I'm working only, mostly on the alternative crops of the Western Cape, which includes your um, honeybush, um, buhu, but mostly the focus is on honeybush. And pretty much what we are actually, uh, we're doing research on improvement of honeybush. If I might just explain a bit what is honeybush, because I know most people don't know much uh, about honeybush. Um, honeybush is like a, is an indigenous uh, plant, famous plant of, of South Africa. It actually grows in the Western and Eastern Cape, so we won't find much of honeybush in other country, uh, under provinces. I mean, uh, so we work on trying to improve the plant material because currently we don't have much because uh, about 80% of it is wild harvested. So we're trying to shift that into more cultivated compared to um, wild harvesting because if you deplete natural resources, that means you don't have much. Uh, so we tr we're also trying to avoid what, what is happening with rooibos because rooibos was also an indi in indigenous uh, fainbos uh, plant, but now you won't find much of rooibos in, uh, in the wild population because it has been de depleted. So we're trying to avoid that uh, to happen with honeybush. So um, what we're currently looking at, we're working on uh, to look how honeybush can adopt, adapt in drought stress, as well as changing a, a weather pattern. So we find out when to actually harvest uh, which specific climatic season we need to harvest honeybush in order to get the good quality tea. Because uh, we know that um, honeybush is a, like a herbal tea, where, which when most people drink tea. So it contributes mostly in the uh, food safe, uh, food, uh, food <laughs> contribute mostly on the food of uh, South Africa because mo also about 10% of honeybush extract is used for nutraceuticals. Some they even use it for food, for like superfoods. So once we know how to develop um, those practices in order to make sure that we have sustainability in order to also uh, plant the crop, even if we are experiencing the climate change that we are experiencing uh, currently, we are able to get good quality product and also increase the plant material because even if uh, the, the, the industry of honeybush is still new, I think it's about 23 years, so not much research is known, is known for honeybush, so that is why we're making sure that we are continuing with the research to make sure that at least we have enough information as well because uh, currently we, honeybush is, is grown organically we can't apply any uh, pesticides or, or herbicides as well for pests and, and also diseases because there's not much. We don't have registered chemicals to do that. Uh, so that poses a risk for climate change because if you have uh, the proliferation of pests and diseases, you can't do much in order to try to minimize it because you can't apply any chemicals. Um, so you will lose some of the uh, uh, yields and then we have to continue to do research on how to improve such. So uh, climate change has some sort of risk into the production of honeybush. So that is why we have to continue to adopt like the climate uh, smart agriculture that has been uh, discussed earlier this morning in order to improve the production of the, uh, the plant material of honeybush and other alternative crops as well. So thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor. Uh, my name is Lakson and I'm a young search at UCT. I'm completing my PhD. So, um, my uh, area of interest or my research area is looking at uh, the role of uh, indigenous and local knowledge uh, in climate adaptation by smallholder farmers. And maybe to start with is 
uh, uh, the smallholder farmers, they've, they've seen it all. They've experienced like good years, bad years. So it's, it's not like a, something like complete new to them. They have been experiencing this for decades and decades. And uh, they have certain ways that they've been addressing. It may not be enough, it may not be sufficient, but they have been dealing with these uh, type of problems that we are spending hours and hours talking. Uh, so uh, maybe putting on that, uh, I'm basically looking at, okay, uh, since the climate risk or the, yeah, the climate risk is kind of uh, increasing, how do we then uh, find a common ground on what the farmers, what they know, what they've been, uh, what, what they've been applying, and how, how do that feed into the transformative adaptation? Because we know with climate change, the risk is changing every day, the risk is increasing. So how do we then uh, feed or how do we then find a common ground on what these farmers have been practicing? How do we transform that into something that is, uh, that is able to address the current problems and the future climate change uh, risk? And uh, maybe to add one also is um, how do we then make this knowledge, the indigenous and local knowledge, uh, sustainable in the sense that um, maybe the knowledge we have uh, that, that these farmers have today uh, might not be of any relevant or may not be there in the next uh, two, three decades. How do we kind of preserve this type of knowledge? How do we keep the knowledge relevant to, to what we are addressing today and what we will be addressing in future since we uh, model in, in, I mean, from the modeling results, uh, it will get worse. We have uh, uh, all agreed on that, that the climate risk is going to be getting worse and worse. So how do we then come to a, a common understanding, building on what the farmers know already, and how do we use that in future? So I think that's, that's my area of interest. Thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Megan, um, I'm from Stellenbosch University. Um, I'm busy um, completing my MSc in Sustainable Agriculture and um, um, my research is based on Elsenburg. Um, my research um, topic is in sheep genetics. I'm actually looking how to um, sustainably manage um, blowfly strike, um, um, especially in the breach area of sheep by manipulating tail length. Um, the idea behind this with increased temperatures and everything, um, the blowflies are more active and this will reach um, a higher prevalence of breech strike. So by um, manipulating tail length, we would decrease pesticides and chemicals in the wool and which is dispersed in the environment. And by this, we would get, gain market access to more um, premium wool classes. So instead of exporting our um, chemical um, contaminated wool to China, we would get better prices in Italy and those places. Um, so yeah, that's how um, climate change would influence the wool in, um, the wool trade. Um, hello everybody, my name is John Marie Fisser um, and I'm with the Department of Soil Science at Stellenbosch University. Um, in my research, I looked at how stem water potential in, in grapevine can be used um, to, to efficiently reduce the water usage in grapevines in three different climatic regions. Um, so this is not only to reduce the water the farmers use, but also to reduce the, to reduce the water to, um, to such a point that the yields won't be affected, um, especially in regions like the Klaver, Fredendal region, where water is a where water is scarce, um, to help those farmers, and also to look at how the stem how stem water potential can be simplified, um, that all farmers can use it, um, so that every farmer in South Africa in a wine grape producing area. 
um, can farm sustainably. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Lule Gadlamini. I'm a PhD student at UCT and my overall interest is um, the impact of climate change on agriculture and I do that using um, crop models which we use to estimate um, different influences of crop management on crop yield or water productivity and things like that. Um, particularly my research is looking at assessing climate smart agricultural options for small scale farmers in the Eastern Cape. Um, so they have maize which is rain fed. So we are trying to use crop models in conjunction with um, remote sensing to see if we can be able to um, simulate and um, show the farmers how different um, practices can help in, uh, improve their, um, their yields or their water productivity. Um, this is quite important because with smallholder farmers, they don't have trial farms, so if they can't see, if you're telling them that this is what you have to do, but they can't see it, unfortunately we don't have enough funds to run trials, so we are at the moment relying on tools such as crop models to see if we can simulate those things, work together with them to come up with these um, practices and then try and simulate them using the models and then come back and share the information with them. Hello everyone, um, Andres Leroux, and I'm also doing research, some of it is modeling as well, um, but my topic is quite a mouthful, is the effect of current and projected climate on canola production potential, with the focus in the Swartland area um, of the Western Cape. So the three main points of the, the topic is, the first one is being canola. Um, as most of you know, canola is one of the biggest, of most important cash crops in the Western Cape. Uh, cash crop meaning you, you harvest the, the farmer harvests the seeds, sells the seeds for profit, and the amount of yield that you get per, per hectare, or um, that determines the income for the farmer. So for the farmer, the ideal being the most amount of yield that he can harvest on his farm for that specific crop, um, which is then being the second part of the study, which is the yield potential. So we're looking specifically at yield potential um, to determine the, uh, the potential of a specific area. So for, for your specific, and this is where the climate part comes into play as well. Um, for dryland crop production, you depend it on the rainfall. And for your specific farm, you have a potential of, you have a crop potential depending, depending on the climate. So as you know, the um, rainfall is directly correlated to the amount of yield that you can get. The higher the rainfall normally on the dryland, of the better the, even the distribution of rainfall, the higher the yield will, the farm will get um, depending on the management practices. Um, so the main focus for my study is to look, to find specific area, which is the Swartland, to look at the yield potential for a canola crop in that specific area so that the farmers can know more or less what their potential is for the canola crop in that specific area. Um, and that has also have to do with the modeling side but also determining the yield potential of different cultivars. Um, so that in the end, the question of the, so the, 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 question, the main question for the farmer is, um, what type of crop is suited for my specific area? What type of cultivar I have to plant to get the optimal amount of yield for my um, region? So it's very region-based um, yield potential for only canola, but later on we can, uh, um, Anyone can do research on different crops for different areas. So that in the end, you know which specific cultivar is suited for your specific region. So, yeah. Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Kululiwe Dombela. Uh, my research actually was based on looking, firstly, I feel like my topic has been covered because <laughs> My research actually focused on looking at indigenous knowledge and how do livestock farmers, particularly who practice livestock farming in the communal areas in the dry regions of Namakoland, how do they actually use their indigenous knowledge to adapt to the climatic changes or the weather changes that they see in their areas 
or the environmental changes that are brought upon by climate change. So how do they use their indigenous knowledge to try and adapt to whatever situation that they are faced with at that particular moment? In the, at first it was just based on that, looking at those indigenous practices, and then it stemmed on also to actually look at, so now how can we bring these two knowledge systems together, being the indigenous knowledge and also the scientific knowledge that we researchers come with, how can we combine these two knowledge systems to actually form one knowledge system that can be actually beneficial for the farmers because they live in remote areas, so sometimes there's no signal, there's no network. So they are at remote areas where there's, the information does not get to them in time remember they need to make decisions just like instant decisions so if the information does not get to them on time so then what happens so then what we try and do is how do we then bring these knowledge systems together in terms of how can we make sure that we not we don't neglect what the farmers know indigenously and also then how can we bring on this new information being scientific knowledge to form one knowledge system that the farmers can use themselves and if the farmers can use it themselves then maybe that knowledge can spread on to other farmers and they can trust that information because sometimes they have issues with us researchers they feel like oh okay you guys you think you know it all you just come and tell us what to do you don't listen to us so it's trying bringing that closing that gap together to say that we are here to listen to your knowledge your knowledge is important so how can we form a knowledge system together as researchers and as U.S. farmers, how can we form one knowledge system that you guys can use and it can be beneficial for you and in the future? That just sums it up. Hello. Hello, everyone. Yeah, my name is Fonzo. Well, I'm employed by the Western Cape Department for Agriculture as a researcher. So I have a PhD in Agriculture and Animal Science. So as a scientist presented by problems like rising uh, temperatures and, and, and things like that, you start trying to look at how do we adjust to this uh, and, and, and so on and so forth. So with, with animals, uh, the approach has been to look at animals that adjust to, to rising temperatures and, 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 and are doing okay under such type of circumstances and, and such type of things have been identified already. There are certain animals that uh, really like do good uh, and produce very well when it's extremely hot and some when it's extremely cold. But then given the, case, the sense that we, we, we know we're going to, here in South Africa, we're going towards elevated temperatures and stuff. So if we have animals like that, then it's, it's actually good that we know by the time when we reach there, when it's very hot, if we select animals like this to, to utilize for a prote protein source, we're going to be fine. And another thing already that we know is that uh, when temperature rises, obviously, with animals, then food intake drops. So if animals are not going to be performing well in the future also, then we're going to have a, a big problem because we won't have animals that grow to their potential and on time. So you're going to end up giving them a lot of, of food while they're doing nothing. And you, you, you had uh, the veterinary epidemiologist here talking about diseases and stuff with climate change. We, we, we know we're going to have a serious problem, obviously, also with diseases in the, in the future. But uh, what we're trying to do from, from my side as a scientist is that uh, we're trying to identify animals that are resistant to, to diseases and avoid using chemicals and China stuff and things like that. So, so yeah, that is, that is all that I'm working on. But then it's, there's also technological uh, implementation around these type of things. And, and this includes the issue maybe of genomic uh, selection and stuff like that. Because right now with the selection uh, protocol that is used, an animal need to grow and demonstrate certain phenotypes and, and stuff like that, then you can select them in the, uh, as, 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 as uh, parents for the next generation. But with issues like genomic uh, selection and stuff like that, you, you, it's just it's expensive, obviously, to, 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 to utilize and, and, and implement, or just the practical part of it. But you are able to, to, to get to select an animal at an early stage by looking at the, 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 the genetic material or the genetic makeup of, of that animal. So this is just the whole uh, genome that is going to be sampled and analyzed to, to, to look at what the animal fits in best and what doesn't fit in best for, for future production and fitting in, adapting in what we are going towards in the future. Thank you. Okay, so it's quite a wide diversity of topics, uh, all brilliant, brilliantly described. Um, so I want to pose a 
challenge to all of you um, and to the room. <laughs> yeah, South Africa sends a negotiating team to the Framework Convention of Cli on Climate Change every, every year, actually every six months. And uh, they have to negotiate on whether or not we accept one and a half degrees of warming as a global target, or two degrees of warming, three degrees. Uh, you know, at the moment, it looks like it's going to be hard for us to, to even stay below three degrees if we just keep on doing what we're doing. So you know, three degrees of warming globally means probably between five and six degrees here in, in South Africa, in the Western Cape as well. Two degrees would probably translate into three to four degrees. One and a half, maybe, maybe two. So I'd ask you all, um, in your area, what, what would be uh, a warming that would kill off your industry? How adaptable is your particular crop or the area in which you're working? Um, or how, what, what loss would be suffered if we went to one and a half, two and three degrees? And how would you try and answer that question to inform our negotiators who have to make a strong case we have to stay below two degrees because our researchers tell us that uh, if we exceed that we lose this industry so maybe maybe just a gut feel uh, if you don't know a precise number but let, let, let's see what uh, what you all think and um, yeah uh, I, I pose it to you as a, a challenge and then to people out here to comment as well um, I don't know about you guys or if you guys know, but in the industry, um, grapevines are seen as a weed because it is basically a weed. Um, so I don't think my case would re do really good at that type of convention because um, although the grapevines are very drought resistant, especially if you give them enough water only at certain stages in their de development, um, then they would survive for the most part. Um, but I think if, if, the, if, if there's a three degree change, then it will definitely impact the type of wine um, each, of our, each of the regions in the Western Cape um, produce because the, the, um, the more, the higher the temperature gets, the more, I don't know how to describe it to, the, the word is jammy, it's almost like there's too much, the concentration of the flavors in the wine gets too high and then the end product is more like um, a port or a or a noble late harvest or something. It's not a drinking wine. It's more like just just a small amount of wine and um, a wine. And I don't know about you guys, but if you don't have wine in the load shedding hours, <laughs> it's it's it becomes a problem. Just not not like two bottles, just two glasses. So, but yeah, I think I think um, my industry can raise by one and a half, two degrees. But I think three degrees will be the maximum because then the production will definitely take it. That's very useful. Uh, okay, P possibly a shift into another kind of product. Yeah. Okay, so somewhere approaching above two degrees, uh, our, our wine farmers are still going to be operational. That's extremely useful. Yeah, let's, let's see what else is up there. Um, of, coming from a wine farm as well, isn't it the dormancy sometimes the problem. If the winter months, there's an increase of temperature during the winter, wouldn't that affect the yield of the vineyards as well, or not? Because I know, oh, sorry. Because yeah. yeah. for the canola industry, if, if, if we talk about canola, which is a climate sensitive crop, especially temperature, uh, an increase of one to two degrees um, overall is definitely going to affect the, the, um, the, um, the production of canola. Um, because it, it requires a certain amount of heat units to move from vegetative stage to reproductive stage. But if there isn't enough time for the plant to grow vegetatively, there's not enough energy for the plant to put in the production side. So I think for the canola production side, especially under dryland conditions, and now there's a um, lower reduction of less rainfall, 
um, and the distribution of rainfall isn't also um, not good. And with elevated levels of temperature, you get higher evaporation rates, higher transpiration rates. So you have to look at the management side, how to preserve the water in the soil for longer. Um, so I think for the dryland crop production, it's definitely going to have a bigger, if, if on my side, it's a big effect, yeah. Okay, so it's like two degrees is going to be a real problem. Yeah. Oh, all right, all right, thank you. Oh. Uh, can I quickly answer his question? Um, to answer his question, the vineyards in the Western Cape area is not that, se for some reason, not everywhere in the Western Cape, the winters are not that cold to, like, four apples, for example, which is very dependent on that dormant stage. So I don't know which, on what form you grew up, but for the vineyards in, in my, in my or, or in the three regions I worked in, um, we didn't really look at the cold. All of, yeah, we didn't really look at the cold units. Um, we had um, one farmer at, uh, at the farmer's day asked, but how would we know how this would, how, how, the, how the vineyard would react in a normal season? And I didn't answer him directly, I kept it to myself, but I, I, I thought to myself, there is never going to be a normal season again. Like, climate change is a real thing, there's not going to be a normal season. The next season will be hot and there will be, dry, we, there will be drought, but the next season, like the previous season we had, the December was wet. So that all has an effect on the end product. And, um, the, the, the big problem most of, most of the Western Cape wine farmers have is they only grow wines for the vegetative growth. There is no vine balance in a sense. So maybe that's the difference between looking at vine and then canola, where canola is you looking for, for the biomass and the yield, but where for wine, it's, you, we don't farm with the shoots, we, find with the, we farm with the wine grapes. All right, all right, thank you. Yeah, well, so, so I, th I think we, we can, we, oh, we, we can really make it to, 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 to reduce maybe the emission or contribution of our country to, to, without affecting any of the sectors most of the time. Because, I mean, if you look at it, there is actually quite a lot of, of, of lower hanging fruit that we can cut off that are, 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 are kind of like major contributors to, to greenhouse uh, gas emission. For example, uh, as the agricultural sector, we. We were, we're doing very, very, very good in terms of food wastage, you know, and, and all those things end up in landfills and stuff like that. Those things contribute very, very much also to, 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 to the whole uh, methane emission and greenhouse uh, I guess and, 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 and climate change. So, so should we be able to cut off a, a food wastage and, and other things, we're most likely going to make it uh, to reduce uh, the emission to an acceptable or lower a rate than what we're going uh, at now without affecting most of the things. Uh, so I'm, I'm working with small scale farmers, like I said, which are rain fed. So any changes in, in rainfall is quite um, important to them. So it's not even a matter of long term climate change, but more of climate vulnerability. What's, what's happening this year and what's going to happen next year? And so under these conditions, what can I? do as a small scale farmer. So I think there are, um, like CSA, it's one of the options that we're trying to see now. But at the same time, it's also an issue of whether the small scale farmers have the, the, the resources to adapt or to use those um, options that we are coming up with. So um, there are trials out there that are, are being done also with small scale farmers, for example, in KZN. And all of those projects are project-based type of um, initiatives. So the farmers, yes, they can see that this is helping in this way or another. But if you ask them, are you going to be able now to adopt this into your one hectare and apply these different options? The answer is I can see it works. Um, it can improve the yields and it can improve the, 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 the water uh, productivity. <coughs> They had um, floods in KZN, but because they had no tillage application, their farms were saved, their maize was saved. But over a long-term period, it's not something that they can physically do. They know about um, um, maybe mulch, they know about um, different crop covers, but when it comes to them being able to 
sustainably do that for themselves, it's a bit more, more difficult. So it, it sounds as though there's a lot of adaptability. We could warm by two degrees and things would still be fine. If you can, if you are, the capacity for them to adapt is different. There are options that you can use, but the capacity for them and the resources for them to adapt to different, um, yeah. Uh, and if anybody from the audience wants to comment on our vulnerability, uh, feel free to raise your hands and uh, express a view as well. Okay, can I speak on a livestock's perspective? If they will be able to continue in the near future if we go up the temperatures. Mm -hmm. So where I work, which is the dry regions where it's really, really hot during the day, and then at night it's really, really cold. And then in one of the areas, which is Lady Fontaine, it actually snows. You would never believe it that where in the Northern Cape does it snow, but it actually does snow during winter. So for the ones that live in the low areas, which are not up the mountain as the Lady Fontaine, I, in my opinion, I believe that even if we do increase by that 2%, by the two degrees or the three degrees, they will still be able to continue practicing livestock farming but then the effects or the impacts that come with those increases being maybe the evaporation is now higher, maybe now the soil is not as, uh, is not as alive as it should be, and also then looking at the fact that where I work in, it's normally the average age of a farmer that you find there is probably over 65 years old. So those are really old people. And one of the practices that they practice in terms of adapting to the climatic changes is actually they, they walk with their animals. They, on a daily route, they herd their animals. If the seasons change, they need to go from a summer area to a winter area, they walk all, that, all those kilometers with their animals. So then if the temperatures go higher by two or three degrees, then it becomes difficult for them as the livestock farmers who are above 65 years old to actually walk in the hot sun. So then they, they will still be able to farm, but it's just that a fewer of them will be able to farm, looking at the age perspective in terms of a lot of them are old and the youngsters don't want to take up farming because they say, why would we want to continue farming if you can see our parents are already struggling? So then why would we want to enter into a struggle ourselves? So it's actually a byproduct in my case. <laughs> that, that's really... That's very interesting. So the limit isn't a, a biophysical one, it's the effect on the farmers and the community of farmers themselves and their, their age. But I'm hearing, uh, you know, this is not a doom and gloom session. I'm hearing some hope and some, uh, some uh, possibilities. Yes. Um, just speaking about the livestock systems, I mean, um, heat stress is a serious thing and in sheep, um, there's a girl with us doing a um, her thesis on it. And I mean, that's where um, breeding and genetics can also play a role in um, breeding for more hardy breeds and stuff like that. But that also being said, um, livestock's environments are easier to manipulate than crops and those. I think if you um, look into a, let's say, a milking parlor, um, it's about six degrees cooler where the cattle are standing than, I mean, five meters just that side. So. Um, in that sense, it is like easier to manipulate the environments, which with climate change we could be mitigated in that um, manner, but you still have um, your sheep breeds that are mainly farmed extensively where your um, genetics and breeding can play a role. The only limitation with that is it is time consuming to introduce those genetics over time. So also quite a hopeful message, some simple adaptation responses particularly for livestock, could, uh, could really help. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Uh, maybe my comment would be uh, uh, above two degrees, what would that mean to the common adaptation measures that farmers have been implementing over the years? I, I give you, for example, uh, we know that in South Africa there is like very high water constraints. There is limited water resources. So, uh, what would be the two degrees means to smallholder farmers in terms of looking at adaptation response such as uh, the common ones, the irrigation, and it, it, I mean, how hard it would be 
for us to reach the adaptation limits under the or above the two degree warming. So that would be, a, I mean, we need to really discuss on that, okay? Above the two degrees or between 1.5 and 2, how likely are we to reach the adaptation limits? Because we know that above two degrees warming, some of the adaptation response that we have been, uh, I mean, implementing over the years would not be relevant. So, I mean, thinking uh, forward, how or what does the two degrees mean to, to, to our small water farmers? Thank you. It's, well, it sounds like there's, you know, there's some tension. Do, do we really, do we, do we understand the answer to that question? Do we have a good answer to that question yet? Anyway, yeah. Okay. Uh, I'm going to come uh, on the faint boss perspective because if we keep on increasing temperatures, I mean, some of the honeybush species might uh, adapt to the increase. But now with the faint boss, you know that when it's too much uh, heat, the faint boss uh, fell fires that can uh, happen and that can destroy some of the natural vegetation. So. If we keep on increasing temperatures, that might be a problem in terms of sustaining the uh, natur uh, natural um, population, as well as we are speaking about being uh, agricultural smart, like uh, water use efficient and stuff. But now if we increase uh, temperatures, there's more evaporation and then what happened to the irrigation and also the, the water that we're supposed to be conserving for uh, the later stage because now, as you know, with the shift in the weather pattern, sometimes we get rainfall, sometimes we get, don't get enough rainfall. So if we have high temperatures, that might pose a problem in terms of uh, the sustainability of the, the plants and stuff. Yeah. Um. <clears throat> yeah, is there anybody in the audience that wants to ask a question or comment on, on limits to adaptation? I see there's a couple of hands up. Do you, have you, you've got a mic. Thanks, and I saw another hand right at the back as well. Yeah. Mic Yeah. So, um, I want to ask... Um, I want to ask the sir that's doing his research about IP and IK. Um, a lot of times when people go to do research in these remote areas in, and smallholder farmers, they obviously get the information, go back to the varsity, compile the PhD report, and then in some instances, big corporates um, make use of that information. And um, the, peop the smallholder farmers don't get royalties of that knowledge. It happened in the past. I don't know what's the latest um, law that protects them, but in your research, what, what do you think um, future-wise in terms of smart legal contracts on the blockchain that's um, becoming an in thing or NFTs for IP or IK? Have you thought about that? Because obviously you've mentioned that in the next 10 to 20 years, that that knowledge will become more and more valuable in all scale, So how are we gonna protect that and make sure that the next generation of that families and smallholders benefit from this information gathered in your PhD or whichever business who's gonna make use of it, such as you've just experienced a week or two ago with the rooibos and with the indigenous knowledge we don't want to walk the same route, so how are we going to go about and what's the latest um, protection mechanisms um, for the small the farmers? Okay, that's a good. Should we take one more, one more question? I saw a gentleman at the back with his hand up. Uh, thanks. So I have got a question. <clears throat> And unfortunately, this question has also bugged me for some time, and I don't have an answer, so sort of putting it out to everybody. When we speak of climate change, and this session is about proposing solutions, and particularly through research, a lot of the solutions that people present are very basic compared to the problem. I'll give you an example of one of the most basic, and, and forgive me, but one of the most useless solutions is 
reduce your individual carbon footprint. Um, because the scale of the problem is too big that even if we all reduced our individual carbon footprint, we would not make a dent. And why I say so is because, you know, I can give examples. If you look at the amount of carbon dioxide produced by landfills alone, it's equivalent to all the carbon produced by all the jet engines in the world. Just farming rice alone, just farming rice as a plant, produces more carbon than perhaps all the air traffic we have in the world. You know, building a kilometer of road. So how do we solve properly the issue of climate change and not offer very basic solutions? You know, how do we tell countries that are trying to escape poverty that they need to reduce emissions, you know? Um, even if we took on climate-friendly technology, are we able to really develop, you know, cost versus profit? These are, these are the sort of fundamental issues that really matter than stopping to take a car and taking a bicycle. So you know, these are questions that I think I don't have answers to, but I think it might be interesting to discuss them because that's what's fundamental, not, not the other fluff that we talk about every day. Uh, I, I can actually answer your question. <laughs> the single most effective strategy is a price on carbon. The price on carbon uh, of about $150 to $250 a tonne will significantly, uh, by 2050, uh, go towards achieving the goal of staying close to one and a half degrees. So that single, that single market intervention would, would have a major impact. But <laughs> how, do we, how do we get that to, to happen? So one, a price on carbon of somewhere between 150 and $250 a ton will, uh, according to the economic models, will give us the, the best chance of getting to 1.5 degrees. Uh, and that's a systemic response because it affects businesses all over the world. But um, is that politically acceptable around the world? That is the, that is the question. But you're exactly right, you know. Uh, solving the, the, the warming problem is, is extremely difficult, which is why we need this research on, on adaptation. Um, and we need to understand how vulnerable we are. Because I, I don't think it's likely that we will see a price on carbon of $250 a tonne very soon. Uh, it, it might happen because Europe is experiencing significant adverse effects and so is America and Japan and others. They might force it on the world just to save themselves. But uh, it, it, seems, it seems far fetched. And that's why we need, we need adaptation. I don't know how you might respond to that, but I, I, would, I would say that um, We've got to, while we try and pursue the, the silver bullet, we also have to do all this kind of work to protect ourselves and to understand how much space we have, how much adap adaptation space we actually have. That's extremely important uh, from all the sectors. Uh, it, it, you know, Smallholder farmers, how much, how much do we have to defend them as the South African and African negotiating teams in these negotiating uh, fora, how hard can we fight using credible information that we cannot go above two degrees? It would be death for Africa, you know. That's what our negotiators need, and that's where research like yours, it's one of the very important outcomes. But uh, I, I don't know if you have any view on how much adaptation space we have. It's not nothing, it's not five degrees, <laughs> but it's somewhere, somewhere in there. And um, that, that's something that is important for us to, uh, to go after. But uh, you make a very good and powerful point about getting, cutting to the nub of the problem. <laughs> I hope I've helped a little bit, but we can discuss that much more too. I should, I should also just, uh, just sorry, just one more, one more here. Uh, 
Greetings to everyone. Uh, my name is Apoi Katikati. Uh, one of the speakers uh, there by you guys said something about sheep uh, genetics and the docking of tails. Yes, so now my question is, like, I just wanted to hear a little bit of how does the sheep, I mean, the tail docking uh, link or impact on the climatic change effect? Okay, thanks. Okay, maybe first I should, I should respond to, 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 to the first question there. So, so what I would like to say is just uh, it's small changes that uh, matters, you know. So the smallest uh, reduction in emission matters the most. There's no way we'll just cut off everything at once. But bit by bit, we, we will end up making it to there. And, and also, also just, just to, 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 to add on, 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 on that is, is the fact that uh, uh, Adaptation fits in here in a case or in a sense that should we not make it, are we really ready for this situation? Yes or no? You know. So if we, we at this moment we are preparing to adapt, should we not make it to cut off what we're saying we need to cut off or reduce, then we, 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 we will still survive on certain resources. But if we don't even attempt to reduce the little bit of emission that can be like stopped, then we are, we are most likely just going to be doomed. Thank you. Sorry, just to add on to that, uh, I see it as, as you mentioned, that maybe riding a bicycle instead of driving a car. That's like one general solution that everybody can do. And it's like, it's equal or it's even to everyone. But as you mentioned also that how do you then convince a hungry person who's in poverty that you still need to adapt or you still need to mitigate? Then there, that's where I believe then that's where that communication then comes in. How do you actually relay the message to the person? How do you link what the everyday life of a person is? Then how do you link that and, and actually communicate to the person and ensure them that if this happens, if maybe the temperature goes up by that particular point, your daily life will be impacted in this way. So therefore, we need to try and reduce. In that way, you can win a person over just by communicating. And I'm glad that it was brought this morning that the way that we researchers communicate, sometimes we fail ourselves because we don't know how to communicate to a general person. We don't know how we can tell a general person how climate change impacts them how a person living in poverty, how can they be impacted by climate change. But simply understanding their way of life and understanding their needs, you can relay your message in that way that if maybe our temperatures go up or if maybe our rainfall becomes variable and it doesn't rain anymore, then this is how your daily life will be impacted. And then from there, then they see a need, okay, that I need to adapt or I need to mitigate. But it all, for me, it all boils down to communication and perception because if I don't know any knowledge and if I don't think that, if I think that this thing does not affect me, I'm not going to do anything about it. But if I see that, okay, this is, is how this thing is going to impact me, then there I can make a change because it directly affects me. But if you say it there that it's climate change, it's the developed world, then for a normal person who's living in poverty, they're like, okay, it's the U.S. problem. It's not our problem. But if you bring it back home and say that if it happens, maybe we won't crop as, maybe we won't plant as much crops that we need. Therefore, your staple food will be decreased. You'll be, you'll be like more exposed or more vulnerable now to hunger instead of the climatic changes. Then there a person can change their mindset and then they can start doing the little things that at the end of the day then can form a bigger solution. Oh, and just to answer the question of protection and the IP of indigenous knowledge. Sorry, I know it was your question, but since I'm also in indigenous knowledge, I know that there is a, a policy, an indigenous knowledge systems policy that is actually in South Africa and it protects the knowledge of the indigenous holders. And I know that Department of Science and Technology recently this year, they launched a, a system where they actually record this information and it's kept in a database and it's actually protected, the indigenous knowledge is actually protected. They actually have people who go out there and record this type of information and then they feed it back into the system and it's actually kept into that database. I will say, introduce a totally new idea. <laughs> 
if, if we as South Africa could generate all our energy from renewable sources like solar, we would slash the price of energy by uh, a tenth, maybe more. Energy becomes essentially free. And once energy as an input is almost free, you can, you can really solve the, the, the poverty issue. Then it doesn't matter, you can get in your car and drive anywhere because it's electric and it's not, uh, it's not really emitting very much. So that, that is another solution, is, is, a, is a renewable energy grid which opens up a huge potential for the future and poverty solutions. But um, it's hard to get that accepted here. Anyway, uh, you guys wanted to answer? Oh, you've got a mic ready. <laughs> Okay, last answer, then we're going to have to close, sorry. Okay, maybe just to add on what, what she said. Um, one way uh, uh, this knowledge can be preserved is through the formal recognition of the knowledge, I mean, through uh, formal adaptation channels. I, I give you for an example. Uh, in, a, in, a, in, in the study that we recently published, so we were trying to understand, okay, how the African governments are covering uh, indigenous and local knowledge in their uh, nationally determined contributions. They submitted to UNFCCC. So and we found out that despite Africa being the, I mean, the most uh, talked, uh, continent with the indigenous and local knowledge that is contributing to climate change adaptation, only 10% of the African governments had at least formally acknowledged that there is indigenous and local knowledge. So one way we can preserve this uh, form of knowledge is if we formally accept it in, in, in our planned adaptation, because most of these uh, measures that farmers implement, they are autonomous uh, adaptation measures. So for us to have a record of what are these farmers uh, applying in terms of indigenous and local knowledge, we need to formally recognize it so that if uh, we are to integrate it with uh, other forms of knowledge, we know that, okay, community, the communities, they know this, small other farmers, they practice this. How do we combine this with the uh, scientific knowledge? I give you for an example. Uh, back then, African communities, African small other farmers, have been uh, applying uh, CA and uh, they have been doing this uh, digging of, I mean, digging holes, planting on specific uh, plant stations. And because of uh, technology and everything, all these kind of revolutions, they have kind of left that behind. But uh, nowadays, uh, the governments have come in and say, okay, we can, we can go back and try and implement that CA. Uh, type of farming that you guys have been doing. But what we have to do now is, okay, let's make our holes deeper and also let's, let's bring in things like fertilization before you plant so that you can uh, increase your, your productivity. So that could be one way to preserve it. Thank you. Did you want to just answer that one question about the docking of the tails? Very quickly. Yeah, so um, it's more about sustainability, the the docking of the tails. Um, where climate change comes in is where climate change has a role on the sheep, not necessarily how sheep um, positively contribute to climate change. Um, so just the point of it is the pesticides and everything forming um, eutrophication, how to stop that, and just manipulating tail length. Um, well, just, I mean, there was a study done in Turkey where one cup um, that was used to dip tails um, caused a loss of, I think, 1,200 fish downstream. So it's just, it has a dramatic effect on biodiversity and ecosystems as well. Wow, that is a sketchy statistic. Um, okay, we're gonna, I'm gonna draw this to a close. Um, panel, I really wanna thank you and commend you. You've uh, responded remarkably well. I, I'm, left, I'm left with a sense of optimism and hope. I mean, anxiety is a, is a trigger for action. Uh, not to minimize uh, the role that it plays and to, you know, we need to listen to it. 
but uh, it sounds like you're all doing things that are, are going to help um, sort, our, sort our challenges out going into the next uh, decade or so. So thanks very much for the opportunity inviting me to, to, to lead this, and uh, thank, you, thank you to you all, and thanks for your questions, audience. I hope we've done a good job of answering them and uh, ventilated a lot of very, very interesting issues here that uh, hopefully you can pick up again tomorrow. Thanks, thanks everybody. Right, thank you very much, Guy, uh, for facilitating this part of the program, and to all the panelists, thank you very much. There's a token of appreciation. Um, I know that the guy who was complaining about load shedding might be slightly happier because you've got something uh, to keep you busy for this evening. So I'm sure that you guys still have questions, and I know that tonight when you can't sleep, you will be thinking of me. And when you think of me, you will jot down all these questions, right? Because as information was shared, I'm sure that it unlocked some of your thinking. Uh, I think for me, the most important thing is that whatever we do, um, there's a guy called Robert Meehan who said, your education becomes important or relevant when it's connected to reality. So we can talk about all these things that we learn, but if it's no longer relevant, then what does it mean? For the researchers here, of course, they had to dig deep and ask themselves, what is my why question? Why am I doing what I'm doing? And how does this affect people? And how does it change their reality? Uh, I still need to have a conversation with the wool lady, uh, because I want to know from you, in a country where we're struggling with unemployment, why are we exporting our wool to China? And maybe that's what we need to start talking about. How do we take the things that are happening and convert that into challenges and possibilities and opportunities uh, within our own country and our own reality? So uh, I'm going to allow you to take your questions home. And I'm going to get you tomorrow morning. And we're going to do a check-in where you will put some of those questions on paper and we will throw them here and through the course of the day, we hopefully will get an opportunity to answer that. So, ladies and gents, seeing that I robbed you of coffee, and the coffee break was supposed to be 15 minutes, I am allowing us to finish 13 minutes before half past four. So you will leave now, you will grab a cup of coffee, and as you take it in, you connect with your mindfulness, you will do your breathing in a six, two, seven. You will breathe in on six counts. You will hold it for two, and you will exhale for seven. Shall we do that? In for six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Hold for two. Exhale for seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. And as you were breathing in and out, suddenly you came, became aware of the oxygen filling all parts of your body. You could feel your heart beat. You could feel your lungs contracting. You became aware of where you are. The soil under your feet. Your connectedness to Mother Earth. And you reminded that text in scripture, Earth to Earth, dust to dust. So as you leave, enjoy your coffee and I'll see you guys tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. <laughs>